The first stage. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I came upon a certain place with a den, and I lay down to sleep. I fell asleep and dreamed. In my dream, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place, with his face turned from his own house. In his hand he held a book, and he bore a great burden upon his back. For my iniquities are gone over my head, as a heavy burden they weigh too much for me. Psalm 38 4 He opened the book, and as he read, he wept and trembled. Unable to contain his emotions any longer, he broke out with a mournful cry. What shall I do? How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence. Yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me, strife exists and contention arises. Habakkuk 1 2-3. Christian reading his book. In the midst of this dilemma, he returned home, but he restrained himself as he pondered his true feelings. At first, even his wife and children were unaware of his distress, but he grew more and more troubled. Finally his wife asked, what's the matter? He could no longer stay silent. He told his wife and children what he had learned from the book, and how it troubled his mind. Dear, he said to his wife, and you my children, I love you dearly. He looked from one to another. A burden lies heavily upon me. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. You see, I've learned that our city will be burned with fire from heaven. I'm afraid we are all doomed, even you my sweet children, unless I can find some way of escape, but I haven't found any way. His wife and children didn't believe a word of what he said to be true, and looked at him as if he'd lost his mind. They hoped a good night's sleep would settle his frenzied thoughts. With this hope in mind, his family hurried him off to bed, but his mind remained just as troubled in the night as it was during the day. He tossed and turned with tears and sighs until the sky brightened with the dawn. His family looked at him with concern. They could see he hadn't slept. It's worse and worse. He started to talk to them again about what he learned in the book. At first they tried to console him, but as he went on, their faces hardened with anger. Finally they had enough and answered him gruffly with harsh words. Sometimes they even ridiculed him, and other times they scolded him. Finally they just ignored him. Christian goes to his bedroom to pray. It saddened him to see them like this. In fact, he pitied them. He'd often go to his bedroom to pray for them as a way to soothe his misery, or he'd walk alone through fields while reading or praying. One day he walked in the fields while reading his book, and he became so distressed that he burst out crying. What shall I do to be saved? He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts 16 30-31 He looked this way, and that as if he would run, but instead he stood still. He didn't know which way to go. As he stood there, a man named Evangelist walked up to him and asked, Why are you crying? He answered, Sir, I've read in this book I'm holding that I am condemned to die, and after that comes judgment, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, Hebrews 9:27. and I find that I am not willing to do the first, to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of utter gloom as darkness itself, of deep shadow without order, and which shines as the darkness. Job 10 21-22, nor able to do the second. Can your heart endure, or can your hands be strong in the days that I will deal with you? I the Lord have spoken and will act. Ezekiel 22 14, an evangelist said, Why aren't you willing to die, since this life is riddled with so many evils? The man answered, Because I fear that this burden upon my back will sink me lower than the grave and I shall fall into Tophet, Gehenna. For Tophet has long been ready indeed, it has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood, the breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone sets it afire. Isaiah 30 33 and sir, the man said. If I'm not fit to go to prison, then I'm not fit to go from judgment to execution. Distress wrinkled his brow. The thoughts of these things make me cry. Evangelist studied the man. If this is your condition, why are you standing here still? The man shrugged. Because I don't know where to go. Evangelist handed him a parchment roll and on it were the words flee from the wrath to come. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, 
he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Matt. 3 7. The man read it, and looked carefully at Evangelist. Where must I flee to? Evangelist pointed his finger over a very wide field. Do you see the wicket gate over there in the distance? Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matt. 7 13 to 14. The man squinted. No. Evangelist points the way to the wicket gate. Evangelist asked, Do you see the shining light in the distance? So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Dash 2 Peter 1 19, I think I do. Evangelist said, Keep that light in your eye and go up directly to it. If you do, you will see the gate. Upon arrival at the gate, when you knock you will be told what you should do. In my dream, the man began to run. He hadn't run far from his own door, when his wife and children noticed what he was doing, and cried out to him. Come back. Come home. The man put his fingers in his ears and ran on. Life. Life. Eternal life. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14 26, he didn't turn to look at his home or family behind him, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay anywhere in the valley, escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. Genesis 19 17, but fled towards the middle of the plain. His neighbors also came out to see him run. All my trusted friends, watching for my fall, say, perhaps he will be deceived, so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. Jeremiah 20.10, the man continued to run, even though some of his neighbors mocked him. Others threatened him, and some joined with his family and cried for him to return. Among those neighbors calling for him to come home, two decided to grab him and forcibly drag him back. The name of the one was obstinate, and the name of the other pliable. The man had run a good distance ahead of them, but they were determined to pursue him. They chased after him and a short time later they overtook him. Neighbors, why have you come after me? The man asked as he caught his breath. We have come after you to persuade you to go back with us. The man shook his head. I can no longer live in the city of destruction. I know I was born there and have lived my whole life there, but I've seen the truth of living and dying there. Sooner or later, you will sink lower than the grave, into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Don't go back. Come with me, the man pleaded with his neighbors. What? Obstinate looked at him eyes wide with surprise. And leave our friends and our comforts behind? Yes, Christian said, for that was the man's name. All you leave behind isn't worthy to be compared with the tiniest portion of that which I am seeking to enjoy. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Dash 2 Corinthians 4 18 If you come with me, you'll hold it yourself and fare as well as me, because where I go there is more than enough. But when he came to his senses he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. Dash Luke 15 17 Come with me, and you'll see I'm speaking the truth. Obstinate's brows knit into furrows of confusion. What are the things you seek, since you leave all the world to find them? I seek an incorruptible inheritance, Christian answered. It's pure and untarnished, and it never fades. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Dash first Peter 1 4, and it is laid up in heaven where it is safe, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11:16. to be given at the appointed time to those who diligently seek it. He extended the book toward obstinate. Read it if you will, in my book. Tush, obstinate held up his hand, and with a flick of his wrist said, Away with your book. Will you go back with us, or not? Christian shook his head. No, I will not. I have laid my hand to the plow and will not look back. No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. 
Luke 9 62, obstinate motion with a sweeping gesture toward his neighbor, pliable, to join him. Come pliable, let's turn around and go home without him. He shrugged. There's a company of these crazy-headed vain and conceited men, who think they are wiser in their own eyes than seven men. Pliable didn't move. He said, don't berate him. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he seeks are far better than the things that hold our attention. I'm inclined to go with him. Obstinate threw his arms in the air. What? Another fool. Listen to me and go back. Who knows where such a brain-sick fellow will lead you. Go back, go back, he pleaded. It's the wise thing to do. No, Christian said to Obstinate. Come with your neighbor pliable. The things I spoke of are real, plus, there are many more glories too. If you don't believe me, read this book. He extended the book toward Pliable this time. You'll find truth in what it says, and it's all confirmed by the blood of him who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way he sprinkled both the tabernacle, and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. Hebrews 9 17-21 Obstinate turns back. Pliable looked from Christian to obstinate. Well obstinate, I think I'll go along with this good man and cast my lot with him. He turned his attention to Christian. My good companion, do you know the way to this desired place? I've been directed by a man whose name is Evangelist to hurry to a little gate where we shall receive instructions about the way. Pliable found that to be agreeable. Come then, good neighbor. Let's be going. The two of them headed off together while Obstinate stood in his place. I'm going back home, he called after them. I will not be the companion of such misled weird fellows. In my dream when Obstinate had gone back, Christian and Pliable walked along the plain of ease and Christian talked with his traveling companion. So how do you feel, Pliable? he asked. I'm so glad you were convinced to come along with me. If Obstinate had felt what I have felt of powers and terrors, of what is yet unseen, then I'm sure he would not have turned his back on us as he did. Pliable hungered to know more. Since it is just the two of us, Christian, tell me more. What are the things you spoke of, and how are they to be enjoyed? Where are we going? Christian struggled to put his thoughts into words. It is easier to comprehend them with my mind than to explain them verbally. But since you're asking, I will read of them in my book. Pliable pointed at the book. So you think the words of your book are absolutely true? Christian nodded without any doubt. Yes, of course. It was made by him who cannot lie. For the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Titus 1 2. Very well. Try to tell me of these things. What are they? Christian motioned with his hand as he explained. There is an endless kingdom to be inhabited and everlasting life to be given us, in order that we may live in that kingdom forever. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65 17. Brilliant. And what else? Well, there are crowns of glory to be given us and garments that will make us shine like the sun in the skies of heaven. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Matt. 1343. That is very pleasant news. What else? There shall be no more crying, nor sorrow, for he who owns the place will wipe all tears from our eyes. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 25 8, and who will be there with us? Pliable wondered out loud. There will be seraphim and cherubim, then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5 11, creatures that will dazzle your eyes. You will also meet with thousands and ten thousands who have gone before us to that place. Everyone there will be loving and holy, with everyone walking about in the sight of God, and standing in his presence with everlasting acceptance.
In a word, there we shall see the elders with their golden crowns, around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns on their heads. Revelation 4 4, and the holy virgins with their golden harps. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him one hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the one hundred and forty-four thousand who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. Revelation 14 1-5 And we'll see men who were cut into pieces by the world, burnt in flames, eaten of beasts, drowned in the seas, all because of their love for the Lord of the place. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matt. 5:10. All will be well and clothed with immortality as with a garment. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Dash 2 Corinthians 5 2. Just hearing all of this is enough to overwhelm me. But are these things to be enjoyed? And how is it we get to share in all of this? The Lord, the governor of the country, has recorded these things in this book. Christian patted the book for emphasis. Then he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Revelation 21 6. The fact is, if we are truly willing to have it, he will give to us freely. Pliable's face brightened. Well, my good companion, I'm glad to hear of all these things. Come on, let's pick up our pace. Christian let out a long sigh. I cannot go any faster because of this burden on my back. Now in my dream, as the two of them ended this talk, they drew near to a very muddy bog in the midst of the plain, but they didn't see it. In quick order, they both fell into the mire. The name of the marshy slough was Despond. Here, they wallowed for a time until they were totally covered with the slime and mud. Because of the burden on his back, Christian began to sink. Pliable asked, Our neighbor Christian, where are you now? Truthfully, I don't know. Pliable felt offended, and his face grew red. Is this the happiness you told me about? If we are stuck in the likes of this dirty goo right at the start, what can we expect between this, he said, as he lifted his arms and let them slap the mud, and our journeys end. If I get out of this mess with my life, you'll be going on alone to possess the brave country, for I will return home. With this he struggled desperately, and finally climbed out of the mire on the side of the bog nearest to his house. Once out, he didn't even turn to help Christian. In fact, he didn't even say goodbye. Instead, he walked away covered in filth, and headed straight toward his house. Christian never saw him again, so he was left to tumble in the slough of despond alone. But Christian struggled through the muck little by little toward the side of the bog farthest from his house, the side next to the wicket gate. He finally reached that side, but he couldn't get out because of the burden he carried on his back. But in my dream, a man came to him whose name was Help. What are you doing here? Help asked Christian. Sir, I was encouraged to go this way by a man called Evangelist. Christian pointed a muddy finger toward the wicket gate. He directed me to that gate over there, so I might escape the wrath to come. And as I headed toward it, I fell in here. He flicked mud from his fingertips into the mire. But why didn't you look for the steps? Help asked. We were talking, and I never thought to look for stairs. Help reached out toward Christian. Then give me your hand. Christian reached out and grabbed his hand and Help pulled him out of the mucky mire. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock making my footsteps firm. Psalm 42, and set him upon solid ground. Now go on your way. In my dream, I stepped toward the man who plucked Christian out of the slough and asked, Sir, why isn't this hazard fixed so poor travellers can cross it safely, since it is on the way from the city of destruction to the gate over there? This miry slough is a place that can't be repaired. It is a low-lying place where the scum and filth that come with the conviction of sin drain, 
and collect as the traveling sinner becomes aware of his lost condition. It is the fears, doubts and discouraging apprehensions about oneself that arise in his soul. The king is not happy that this place remains so bad. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, the recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Isaiah 35 3-4, based on the direction offered by his majesty's surveyors, his workers have also tended to this patch of ground for more than 2,000 years, to see if it could possibly be fixed. Sadness filled helps eyes. To my knowledge, at least 20,000 cartloads have been swallowed up by this mire. Cartloads of millions of wholesome instructions have been delivered at all seasons from all around the king's dominions. It is said these instructions are made of the best materials, in order to create good solid ground in this place, if it could be fixed. But this is the slough of despond, and it will remain so even after they have done all they can. By the direction of the lawgiver, there are certain good and substantial steps placed through the very midst of this bog to offer a sure way, but this place spews out so much filth and changes with the weather, so that these steps are hardly seen. And often when men find the steps, they grow dizzy from their own guilt, and their feet miss the steps, and they become covered and stained with mud. But the steps are there and the ground is good once they get in at the gate. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3 6. Help draws Christian out of the slough of despond. Now in my dream, by this time Pliable had arrived home to his house, and his neighbors came to visit him. Some of them called him a wise man for coming back, and some called him a fool for endangering his life by going with Christian in the first place. Others just made fun of him and mocked him for his cowardliness. They said, if I had started this adventure like you did, I wouldn't have been so timid as to quit after just a few difficulties. Pliable sat cringing among them at these words, but after a little time passed he gained some confidence. When his neighbors saw his regained confidence, they turned against poor Christian instead, and ridiculed him behind his back. However, even though they were no longer talking about him, their words against Christian concerned Pliable. Now as Christian walked alone, he spotted a man in the distance crossing the field to meet him. Eventually their paths met, and the gentleman introduced himself as Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He lived in the town of Connell Policy, which was a large town close to Christian's hometown. Worldly Wiseman acted as if he had full knowledge of Christian's leaving the city of destruction, as if the leaving of destruction was a topic of much gossip, not only in the town where he lived, but also in other places where the news seemed to have spread. Because Worldly Wiseman had an inkling of his coming, he had spotted Christian's arduous approach. When worldly wiseman observed Christian's sighs and groans and the like, he engaged him in sympathetic conversation. Greetings, good fellow. Where are you traveling burdened in this manner? Burden manner, indeed. I think it's as large a burden as any poor creature ever had to carry, Christian said. And where am I going, you ask? Let me tell you, sir. I'm on my way to that distant wicket gate. Christian nodded in the direction of his goal. For there, I've been told, I will gain entrance to the place that will rid me of my heavy burden. Do you have a wife and children? Worldly wise man asked. Christian nodded. Yes, yes, I do. But I am so weighed down by this cumbersome burden that I can no longer enjoy their company like I used to. In fact, it makes me feel more like I don't even have a family. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. Dash 1 Corinthians 7:29. Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Worldly Wiseman studied Christian for a moment. Will you listen to me if I give you advice? Christian considered his answer. If it's good advice, I will, because truthfully I'm in need of some wise advice. Worldly Wiseman said, then I would advise you to get rid of that burden as fast as you can, because as long as you have it, you'll never have peace of mind, or be able to enjoy the blessings God has bestowed on you. That's exactly what I want to do, to be rid of this heavy burden. But I can't get rid of it on my own, and I don't know of any man in our country who can take it off my shoulders, so I'm headed in this direction as I told you for that very purpose, to get rid of my burden. So who told you to go this way to get rid of your burden? Worldly wise men asked. A man who to me appeared to be a very great and honorable person. As I remember it, his name is Evangelist. 
Worldly Wiseman's face puckered into a sour expression. I most certainly condemn this man for his advice. There isn't a more dangerous and troublesome way in the world to travel than the way he has told you to go. You'll certainly learn this the hard way if you listen to his advice. In fact, by the looks of things, I'd say you've already experienced some of this difficulty. Isn't that the dirt and grime of the slough of despond I see on you? What you don't realize is that the slough is just the beginning of the sorrows you'll experience if you listen to that man. Other pilgrims who have gone that way could very well tell you the truth of that experience. Listen to me. I'm older and more experienced than you. If you continue in this direction you are likely to experience wearisomeness, painfulness, hunger, perils, nakedness, swords, lions, dragons, darkness, and in a word, death, and who knows what else. Worldly Wiseman looked Christian directly in the eye and said, These things are certainly true, and have been confirmed by the testimonies of many pilgrims just like yourself. So why should a man so carelessly place himself in danger, by listening to a stranger like this man evangelist? You don't understand, sir, Christian replied. This burden on my back is more terrible to me than are all the things you have mentioned. He shook his head. No, I've given this thought, and I don't care what perils I meet along the way, as long as eventually I can be delivered from my burden. The older man asked, How did you come by your burden in the first place? Christian raised the book in his hand. By reading this book. Worldly Wiseman's lips thinned with disgust. I thought so. The same thing has happened to you as to other weak men who meddled with things too high for them. They are suddenly distracted and confused just like you, and it's humiliating. I can see the same thing has happened to you. And the problem is they turn to desperate measures to obtain what they know very little about. Oh no, Christian replied. I know what I would obtain. I'd receive relief from my heavy burden. But why do you seek relief this way, by putting yourself in the path of so many dangers to get it? If you had enough patience to listen to me, I could tell you how to find what you're looking for without all the risks you'll run into along the way you're choosing to go. You see, the remedy I'm suggesting is nearby and, instead of dangers, it offers safety friendship and contentment. Christian eagerly looked at worldly wise men. Please sir, tell me this secret. Why, the answer lies just a short distance away in the village named Morality. They're ask after a gentleman by the name of Legality. He's a very judicious man, and a man of a very good name. He has skill to help men off with such burdens as yours from their shoulders. In fact according to what I know, he has helped many pilgrims a great deal in this way. Besides that, he has the skill to cure those who are somewhat overwrought and irrational about their burdens. You can go to him and be helped right away. His house isn't quite a mile from here. And if he isn't home himself, he has a son who is friendly and easy to get along with, whose name is Civility. He can assist you in the same way as his father. You can be relieved of your burden there. A broad smile softened his features. If you decide not to go back to your former home, which I would recommend, you can send for your wife and children to come here to this village. Here we have suitable houses just waiting for someone to move into them, and they are reasonably priced. The living standards here are good, though a little expensive but high quality. We have everything you need for a happy life plus, along with an environment you can enjoy, you would be in the company of honest neighbors who are financially secure and live a good life. Christian was torn as what to do, but decided if what worldly wisdom said was true, then his advice was the wisest to take. Sir, he said, how do I find my way to this honest man's house? Mr. Worldly Wiseman pointed toward a steep nearby hill. Do you see that high hill over there? Christian nodded. Yes, clearly. The older man said, you must walk up that hill, and the first house you come to is his. So Christian turned from his current path to go visit Mr. Legality's house for help. But as he approached the hill, it seemed to be steeper than he first thought. It rose so high that the side of it hung above him. It raised fear in him to venture further for he was afraid the hill could fall on his head. He stood there trying to figure out what to do, and his burden seemed heavier than ever, much heavier than when he had set out from his home. Flashes of fire erupted from the side of the hill. There were thunder and lightning flashes, and a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. A Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, 
and the whole mountain quaked violently. Exodus 19.16.18 The sight filled Christian with dread that he would be burnt. Sweat beaded across his brow as he trembled with fear. And so terrible was the sight, that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. Hebrews 12.21 He began to be sorry that he had taken worldly wise men's advice, and just then he spotted evangelist coming to meet him. While he was relieved to see the man, at the same time the blush of embarrassment heated his face, for he had ignored the man's advice. Christian at Mount Sinai As evangelist drew near, Christian could see the man was annoyed and ready for a serious talk. What are you doing here, Christian? he asked. Christian didn't know what to say, so he just stood there without saying a word. Evangelist took in a deep breath and let it out slowly. Aren't you the man I found crying outside the walls of the city of destruction? Christian looked at his feet and nodded. Yes, I am the man. Didn't I give you directions to the little wicket gate? Yes you did, dear sir. Then how is it you turned aside so quickly? You are going the wrong way. Christian shuffled his feet. Soon after I left a slough of despond, I met a gentleman. He seemed like he cared about me, and persuaded me I could find a man in the village who could remove my burden. What did he look like? He looked like a gentleman, Christian said with a shrug. He dressed like one and talked like one. I didn't want to go to the village, but with all his fine words this gentleman eventually talked me into following his advice. So I came here, but as I drew close to this hill, and saw how it hangs over the way, I stopped. I was afraid it could fall on my head. Exactly what did the gentleman say to you? Well, he asked me where I was going, and so I told him. What then? Evangelist asked. What did he say next? He asked me if I had a family. I told him I did, but I explained how this burden on my back weighs me down so much that I can't take pleasure in them like I used to. And what did he say after that? He told me to get rid of my burden quickly. I explained that was what I was trying to do, that I sought relief. I described how I was traveling to the gate ahead, so I could learn how to get directions to reach the place of deliverance. He said he would show me a better way that was closer, and not fraught with all the dangers and difficulties, as the way you set me in. He told me how to get to another man's house, one who knows how to take off burdens like mine. Christian looked away. So I believed him and turned from the way you had advised me to go, in hopes I might soon be relieved of my burden. But when I came to this place, he pointed toward the looming hill, and saw things as they are, I stopped dead in my tracks with fear and didn't know what to do. Just stand still for a little while, Evangelist said, so I can show you the words of God. So Christian stood trembling as he listened to what Evangelist had to say. Make sure you don't refuse him who speaks to you Christian, for if Israel did not escape judgment when they didn't listen to him, how much more will we not escape, if we turn away from him when he speaks to us from heaven? See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Hebrews 12 25, and besides that, he tells us that the righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Hebrews 10 38. Then evangelist pointed at Christian. You are the man who is running into this misery. You have begun to reject the direction offered by the Most High, and to draw back from the way of peace. In fact, you are teetering at the point of being in danger of eternal punishment and damnation. Christian fell down at his feet as dead and cried, Woe is me for I am ruined. Evangelist caught him by the right hand and said, Men will be forgiven their sins and blasphemies. Therefore I say to you, Any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. Matt. 12.31 don't be faithless but believe. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. John 20:27. 20, Christian revived a little, and stood up trembling again before evangelist who said, pay careful attention to the things I am going to tell you. I'm going to show you who it was that deluded you and who it was he sent you to. The man who met you is one worldly wise man, and rightly is he called by this name, partly because he has an appetite only for the doctrine of this world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. Dash 1 John 4 5, this is why he always goes to the town of morality to church, because he loves the doctrine taught there, because he thinks it saves him best from the cross. For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, 
but they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Phil. 3.18. Because he is of this carnal temperament, he seeks to oppose my ways, even though I am doing the work of an evangelist. Now there are three things in this man's counsel that you must utterly detest. First is his ability to turn you from the way you should go and get you sidetracked. The second is the way he works to portray the cross as odious to you, and lastly, that he points you in the direction which leads to death. You must despise his ability to turn you from the way, and yes, even the fact that you consented to his proposal. To do so is to reject the counsel of God, in favor of the counsel of a worldly wise man. The Lord says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Luke 13 24, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7 13 14. This wicked man has turned you away from this little wicked gate, and from the way that leads to it. He has almost brought you to destruction. For this reason, you must hate his ability to turn you from the way, and in the same way you should loathe yourself because you listen to him. Secondly, you must detest his zeal to make the cross as offensive to you, for you are to prefer it more than the treasures of Egypt. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews 11 25-26 Besides, the King of glory has told you that the one who saves his life shall lose it. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Luke 9 24 Consider that worldly wise men has worked diligently to persuade you to believe that the king's advice will lead to your death, while the truth says you can't have eternal life without following the king's advice. As a result, you must abhor this doctrine circulated by worldly wise men. Thirdly, you must hate the fact that he told you to follow the way that leads to death. In the same way you must consider the one he sent you to, and how he is unable to deliver you from your burden. You see, while it was promised that legality could make the job of removing your burden easier, the fact is that he is the son of the bondwoman who is in bondage along with her children. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, she is our mother. For it is written Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Galatians 4 21-27, you see, she represents Mount Sinai. Evangelist gestured with an open hand toward the overhanging mountain. The very thing you feared would fall on your head. Now if she and her children are in bondage, how can you expect to be made free by them? This legality isn't able to set you free from your burden. No matter what worldly wise man told you, the fact is that no one has ever been rid of his burden by him, nor is he likely to be able to do so in the future. Evangelist spoke from his heart with great passion. You cannot be justified by the works of the law, because it isn't how one follows the law, or the good things they do that rids one of their burden. This makes worldly wise men nothing more than an illegal guide, and Mr. Legality a cheat. As for Legality's son civility, he is full of hot air. With his smirking facade he is nothing but a hypocrite. Evangelist shook his head. He can't help you. Believe me there is nothing in what he says. You've heard of these intoxicated men, who dream up ways to deprive you of your salvation, by turning you from the way in which I had set your path. After this, Evangelist called aloud to the heavens for confirmation of what he had said. In reply, I heard a voice and witnessed fire spewing from the mountain under which poor Christian stood. It made the hair on his flesh stand up. The voice cried out, Those who trust in the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, to perform them, Galatians 3.10. Christian thought he was going to die, and began to cry out with an agonizing wail. He even cursed the time he met with worldly wise men, 
and called himself a fool a thousand times over for listening to that man's advice. Shame filled him. To think that this gentleman's arguments were nothing more than fleshly advice, and yet caused him to forsake the right way. He scolded himself for being so foolish and came to his senses. He paid attention once again to what Evangelist said, and had the sense to follow his guidance. Christian looked to Evangelist and asked, Sir, what do you think? Is there any hope? May I now go back to the way that leads to the wicket gate? Or will I be abandoned for what I've done, and sent back to where I came from riddled with shame? I'm sorry I ever listened to this man's counsel. May my sin be forgiven. Evangelist looked at him with a serious expression. Your sin is very great, for you have committed two evils. You abandoned the way that is good, and you chose to walk in forbidden paths. Yet the man at the gate will receive you, for he has good will for men. But be careful not to turn aside again, because if you do, you may perish altogether when his wrath is ignited. Do homage to the sun, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 2:12. One Bedford jail, in which the author was imprisoned for conscience' sake. Too original, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. John 12 25. Three original, fear chased me so hard I bolted this way and fell in. Four original, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. 1 Sam. 12:23. 5. Original, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Galatians 6 1. The second stage. Then Christian prepared to go back to the way. Evangelist kissed him and encouraged him with a smile. Godspeed, Christian. Christian hurried on his way and spoke to no one as he walked. Even if someone asked him a question, he was careful not to give them an answer. Instead, he went on like one walking on forbidden ground. He just didn't feel safe yet. In fact, he wouldn't think himself safe till he returned to the way which he had left to follow worldly wise men's counsel. Finally he reached the gate. Over it a sign read, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, and it will be given to you, seek, and you will find knock, and it will be opened to you. Matt. 7-7, seven, seven, he knocked with urgency more than once or twice. May I now enter here? He asked. Will he within open to wretched me, even though I have been an undeserving rebel? If you let me in, I won't fail to sing his lasting praise. At last a serious-looking man named Goodwill came to the gate. Who is there? He asked. And what do you want? Christian hung his head. It is me, a poor burdened sinner. I come from the city of destruction but am going to Mount Zion, so I may be delivered from the wrath to come. I have been told, sir, that this gate leads to my destination. Are you willing to let me enter? I am willing with all my heart, said he. With that he opened the gate. Christian moved to step through the gate and to his surprise, Goodwill tugged him forward and hurried him inside. Christian stared at him in disbelief and straightened his jacket and asked, What's the meaning of this? A little distance from this gate, there is erected a strong castle of which Beelzebub is the captain, Goodwill said. From that castle both he and those with him shoot arrows at those who come up to this gate. It is their hope that those who arrive at this gate may die before they have the chance to enter in. Christian pressed his lips into a thin line, as he considered the man's words. He said, I rejoice and tremble, for he was both relieved and thankful for the favour shown him. Once he was inside the gate, Goodwill asked him, who directed you here? Evangelist told me to come here to the gate and to knock as I did. And he told me that you sir, he nodded toward Goodwill, would tell me what I must do. Christian knocking at the gate. An open door is set before you and no man can shut it. Christian let out a sigh of relief. Now I begin to reap the benefits of the risks I took, and the dangers I faced in getting here. Goodwill glanced to see if any others had come with Christian. How is it that you came alone? Christian placed his hands on his hips, arms akimbo and shrugged. None of my neighbors saw their danger as I did. Did any of them know of your decision to leave destruction to come this way? Christian nodded. Yes, my wife and children knew what I was doing. 
When they wouldn't come with me, I started out without them. They called after me to turn back. Along with them, some of my neighbors also stood crying and calling after me to return home, but I put my fingers in my ears and so came on my way without them. Goodwill's brow furrowed. Didn't any of them follow you and try to persuade you to go back? Yes, a couple of neighbors did come along at the start. Both obstinate and pliable walked with me at the beginning, but when they saw that they couldn't get me to change my mind, obstinate went back home complaining and denouncing me. Pliable came with me for a little ways? And why isn't he here? Truthfully, we pressed on together until we came to the slough of despond, into which we both suddenly fell. My neighbor Pliable became so discouraged by that experience that he refused to go any farther. After struggling for a time in the miry bog, he finally reached the side nearest to his house and climbed out. He told me I should possess the brave country alone on his behalf, and he went in the direction of obstinate while I proceeded to this gate. Goodwill shook his head with regret. How sad for poor Pliable. You mean to say he has such little appreciation for the celestial glory to come, that he didn't consider it worth running the few risks and difficulties necessary to obtain it? Christian nodded. It is true. What I have told you about Pliable is the sad truth. Christian hung his head again. But to tell you the truth, I'm really no different from him myself. If the truth be told, he went back to his own house, but I also turned aside to go in the way of death, when I believed the persuasive carnal arguments of one worldly wise man. Oh, did that man prey upon you? Did he deceive you by offering an easy way to rid yourself of your burden by the hands of Mr. Legality? They are both cheats. Do you mean to say you followed his advice? Christian looked up at him sheepishly and nodded. I went as far as I dared to locate Mr. Legality, until I came to the mountain that stands by his house. I feared it would fall upon my head, so when I saw that, I was forced to stop. It is just as well you escaped it, or it may have dashed you to pieces, Goodwill said. That mountain has been the death of many, and will be the death of many more. To tell you the truth, I don't know what would have become of me there at the mountain if it hadn't been for Evangelist's arrival, just about the time I was feeling sorry for myself and rather depressed. It was by God's mercy that he came to me again, because if he hadn't, I would never have come here to this place. He made a wide sweeping gesture with his arm taking in the area on that side of the gate. But I have come now, unworthy as I am, and more deserving of death by that mountain than I am of being here talking with my Lord. Oh, what an undeserved favor it is for me to gain entrance here. We don't object to any entering here, no matter what they have done in the past before they come here. In no way are they cast out. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. John 6 37, therefore my good Christian, come and walk with me a little distance, and I will teach you about the way you must go. Look ahead of us. Do you see this narrow way? That is the way you must go. It was established by the patriarchs prophets Christ and his apostles. The way is straight. Follow it, for this is the way you must go. Straight? Christian asked. You mean to tell me there are no turns or bends, no detours in the way? by which a stranger may lose his way. Oh yes, there are many side paths that connect to this narrow way, but they are crooked and wide. You must distinguish the right way from the wrong by paying attention to which is straight and narrow. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matt. 7.14 Then in my dream, I saw Christian ask Goodwill, can you help me off with this burden on my back? For it was impossible for him to get rid of his burden without help. Goodwill told him, As for your burden, be content to bear this load until you come to the place of deliverance, for there it will fall from your back of its own accord. Goodwill shows Christian the way. Such news encouraged Christian, and he began to prepare himself and seriously consider the journey before him. Goodwill told him, When you've travelled some distance from the gate, you will come to the house of the interpreter. Knock on his door and he will show you excellent things. Christian didn't waste any time. He said goodbye to his new friend. Goodwill wished him traveling mercies and sent him on his way. Christian followed Goodwill's directions until he came to the house of the interpreter. He didn't hesitate to approach the door and knock. To his dismay, no one came to the door, so he knocked again and again. Finally he heard footsteps from the other side of the door, and a man opened the door a crack. Who's there? 
Christian shuffled his weight from one foot to the other. Sir, I'm a traveller who was advised by an acquaintance to call on the good man who lives here in this house for my benefit. So, I'd like to speak with the master of the house, please. The man turned and called to the master of the house, who came to the door and asked Christian, what is the reason for your visit? Sir, Christian began. I'm a man who has travelled from the city of destruction, and I am on my way to Mount Zion. I was told by the man who stands at the gate at the head of this way, that if I called on you here at your home that you would show me excellent things, things helpful to me on my journey. The interpreter opened the door wide. By all means come in. He ushered the pilgrim in with an inviting gesture. I will show you things which will benefit you in your travels. He commanded his servant to light the candle. With the glow of the flame casting a yellow puddle of light around them, the interpreter led the way and told Christian to follow him. The three of them stepped into a private room. Open the door, the interpreter said to his helper. The man did as he was told. When the door opened Christian saw upon the wall, the picture of an important man wearing a very serious expression. His eyes were lifted up to heaven. The best of books the Bible was clenched in his hand. The law of truth was written upon his lips, and the world was behind him. A crown of gold hung above his head, and he stood like one pleading with men. Christian looked from the picture to the man of the house. What does this mean? The man answered while still looking at the picture. The man pictured here is one of a thousand who can produce children, for if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4.15 Labor in birth with children, my children with whom I am again in labour until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19 And nurse them himself when they are born. Just as you see him with his eyes lifted toward heaven, and holding the best of books in his hand, with the law of truth written on his lips, this is to show you that his work is to know and unfold dark things to sinners. In the same way, notice how he stands pleading with men, and how the world is cast behind him. And see the crown which hangs over his head. These things are to show you that by despising the things in this present world, and considering them less important, all for the love and devotion he has for his master's service, he is sure to have glory for his reward in the next world. The interpreter looked at Christian. I have showed you this picture first, because the man shown here is the only man whom the lord of the place where you are going has authorized to be your guide. When you come across difficult situations in your journey, consider these things I have shown you. Think and ponder them so that if someone should meet you along the way and pretend to lead you along the right path, you will recognize that in reality their way would lead to death. Then he took him by the hand, and led him into a very large parlor full of dust, as if it had never been swept. The interpreter called to a man and told him to sweep. The man grabbed a broom and swept, and in so doing stirred a thick cloud of dust into the air. The dust grew so dense it almost choked Christian. The interpreter then spoke to a woman who stood nearby. Bring some water here, and sprinkle the room. The woman did as she was told, and the entire room was easily swept and cleaned. Christian asked, What does this mean? The interpreter answered, This parlor is the heart of a man who was never sanctified by the sweet grace of the gospel. The dust is his sin and inward corruption, which has defiled the whole man. The one who began to sweep at first is the law but she who brought water and sprinkled it is the gospel. Interpreter shows Christian the room full of dust. Now while you saw the room fill with the great cloud of dust when first swept, the dust flew about in such a way that the room could not be cleansed, and its dust almost choked you. This is to show you that the law, instead of cleansing the heart from sin, does in fact arouse it. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. Romans 7 9, it also gives it greater strength, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Dash 1 Corinthians 15 56, and causes sin to flourish in the soul, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. Romans 5 20, for even as the law uncovers sin and forbids it, it does not provide the power to subdue it. In the same way, the woman you saw sprinkle the room with water which made it easy to clean, this is to show you that when the gospel comes with its sweet and precious influences and indwells the heart, just like the dust settled by sprinkling the floor with water, sin is also vanquished and subdued, and the soul made clean through faith. Consequently, the soul becomes a suitable place for the King of Glory to inhabit.
so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Ephesians 5 26-27. Besides this, I saw in my dream the interpreter take Christian by the hand, and lead him into a little room. Here two little children sat, each in their own chair. The name of the eldest was Passion, and the name of the other Patience. Passion seemed to be very discontented, but Patience remained quiet and calm. Christian asked, What is the reason for Passion's unrest? The interpreter answered, The governor of these children would have him wait for his best things until the beginning of the next year, but he wants his inheritance now. Patience, however, is willing to wait. Then I saw a person come to Passion and bring him a bag of treasure. He poured it out at his feet. The eldest child scooped it up and rejoiced, and at the same time laughed with scorn at Patience. However, a short time later, he had wasted all his wealth, and had nothing left but rags. Passion and Patience Christian turned to the interpreter again, and asked him to explain the meaning of these things more carefully. The interpreter said, These two lads portray the passion of the men of this world, and what is to come. Here you see passion must have all of his inheritance this year, which represents this present world, for so are the men of this world. They must have all their good things now. They can't wait till next year, that is, until the next world for their portion of good. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush holds more authority with them than all the divine testimonies of the good of the world to come. But as you saw for yourself, he quickly wasted it all, and was left with nothing but rags. So will it be with all such men at the end of this world? Christian nodded. Now I see that patience has superior wisdom in many ways. First of all, because he waits for the best things. Second, because he will also have the glory of his inheritance, when the other has nothing but rags. Yes, the interpreter agreed, but you may add another reason as well. It is the glory of the next world that will never wear out, while the good things of this world will vanish. Therefore, Passion had no reason to laugh at Patience, for he had his good things first, however, Patience will have the last laugh at Passion, for Patience eventually will receive his best things which last forever. For he who is first must yield to the one who is last because his good things vanish, while the one who is last will have his time to come but gives place to nothing, for there is nothing to follow. He who has his inheritance first, uses it and spends it, but he who has his portion last, has it forever. Therefore it is said of the rich man, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony, Luke 16.25. Then that means it is not good to crave things of this present world, but to wait for things to come, Christian said. That is true for we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal, 2 Corinthians 4 18. However, even though this is true, since things of the here and now and our fleshly desires are so closely related to one another, and because things to come and our carnal desires are opposed to one another, it is the present things and fleshly desires with which we so quickly establish a relationship, while distance is maintained between our desires and the things to come. Then I saw in my dream that the interpreter took Christian by the hand, and led him into a place where a fire burned in a fireplace in the wall. A man stood by it, continually throwing buckets of water on the flames trying to quench it. However, the fire only burned higher and hotter. Again, Christian asked, what does this mean? The interpreter answered, this fire is the work of grace that has been kindled in the heart. The man throwing water on it to extinguish and put out the flame is the devil. Even though he continues to pour water on the fire, you can see the fire burns higher and hotter. Let me show you the reason for this. The interpreter led Christian behind the wall to the other side of the fire, where he saw a man with a container of oil in his hand. The man continually poured oil from the container secretly into the fire. What does this mean? Christian asked. The interpreter answered, This is Christ who continually maintains the work already begun with the oil of his grace in the heart. By this grace, in spite of what the devil can do, the souls of his people still prove to be gracious. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me.
2 Corinthians 12 9, The man you saw who stood behind the wall to maintain the fire, this was shown to teach you that it is hard for those who are tempted to understand how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. In my dream, I watched as the interpreter took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a pleasant place, where a beautiful stately palace stood. Now Christian was greatly delighted when he saw the striking building, but he was even more impressed at the sight of people walking around the top of the palace dressed in gold. Christian looked wide-eyed at the interpreter and asked, May we go inside? Without a word, the interpreter led him closer to the door of the palace. A big group of men stood in a knot in front of the entrance. They all wanted to enter, but they seemed to lack the courage to do so. A little distance from the door a man sat at a side table equipped with a book, his ink bottle and a quill. His role was to take the names of those who were determined to enter the palace. Christian's attention drifted to men posted at the doorway dressed in armor. They stood blocking the way and their clear intent was to prevent those who wanted to enter from getting in, even if it required violence. Christian pondered the meaning of all this. Finally, when all the men cowered back away from the door for fear of the armed men, Christian spotted one man who appeared very resolute. He strode up to the man who sat at the table and said, Sir, write down my name. As soon as the name was recorded in the book, the man drew his sword, put a helmet on his head, and rushed toward the palace door, where the armed men opposed him with deadly force. But the valiant man was not discouraged at all and fought fiercely, cutting and hacking his opponents. He both received and administered many wounds to those who attempted to keep him out, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14:22. Nevertheless, he cut his way through them all, and pressed forward into the palace. Those inside cried out with a joyous voice, even those who walked upon the top of the palace. The man of stout countenance fights his way into the palace. They said, Come in, come in, eternal glory you shall win. So he went in and was clothed with garments similar to those worn by the citizens of the palace. Christian smiled and said, I think I certainly know the meaning of this. Now let me go forward. The interpreter shook his head. No, you must stay until I have shown you a little more. After that you be on your way. The interpreter reached and took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a very dark room, where a man sat in an iron cage. The man appeared very sad. His eyes stared downcast at the ground, his hands folded with his fingers intertwined. He sighed as if his heart would break. Christian looked from the sad man to the interpreter. What does this mean? Talk to him. The interpreter pointed to the man in the cage. Christian looked to the man and asked, What are you doing here? The man answered, I am what I was not once. What were you once? The man said, I was once an attractive and thriving professing Christian. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root, they believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Luke 8 13, both in my own eyes, and in the eyes of others. I at one time was totally convinced I was on my way to the celestial city. I even had joyous thoughts about my arrival there. Well, what are you now? Christian asked. The man let out another sigh. I'm now a man of despair and am held captive by it, just as this iron cage portrays. I cannot get out. Oh how depressed I am now, because I cannot get out. But what happened? How did you end up in this condition? I neglected to watch and be sober. I loosened the restraints that kept my lusts in check. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. With each statement, his voice grew more troubled. I have grieved the spirit and he is gone. I flirted with temptation and the devil came to me. I have provoked God to anger and he has left me. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot repent. Christian tore his eyes from the man in the cage and looked to the interpreter. Is there no hope for such a man as this? Ask him. The interpreter nodded toward the caged man. Christian did as the interpreter said and asked the man, Do you have any hope that you will not be kept in the iron cage of despair? The man's eyes stared at the floor again. No, none at all. But why? Don't, you know that the son of the blessed is very merciful and compassionate. The man in the cage. I have crucified him again by my life. They again crucified to themselves the son of God, and put him to open shame. 
Hebrews 6 6 I have despised his person. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Dash Luke 19 14 I have despised his righteousness and regarded his blood as an unholy thing. I have acted spitefully to the spirit of grace. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Dash Hebrews 10:29. Therefore, I have shut myself out of all the promises of God. Now there remains for me nothing but threats, dreadful threats, truthful threats of certain judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour me as an enemy. Why? For what reasons did you bring yourself to this sorry condition? The man's eyes looked up for a moment. For the lusts, pleasures and profits of this world. It was the law of the enjoyment of these things that I promised myself increasing pleasure. His eyes dropped to stare at the floor again. But now every one of those things bites and snaps at me. They gnaw at my soul like a burning worm. But can't you repent and turn from this despicable condition? The man shook his head slowly. No for God has denied me repentance. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. Hebrews 6 4-6, his word gives me no encouragement to repent. Yes, he is the one who has shut me up in this iron cage even if all the men in the world tried to let me out, they would not be able. Remember this man's misery, the interpreter warned Christian. And let his sorry state be an everlasting warning to you. Christian moistened his dry lips. Well, this is a most fearful situation. May God help me to watch and to be sober, and to pray that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. Sir, is it not time for me to go on my way now? For Christian was quite ready to put this experience behind him wait just a little longer. I want to show you one more thing, and then you can go on your way. The interpreter took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a bedchamber where he saw a man getting out of bed. The man got dressed, but as he put on his clothes he shook and trembled. Christian asked, why does this man tremble like this? The man dreams. The interpreter turned and asked the trembling man to explain the reason for his shaking. The shaking man said, This evening I was fast asleep. While I slept, I dreamed. In the dream I saw the heavens grow extremely black. Lightning streaked across the sky followed by a most fearful thunderclap. It was terribly frightening and distressing. So I looked up in my dream, and the clouds rolled across the sky at an unusually fast rate. Among the noise of the storm, I heard the great blast of a trumpet and saw a man sitting upon a cloud served by thousands of heavenly beings in the midst of a flaming fire. Even the heavens were ablaze. A voice called out saying, Arise, you who are dead and come to judgment. And with it the rocks shattered, the graves opened, and the dead who were in them came forth. Some of them were ecstatic and looked upward with joy on their faces, but others cringed and tried to hide under the mountains. Then I saw the man who sat upon the cloud open the book. He invited all the world to draw near, but the fierce flame that surrounded him kept the people at a safe distance, much like the distance between a judge and prisoners at the bar in this world. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. John 5 28-29, those who attended the man sitting on the cloud, were ordered to gather together the tares, the chaff and stubble, and cast them into the burning lake. For behold the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi 4 1, just then the bottomless pit opened very near where I stood. Vok billowed and spewed from the mouth of the pit, along with coals of fire, and hideous noises. The heavenly attendants were commanded to gather my wheat into the storehouse. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Luke 3 17, and with that I saw many caught up and carried away into the clouds, but I was left behind. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Dash 1 Thessalonians 4 16-17 I wanted to hide myself, but I couldn't because the man who sat upon the cloud kept his eye on me. All my sins flooded into my mind and my conscience accused me on every side. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Romans 2 14 to 15 At this point I woke up. The shaking man's answer raised another question in Christian's mind, and he asked, But what made you so afraid of what you saw? Why, I thought that the day of judgment had come, the man said. And I was not ready for it. But the thing that frightened me most about it was that the angels gathered up several people around me and left me behind. Plus the pit of hell opened its mouth just where I stood, and my conscience distressed me because the judge always kept his eyes focused on me with the look of angry disapproval upon his face. Then the interpreter said to Christian, Have you considered all these things? Yes, and they challenged me with both hope and fear. Well, keep all these things in mind, so they may prod you to move forward in the right direction, the interpreter said. Then Christian began to make serious preparation for moving forward on his journey. Then the interpreter said, I pray the Comforter will always be with you, good Christian, to guide you in the way that leads to the celestial city. With that Christian went on his way saying, Here I have seen things rare and profitable, things pleasant and dreadful, things to make me not easily moved. Let me think on these things I have begun to accept, and to understand the purpose for which they were shown me. And let me be thankful to you, good interpreter. 6 Original Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. Romans 16 25 to 26. The third stage. Now in my dream, the highway on which Christian was to travel was fenced in on both sides with a wall called salvation. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, he sets up walls and ramparts for security. Isaiah 26 1. The burden Christian ran up this way with great difficulty because of the load on his back. He ran like this until he came to a place where the road climbed up a small hill. At the top of the hill stood a cross, and a little below at the bottom was a stone tomb. In my dream, just as Christian came up to the cross his burden loosened from his shoulders, and fell off his back. It tumbled and continued to do so down the hill, until it came to the mouth of the tomb, where it fell inside, and was seen no more. Christian was so glad, and overjoyed, and in his excitement he said, he has given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. Christian's burden falls off. He stood still for a while, and looked with astonishment at the cross. It surprised him that the sight of the cross released him of his burden. He looked and looked again as tears ran down his cheeks. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Dash 1 Peter 2 24 now as he stood looking and weeping behold three shining ones approached him, and greeted him with peace be to thee. The first of the shining ones said to him, Your sins are forgiven. He was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah 53 5 The second stripped Christian of his rags, and clothed him with a complete change of clothes. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Zechariah 3 4. The Three Shining Ones. The third placed a mark on Christian's forehead in him. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1 13, and gave him a scroll with a seal upon it. The third shining one said, Look on this as you run, and deliver it when you arrive at the gate of the celestial city. With that the shining ones went their way. Christian jumped for joy, leaping into the air three times, and went on his way singing. 
Thus far did I come burdened with my sin. No one could ease the grief that I was in. Until I came here. What a place this is. Is this place the beginning of my blessedness? Is this the place the burden fell from my back? Is this the place where the strings that bound it to me broke? Blessed cross. Blessed sepulchre. Blessed rather be. The man who there was put to shame for me. I saw in my dream that Christian continued on his way, until he came to the bottom of the hill. There he saw three men fast asleep next to the road with chains attached to their heels. The name of the first was Simple, the second was Sloth, and the third was called Presumption. When Christian saw these three pilgrims sleeping on the ground, he walked over to them, hoping he might be able to awaken them. He said, You are like those who sleep on the top of a mast, and you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea, or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. Proverbs 23:34 For the Dead Sea is under you, a gulf that has no bottom. So wake up and get moving. If you are willing, I will help you get your shackles off. He also told them, if he who goes about like a roaring lion comes by, you will certainly become a prey to his teeth. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Dash first Peter 5:8 with that they glanced at him and replied like this, Simple said, I see no danger. Sloth said, Just let me sleep a little more. And Presumption said, Every tub must stand upon its own, without the need of assistance. And so the three of them lay down again to sleep, and Christian decided it best to continue on his way. But it troubled Christian to think of the three men in such obvious danger. It also bothered him that they didn't appreciate the kindness he freely offered them. First of all he awoke them, plus, he volunteered to help them off with their shackles. As Christian reflected on this troubling encounter, he spotted two men tumbling over the wall, on the left-hand side of the narrow way. They hurried to catch up to him. The name of the one was formalist, and the name of the other hypocrisy. Like I said, they caught up to Christian, and he started a conversation with them. Gentlemen, Christian said, where did you come from and where are you going? Formalist and hypocrisy explain that they were born in the land of vainglory and were going to Mount Zion to receive praise. Christian looked from one man to the other and asked, Why didn't you enter at the gate, which is located at the beginning of this way? Don't, you know that it is written, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber, John 10 1. That may be true, they said. However, our countrymen have agreed that this gate you mentioned is too far away. So we usually just make a shortcut of it and climb over the wall at this point just as we have done. Formalist and hypocrisy coming into the way over the wall. Christian looked at the wall and back at his new travelling companions. Won't this custom of yours be looked at as a trespass against the lord of the celestial city to which we are headed, and so be considered a violation against his revealed will? Formalist and hypocrisy said, you don't have to trouble yourself about that. Our manner of climbing over the wall is a well-established custom. In fact, many witnesses have testified that it is an accepted route which has been well-established. The real question is, will your established practice stand up to investigation in a court of law? Christian asked. We believe so, the two men assured Christian. Our tradition has been accepted for a long time, more than a thousand years. Without a doubt, it will be admitted as a legal ordinance by any impartial judge. And from a practical standpoint, what difference does it make how we get on this way as long as we get onto it? If we are in, we are in. From what you've told us, you're in by way of the wicket gate, and we by tumbling over the wall. So what makes your present condition any better than ours? I walk by the rule of my master, Christian explained. You however, walk by the uninformed working of your imagination. You are already considered thieves by the Lord of the Way. Therefore, I have little doubt that you will not be found to be legitimate travellers at the end of the way. You entered by your own devices without his direction, and you will leave by yourselves without his mercy. To this they made almost no answer other than to tell Christian to mind his own business. Then in my dream, I saw each of the men continue to walk with Christian without talking much with one another except that they explain their laws and ordinances to Christian. We are as conscientious in obeying them as you, they said. 
Therefore, we don't see where you differ from us, except for the coat you are wearing. Most likely that was provided by your neighbors, to hide your shameful nakedness. Their words troubled young Christian. He said, you will not be saved by obedience to laws and ordinances, since you did not come in by the door. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Galatians 2:16. And as for this coat I wear, it was given to me by the Lord of the place, where I go, the celestial city. You are right that it was given to me to cover my nakedness. And let me say that I accepted it as a token of kindness to me, for I had been dressed in nothing but rags. Besides, it brings me comfort as I travel. I think about how the Lord will recognize me when I come to the gate of the celestial city, because I wear his coat, a coat he gave me freely in the day that he stripped me of my rags. And perhaps you didn't notice it, but I have a mark on my forehead. One of my Lord's most intimate associates placed it there the day my burden fell off my shoulders. I'll tell you this too. They also gave me a sealed scroll to read for comfort as I go on the way. I was told to turn it in at the celestial gate, as a token of my authorization to enter. However, I doubt you want any of these things since you didn't enter in at the gate. When he said this, they didn't answer him, but only looked at each other and burst out laughing. Then I watched as they all pressed on, but Christian walked on ahead of them. He decided to walk alone, and not to talk with these strangers any longer. Instead, he talked to himself, sometimes with great sighs and sometimes voicing contentment. As he traveled, he was often refreshed by reading the scroll that one of the shining ones had given him. They all went on till they came to the foot of the hill. At the bottom of the hill stood a spring, and an intersection with two other roads, besides the one which came straight from the wicket gate. One road turned to the left and the other to the right at the bottom of the hill, but the narrow way continued straight up the hill called Difficulty. Christian walked over to the spring, they will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down, for he who has compassion on them will lead them, and will guide them to springs of water. Isaiah 49 10, and drank to refresh himself, and then started running up the hill. He said, though the hill is high, I still desire to walk up it. I don't care how difficult it is, because I understand that it leads to the way of life. Cheer up heart and don't grow faint or fear, because even if it is difficult, it is better to go this way because it is the right way, for while the wrong way is easier, it ends in anguish. Formalists and hypocrisy also arrived at the foot of the hill. They paused to consider the hill and how steep and high it was, as well as the fact that there were two alternative ways to go. They assumed that these two easier ways would meet up with the narrow way on the other side of the hill, and decided to each choose one of the alternative roads. The name of one of those roads was Danger, and the name of the other Destruction. So one turned to take the way called Danger, which led him into vast woods, and the other took the way to Destruction, which led him into a wide field full of dark mountains, where he stumbled and fell, never to rise again. Christian Climbing the Hill Difficulty I looked toward Christian to see how far he had made it up the hill, but the steepness of the hill had caused him to slow his pace from running to walking, and from walking to clambering on his hands and his knees. Now about halfway to the top of the hill Christian came to a pleasant shady resting place, made by the Lord of the Hill for the refreshment of weary travellers. So as Christian reached this resting place, he sat down to rest a while. While he sat, he pulled his scroll from his chest pocket to read it for comfort and reassurance. He paused to take a fresh look at the new coat that had been given to him when he stood by the cross. After reading and being encouraged, he grew drowsy and fell fast asleep, and was delayed there until it was almost sunset. While he slept his scroll fell out of his hand, and someone came up to him and shook him to wake him. The person said, Go to the ant, you sluggish person, consider her ways and be wise, Proverbs 6 6. At this, Christian arose with a jolt and started on his way, racing ahead until he came to the top of the hill. Now when he reached the top of the hill, two men came running toward him in full flight from the opposite direction. The name of the one was Timorous and the other Mistrust. Christian greeted them with a question. Sirs, what's the matter? You are running the wrong way. Timorous answered, we were going to the city of Zion and made it up this hill difficulty, but the further we go, the more danger we encounter. 
so we decided to turn around and are returning home again. Mistrust nodded his agreement. Yes, this is true. Just ahead of you, lying directly in the way are a couple of lions. We weren't sure if they were awake or asleep, but we couldn't bear to think of what would happen if we came within their reach. They'd pull us in pieces. Christian looked wide-eyed at the two men. You make me afraid, he admitted. But on the other hand, where else would I flee for safety? If I go back to my home in the city of destruction, it is destined for judgment and awaiting fire and brimstone. I would certainly perish there. However, if I can get to the celestial city, I am sure to be safe there. I must press onward. To go back is nothing but death, but to go forward, though I may fear death, life everlasting is beyond it. I will still go forward. Mistrust and Timorous just shook their heads and ran down the hill, while Christian continued forward on his way. As he went, Christian pondered what he had heard from these men, and he felt for the scroll in his pocket, so he might read it to be assured and comforted. To his surprise, his fingers searched his empty pocket. The scroll wasn't there. Panic filled him, and he became very distressed. He didn't know what to do, for he had turned to the scroll for relief from his fears, plus, it was his authority for entering into the celestial city. At this point he became so perplexed he didn't know what to do. Christian meets mistrust and timorous. Then he remembered falling asleep at the shady resting place halfway up the hill difficulty, and figured out what had happened. He fell to his knees and asked God for forgiveness for his foolish neglect. Then without delay, he went back down the hill to look for his scroll. His heart was full of sorrow every step of the way. Sometimes he sighed, sometimes he wept, and he often chided himself for being so foolish as to fall asleep in that place. After all, it had been established for the purpose of modest refreshment from his weariness. He travelled back down the hill further and further, carefully looking on this side and on that. His eyes eagerly searched for any sight of the scroll, which had given him comfort so many times in his journey. He continued his downhill journey until he reached the shady resting place where he sat and slept. At the sight of this place his sorrow multiplied with the fresh reminder of his evil of sleeping. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Dash verse Thessalonians 5 6-8. In this way, he went on regretting his sinful sleep saying, O oh, wretched man that I am, that I should sleep in the daytime. That I should sleep in the midst of difficulty. A small sob escaped his lips with his breath. That I should so indulge myself as to allow rest for the ease of my flesh, to sleep in the place which the Lord of the hill built only for the relief of the spirits of pilgrims. I have taken these needless steps even in the same manner as Israel was required to do. It was for their sin that they were sent back again to wander in the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. In the same way, I am forced to walk this way again with sorrow, a way which should have only been walked with delight, had it not been for this sinful sleep. How much farther along I might have been on my way by this time. Instead, I am forced to walk these steps three times instead of once. And now the night is about to overtake me since the day is almost spent. Oh, if only I had not slept. By this time, he had finally arrived at the shady resting place again, where for a while he sat down and wept. He remained downcast until at last, his eyes fell upon the scroll. His fingers trembled with excitement as he snatched it up and thrust it into his pocket next to his heart. I can't begin to say how joyful Christian was when he recovered his scroll. For this scroll was the assurance of his life and acceptance of the desired sanctuary of the celestial city. So with the scroll safely tucked away in his pocket, he thanked God for directing his eye to the place where it lay and with joy and tears he focused on moving forward in his journey. Oh, how nimbly he climbed the rest of the hill. Yet before he reached the top, the sun had set upon Christian. It made him all the more aware of the foolishness of his sleeping, and how it had delayed him. He again began to grieve. How sinful you are, O oh sleep! Because of you my journey which should have been in the light has been overtaken by the night. I must walk without the sun. Darkness covers the path of my feet and now I must listen to noises of miserable creatures, all because of my sinful sleep. Now the story Mistrust and Timorous had told him came to mind along with how they were frightened by the sight of the lions. 
Then Christian said to himself, These beasts prowl in the night for their prey. If they should meet up with me in the darkness, how can I possibly avoid them? How can I escape being torn in pieces by them? He nervously went on his way, growing more jittery as he went. While he complained about his unhappy circumstances, he lifted up his eyes and spotted a regal palace directly ahead of him. The name of it was the Palace Beautiful, and it stood to one side of the highway. In my dream, Christian hurried along the way toward the palace, in hopes that he might get lodging there. However, before he had gone far, he entered into a very narrow passage, which was about 220 yards long, off the porter's lodge. He carefully proceeded through the restricted path, keeping his eyes alert as he went, and there he spotted two lions standing in the way. He thought, now I see the dangers that cause mistrust and timorous to turn back and flee. The lions were chained, but he couldn't see the chains that constrain the ferocious beasts, fear filled him, and he thought about going back, just as they did, because at that moment he thought there was nothing ahead of him but death. But the porter at the palace lodge, whose name was Watchful, noticed Christian's hesitation, and that he looked as if he might go back. The porter cried out to him, Is your strength and courage so small? And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Dash Mark 440 Don't be afraid of the lions for they are chained. They are placed there to test your faith at this point in your journey. They also show clearly those who have no faith. So stay in the middle of the path, and you will not be harmed. Christian passes the lions. Then I saw Christian go forward, though he still trembled with fear of the lions. He took care to follow the porter's directions, and stayed to the middle of the path. The lions roared and snarled, but they did him no harm. He clapped his hands with joy and went on till he stood before the palace gate where the porter awaited him. Then said Christian to Watchful, Sir, what is the purpose of this house? And may I stay here for the night? The porter answered, This house was built by the Lord of the Hill and he built it for the relief and security of pilgrims. The porter looked directly at Christian and asked, Where are you from and where are you going? I have come from the city of destruction, Christian said, and I'm going to Mount Zion. But now that the sun is set, I would like, if I may, to stay here tonight. What is your name? Now my name is Christian, but originally my name was Graceless. I was born of the race of Japheth, whom God will persuade to dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Genesis 9:27. The porter's eyes narrowed. But how is it that you have arrived so late? The sun has already set. Christian looked away for a moment, too ashamed to meet the porter's eyes. I would have been here sooner, but worthless man that I am, I slept in the shady resting place that stands on the hill difficulty. Even in spite of that, I would have been here much sooner, except that while I slept, I lost my scroll of certification. When I reached the top of the hill, I felt for it in my pocket. When it wasn't there, my heart was filled with sorrow, and I was forced to go back to the place where I had overslept. I finally found it there, and pressed forward on my journey once again. Now at this hour, I have come this far. The porter said, Well, I will call out one of the virgins of this place. If she likes what you have to say, she will invite you to join the rest of the family, according to the rules of the house. So watchful the porter rang a bell. At the sound of the bell, a serious but beautiful young woman named Discretion, came out of the door of the house and asked, Where have you called me? The porter answered, This man is on a journey from the city of destruction to Mount Zion, but he's weary, and seeing that the sun has set he asked if he might stay here for tonight. So I told him I would call for you, and that after talking with him, you would decide what seems best according to the rules of the house. Then the young woman asked Christian, Where are you from, and where are you going? He told her, and she also asked him how he got into the way, and he told her. Then she asked him what he had seen and met within the way, and he told her all that as well. Lastly, she asked his name. He said, My name is Christian, and I have a greater desire to stay here tonight, now that I understand this place was built by the Lord of the Hill for the relief and security of pilgrims. So she smiled and tears brimmed in her eyes. After a slight pause she said, I will call for two or three more of the family. So she ran to the door and called to Prudence Piety and Charity, who came out to meet him. Following a little more conversation with him, they invited him inside to meet the rest of the family. Many of them met him at the threshold of the house, and warmly welcomed him inside saying, Come in, 
you who are blessed of the Lord. This house was built by the Lord of the hill, specifically for the purpose of entertaining pilgrims such as you. Christian bowed his head in respect, and followed them into the house. Once inside, he sat down and they gave him something to drink. They agreed that until supper was ready, to make the best use of time, some of them should have a conversation with Christian regarding specific matters. So piety, prudence and charity were chosen for this discussion, and they began to talk with him. Christian is asked about his journey. Come Christian, piety said. Since we have shown love to you and received you into our house tonight, let's talk about all things that have happened to you in your pilgrimage. Perhaps talking about these things will help us better ourselves. I'm thankful for your goodwill, and I am glad your attitude is so friendly. Piety asked, what made you decide to take to a pilgrim's life in the first place? I was driven from my native country by a dreadful message that unavoidable destruction would consume me if I continued to live in the city of destruction. But how did it happen that you came from your country in this direction? She asked. Christian told her that it was what God wanted. For when I was fearful of destruction hanging over me, I did not know which way to go. But by chance a man by the name of Evangelist came to me as I was trembling and weeping. He directed me to the wicket gate. If he hadn't, I would never have found it, and so he pointed out the way that has led me directly to this house. Piety's brow furrowed in thought. But didn't you come by the way of the house of the interpreter? Oh yes, Christian nodded, eager to share the experience. The things I saw there are most memorable. They'll stick with me as long as I live. Three of the things I saw especially made an impact. The first is how Christ, in opposition to Satan, maintains his work of grace in the heart. The second is how the man in the iron cage had sinned himself quite out of hope of God's mercy, and the third is the dream of the man who thought in his sleep that the day of judgment had come. Did you hear him tell his dream? Yes, Christian said. I thought it a dreadful revelation. It made my heart ache as he told it, and yet I am glad I heard it. Was this all you saw at the house of the interpreter? Christian shook his head. No. He took me to a place where he showed me a stately palace, and how the people in the palace were dressed in gold. Then a courageous man cut his way through the armed men who stood at the door to keep him out, and once he did, he was commanded to come inside and win eternal glory. My heart and mind were totally overwhelmed at the sight of these things. I would have stayed at that good man's house for a year, except I knew I had farther to go. What else did you see along the way? The? Well, I had only gone a little farther when I saw one, as if in my mind, hanging upon a tree bleeding. The very sight of him made my burden fall off my back. For I had groaned under a very heavy burden, but it dropped off my back just like that. He snapped his fingers. I had never seen such a thing and it surprised me. While I stood looking up, for I couldn't stop looking, three shining ones came to me. One of them declared that my sins were forgiven, another stripped off my rags and gave me this embroidered coat I'm wearing, and the third set the mark you see upon my forehead, and gave me this sealed scroll. He pulled the scroll from his pocket and showed it to her. But you saw even more than this, didn't you? Christian thought about it for a second and said, The things I have told you were the best, but I did see some other interesting things. For instance, I saw three men, simple sloth and presumption, lying asleep beside the way by which I came. They wore shackles upon their heels. But do you think I could awaken them? It was almost impossible. I also saw formalist and hypocrisy come tumbling over the wall instead of entering by the wicket gate, and they pretended to be headed to Zion. But they were quickly lost, and even though I warned them, they would not believe. However, the hardest thing for me was getting up this hill and it was equally difficult to muster the faith to get by the mouths of the lions. I'm telling you, if it hadn't been for the good man watchful, the porter who stands at the gate, I'm not sure that I wouldn't have gone back down the hill. But I thank God I am here and thank you for receiving me. Prudence jumped into the conversation and said, I have a few questions I'd like you to answer. First, do you sometimes think of the country from which you came? Yes, he let out a sigh. But not with fondness. I think of where I came from with much shame and loathing. And the truth be told, if I had yearned for that country, I might have taken opportunity to return there by now. Instead, my heart desires a better country, that is a heavenly one. And indeed if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, 
they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11 15-16 Prudence took in a deep breath and let it out slowly. Don't you carry some memories of the things you did there, and the people you talked to? Yes I do, but greatly against my will, especially deep inside my carnal thoughts and reasoning. You see all my countrymen as well as myself, delighted in debating about such things. But now all those things only grieve me. If I could control my thoughts, I would choose never to think of those carnal things ever again. But even if I was able to do that which is best, that which is worst would still live within me. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Romans 7 15, 21, Prudence tilted her head slightly to the side. Did you sometimes find that those things related to personal carnality were overcome, yet at other times were cause for great puzzlement and confusion? Sure, but those times of victory over carnality happened infrequently. However, when they did happen, it was truly golden. When you experience such precious times in overcoming carnal annoyances, can you remember how you obtain these victories? Yes, there are several means. For instance, when I think and meditate on what I saw at the cross, that will do it. And when I look at my embroidered coat, that will do it. Plus when I read and study the scroll I carry in my pocket next to my heart, that will do it. When my thoughts are warmly stimulated about where I am going, that will do it too. Prudence pressed him further. And what is it that makes you so desirous to go to Mount Zion? Christian's eyes grew wide and dreamy. Why, I hope to see him alive who hung dead on the cross. And then there I hope to be rid of all those things that remain as an annoyance to me. There at the celestial city they say there is no death, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning, or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. Revelation 21 4, and there I shall dwell with such companions as I like best. For to tell you the truth, I love him because he released me from my burden, and I am weary of my inward sickness. In view of this, I prefer to be where I shall die no more, and in the company of others who shall continually cry, Holy, holy, holy. Christian is instructed at the Palace Beautiful. Charity glanced around and looked back at Christian. Why didn't you bring them along with you? He hung his head and wept. Oh, how willingly would I have brought them. I have a wife and children and neighbors, but all of them were utterly against my going on pilgrimage. Charity pursed her lips. But you should have talked to them, and should have attempted to show them the danger of staying behind. Christian gestured with his palms up as he shrugged. I did. He let his arms drop. I also told them what God had shown to me about the destruction of our city, but they looked at me like one telling a joke, and they didn't believe me. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Genesis 19:14. And did you pray to God that he would bless them with understanding of your warning to them? Oh yes, he nodded fervently. I prayed with much love. You must know that my wife and poor children were very dear to me. But did you tell them of your own sorrow and fear of destruction? I expect that the prospect of destruction was clear enough to you. Christian ran his fingers through his hair. I did. Again and again and again. They could also see my fears were very real by my expression by my tears, and also in the way I trembled under the anxiety of the judgment that hung over our heads but even all this wasn't enough to get them to come with me. But why on earth wouldn't they come? What did they have to say for themselves for why they would not come? Christian wiped his hand across his face and looked at the ground. Well for one thing, my wife was afraid of losing what she has in this world. And my children, he looked up at charity. Well, they were absorbed with the foolish pleasures of youth. So because of these types of things and other distractions, they left me to wander in this distressed frame of mind alone. The young woman's face grew more serious. So with all your efforts to persuade your loved ones to depart from the city of destruction and come with you, did your futile empty manner of life discourage them from acting on your advice? Christian's lips drew into a grimace. I admit I cannot commend my life. 
I am well aware of my many failings. I also know that a man, by the way he lives his life, can quickly invalidate whatever arguments or advice he presents to others for their own good. Yet this I can say, I was very careful to avoid behavior on my part that would be considered disgraceful. I hope to avoid giving them any excuse that would turn them against the idea of going on this pilgrimage. In fact for this very behavior they criticized me, saying I was too strict, and that I denied myself things for their sakes, in which they saw no evil. I can honestly say that if what they saw in me hindered them, it was my own great kind-heartedness in being careful not to sin against God, or of doing any wrong to my neighbor. Charity's head bobbed slightly in understanding. Even as you say, Cain hated his brother because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous, 1 John 3:12. and if your wife and children have been offended at you for this reason, they show themselves to be unyielding toward what is good. You have delivered your soul from accountability for their blood. Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Ezekiel 3:19. Now I saw in my dream that they sat talking together like this until supper was ready. When it was time to eat, they sat down to a table filled with good substantial foods and robust wine. All their conversation around the table was about the Lord of the hill, and included what he had done and the purpose behind it. For instance, they talked about why he had built that house. By what they said, I understood that he had been a great warrior, and had fought with and slain him who had the power of death. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. Hebrews 2 14-15, but not without great danger to himself, which made me love him all the more. Christian continued the conversation as he ate. For as they said, and as I believe, he lost a lot of blood doing this but he did it all in the glory of grace, and with a motive of pure love for his country. Besides this, some of the others around the table said they had spoken with him following his death on the cross. Plus, they testified that they heard from his own lips that he is such a lover of poor pilgrims, that no one else is like him in the whole world. To make their point, they gave an example of how he had stripped himself of his glory, so he might do this for the poor. Those who had heard from him confirmed that he would not live in the mountain of Zion alone. They also talked of how he had made many pilgrims into princes, even though by nature they were born beggars, and their nature originated from the dunghill. He raises the poor from the dust, he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles, and inherit a seat of honor, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. 1 Sam. 2 8. In this way they spoke together till late at night, and after they had committed themselves to their Lord for protection, they each went to bed. They put Christian up in a large upper bedchamber with a window that opened towards the sunrise. The name of the room was Peace, where he slept until dawn. When he awoke that morning he sang joyfully. Where am I now? Is this the love and care of Jesus, for the men that pilgrims are? Thus to provide, that I should be forgiven? and dwell already the next door to heaven. So in the morning they all got up and after more conversation, they told Christian he should not leave, until they had shown him the distinctive features of that place. First they brought him into the study, where they showed him records of the greatest antiquity. There in my dream, they showed Christian the bloodline of the Lord of the Hill. It showed that he was the son of the Ancient of Days, and came from an eternal generation. These records also revealed more fully the deeds he had done, and the names of many hundreds whom he had recruited into his service. They also showed how he had placed them in such a dwelling that would never pass away by undergoing decay or the passing of time. They read to Christian the worthy acts that some of his servants had done. Then they read to him some of the notable deeds performed by some of his servants, including how they had subdued kingdoms, brought about righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, and escaped the edge of the sword. Yet out of weakness they were made strong and became valiant in the fight, and turned foreign armies to flight. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight.
Hebrews 11:33 to 34. Then they read another part of the records of the house, which revealed how willing their Lord was to receive any person, no matter what kind of person they were, into his favor. This even included people who had in the past offered excessive insults to his character and accomplishments. Along with these, several other historical documents provided accounts of many other famous events which Christian also viewed. These records included things both ancient and modern, along with prophecies and predictions concerning specific matters that are certain to be fulfilled, both to the dread and amazement of enemies, and the comfort and relief of pilgrims. The next day they brought Christian into the armory, where they showed him a variety of military weapons which their Lord had provided for pilgrims. There was a sword, shield helmet, breastplate or prayer and shoes that would not wear out. The great supply was enough to outfit as many men for the service of their Lord, as there are multitudes of stars in the heavens. They also showed him some of the military equipment, which some of his servants had used to accomplish wonderful things. They showed him Moses' rod, the hammer and nail with which Jael slew Sisera, the pitches, trumpets and lamps too, with which Gideon put the Midian armies to flight. Then they showed him the ox goad which Shamgar used to slay six hundred men and the jawbone with which Samson did such mighty feats. They also brought out the sling and stone with which David slew Goliath of Gath, and the sword their lord would eventually use to kill the man of sin on that day of final victory over the predator. Besides these items, they showed him many excellent things that delighted Christian very much. They finished and at the end of the day they went to bed again. Then I saw in my dream on the following day that Christian got up expecting to head out on his journey, but those in the palace invited him to stay for one more day. They said, If the day is clear, we will show you the delectable mountains, for they will further add to your comfort, because they are so much nearer to the celestial city than where you are now. So he agreed to stay, and the next morning they brought him to the top of the house, and said, Look south. When he did, he saw a range of very pleasant mountains a great distance away. They were covered with beautified woods, vineyards fruits of all sorts as well as flowers. Springs and fountains flowed freely, and the place was very appealing to look at. He will dwell on the heights, his refuge will be the impregnable rock, his bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty, they will behold a far distant land. Isaiah 33 16-17, Christian asked, What is the name of the country? Emmanuel's land, they said. For true pilgrims, it offers the same character as this hill on which the palace is located. When you go there, from that vantage point you may see the gate of the celestial city, which the shepherds who live there will make appear. Now he gave thought to leaving the next day and of making preparations, but his companions said, First, let us go back into the armory. So they did, and when Christian walked into the room, they equipped him from head to foot with fully tested weapons, just in case he should be assaulted on the way. Once he was well outfitted, he walked out with his friends to the gate. There he asked the porter, Have you seen any pilgrim pass by? The porter answered, Yes I have. Tell me, do you know his name? Christian asked. I did ask him his name and he told me it was faithful. Oh I know him, Christian said. He is my townsman, my near neighbor. He comes from the place where I was born, the city of destruction. How far do you think he is ahead of me? The porter thought for a moment and said, By this time he has probably passed beyond the foot of the hill. Well good porter, the Lord be with you and increase your blessings for all the kindness you have shown me. Seven original, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Zechariah 12 10. 8 Original, And Jesus seeing their faith said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven, Mark 2 5. The Fourth Stage Then Christian headed out, but discretion piety charity, and prudence decided they would go with him to the foot of the hill. So they walked on together while reiterating their former discussions on their way to the bottom of the hill. Christian said, while it was difficult coming up the hill, so far as I can see, it is even more dangerous going down. Yes, Prudence agreed. So it is. For it is a hard matter for a man to go down into the valley of humiliation, as you are doing now, without slipping along the way. It is for this reason that we decided to accompany you down the hill. 
so they continued to gather down the hill, and though Christian walked very carefully, he still slipped a time or two. Then I saw in my dream, that when Christian and his good companions reached the bottom of the hill, his companions gave him a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and a cluster of raisins, and said farewell to him, and he went on his way. While Christian was among his godly friends, their precious words offered plenty of amends for all his grief, and when they let him go, he was clad with northern steel from top to toe. But it didn't take long for Christian to be hard-pressed, in this valley of humiliation. He had only gone a little way before he spotted a foul fiend coming across the field to meet him. The fiend's name was Apollyon, which means destroyer. Fear filled Christian. His mind raced trying to figure out what to do. Should he go back or stand his ground? As he considered his options he thought about retreating, but he had no armor for his back. If he ran away and turned his back to the fiend, it might give his foe a greater advantage, making it easier to pierce him with his darts. So Christian determined to stand his ground and risk confrontation with the enemy. He was out of time, and it was the best thing to do. So he continued on, and Apollyon met him. The monster was hideous and clothed with scales like a fish. They were his pride. He also had wings like a dragon, feet like a bear, and out of his belly spewed fire and smoke, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. When he came up to Christian, he eyed him with disdain and began to question him. The fiend asked, Where did you come from, and where are you going? Christian swallowed his fear and said, I have come from the city of destruction, which is the place of all evil, and I am going to the city of Zion. Christian goes down into the valley of humiliation. From destruction, you say. Then that means you are one of my subjects, for all that country is mine. You see, I am its prince and god. Apollyon's eyes narrowed. So how is it then, that you have run away from your king? If it wasn't for my plans for you to serve me more, I would strike you to the ground with one smashing blow right now for such an act. Christian stood his ground. I was indeed born in your dominion, but your service was hard and your wages such as a man cannot live on, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So when I reached adulthood, I did what thoughtful people do, I looked for a way that I might perhaps improve myself. Apollyon looked down on Christian with eyes hooded with pride. No prince worthy of his title releases his subjects easily, and I am no different. I am not ready to let you loose as yet, but since you have complained about your service and wages, let me encourage you to go back home. I personally promise that what our country can afford I will give you. Christian shook his head. I can't do that. You see, I have already yielded myself to another, even to the king of princes. How can I in all fairness go back with you? One side of Apollyon's thin upper lip curled. You have done exactly as the proverb says, exchanged a bad for a worse. However, it is quite common for those who have professed themselves to be his servants, to give him the slip after a while and return to me. Do this and I promise all will be well. Christian stood his ground. I have given him my faith and sworn my allegiance to him. How can I possibly go back on my word and not be hanged as a traitor? Think about it. You did the same to me and yet I am willing to forget about it, if you will turn again and go back to destruction, Apollyon responded. Christian raised his palm toward the fiend. No. What I promised to you happened when I was but an immature youth. Besides that, I regard the prince, under whose banner I now stand, to be the one able to absolve me of your charges. He let his hand drop and looked Apollyon directly in the eye. And yes, he is also able to pardon the things I did in service to you. Besides that, O oh destroying Apollyon to tell you the truth, I like his service, his wages, his servants, his government, his company and country better than yours. So stop trying to change my mind. I am the Lord's servant, and I have made up my mind to follow him. A wisp of smoke curled from Apollyon's nostrils. That's all well and good, but think of what it will be like when your spirits are low, and you have so much to get done. He paused dramatically and raised the bony-looking ridge above his right eye. You are aware that, for the most part, his servants come to a wretched end, because they are transgressors against me and my ways. How many of them have been shamefully put to death? And you consider his service better than mine, even though he has never come from that heavenly place where he is, to rescue any of his servants, out of their enemies' hands. On the other hand, the world knows I am nothing like that. 
Look at how many times I have delivered those who faithfully served me, either by my power, or by the use of fraudulent schemes, even when they were taken by him and his followers. And so will I rescue you in the same way, Christian. You don't understand, Christian said. His present restraint in delivering them is deliberate and with purpose. It is to test their love and prove whether they will be loyal to him to the end. And as for the shameful end you say is their destiny, that isn't an end, for they are assured of receiving future glory. In fact, they don't expect deliverance now. Instead they are content to wait for their future glory, and they will have it when their prince comes in his glory along with the angels. Apollyon jabbed his pointed finger in Christian's direction. You have already been unfaithful in your service to him, so how is it that you think you are going to receive wages from him? Tell me Apollyon. In what ways have I been unfaithful to him? Very soon after setting out from destruction you were quickly discouraged, when you were almost choked in the slough of despond. He raised his bony finger to track just how unfaithful the pilgrim had been. You also made several wrong attempts to be rid of your burden, when you should have waited until your prince had taken it off. He ticked off his point on a second finger. Plus you simply overslept, you lost your precious possession and you almost turned back at the sight of the lions. He ran out of fingers on which to count Christian's missteps, and dramatically threw his hand in the air with a flare to make his point of just how unfaithful Christian had been. And when you talk about your journey, and of what you have seen and heard, inwardly you desire personal praise for all you say and do. Christian glanced at the ground. All this is true, in fact, there is much more that you left out. He looked back at Apollyon, but the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. But besides these wrongdoings which I committed in your country where I was brought up and educated in them, I have groaned under and repented of them. As a result, I have received a full pardon from my prince regarding these crimes. Apollyon broke into a furious rage, saying, I am an enemy to this prince. I hate his person, his laws, and his people. He spit the words as if they left a bad taste in his mouth. I have come out here to purposely oppose you. Christian did not back away. He said, Apollyon be careful of what you are doing, for I am on the king's highway, the way of holiness. So watch yourself. Apollyon defiantly straddled the entire width of the way blocking Christian's way. I'm not afraid in this, the fiend hissed. Prepare to die, for I swear by my infernal den that you will go no further, for here will I spill your soul. Without warning he hurled a flaming dot at Christian's breast but Christian lifted the shield in his hand, and deflected it, and so avoided the danger. Christian drew his sword, for he saw it was time to rouse himself to action. Apollyon quickly responded by throwing darts as thick as hail, and even with all the skill he could muster Christian could not deflect them all. Apollyon inflicted wounds to his head, hand, and foot. Christian retreated a little, and Apollyon pressed more forcefully. Yet Christian took courage and resisted as fearlessly as he could. This agonizing combat lasted for more than half a day, until Christian was almost exhausted. For you should know that because of Christian's wounds, he inevitably grew weaker and weaker. Then Apollyon spotted his opportunity. He began to press closer to Christian, wrestled with him, and threw him hard to the ground. Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Apollyon's teeth showed in a sneer. I am sure of you now. The fiend drew closer intending to inflict a mortal wound. Christian began to despair for his life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon prepared to make his final blow to destroy this good man, Christian nimbly reached out his hand and gripped his sword. He cried out, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall I will rise, Micah 7 8. With that Christian gave Apollyon a deadly thrust. The fiend drew back, like someone who had received a fatal wound. Christian recognized the opportunity and moved in on him again saying, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, Romans 8:37. Apollyon spread his dragon wings and quickly took to the air and flew away, until Christian no longer saw him. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4 7. Now, unless you had seen and heard the intensity of this combat like I did, you can't imagine the yelling and hideous roaring Apollyon made throughout the fight. Along with that, he spoke like a dragon. And on the other side of the fight, sighs and groans burst from Christian's heart. I had never seen him give so much as one pleasant look throughout the hellish fight, until he knew he had wounded Apollyon with his two-edged sword. 
Then a smile brightened his face and he looked up. But it was the battle itself that was the most dreadful sight I ever saw. Christian defeats Apollyon. So when the battle was over Christian declared, I will give thanks right here, and now to him who has delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, that is Apollyon. He followed this with words of gratitude saying, Great Beelzebub, the captain of this fiend, made plans for my ruin, and with this in mind he sent out Apollyon fully equipped and in a rage. And the hellish fiend fiercely engaged me, but bless Michael help me and by the blow of my sword I quickly made him fly. Therefore to him let me give lasting praise and thank him bless his holy name always. Then a hand appeared to Christian, offering some leaves from the tree of life. He accepted them and applied the leaves to the wounds he had received in the battle. His wounds healed immediately. Christian took time to sit down in that place to eat bread and drink from the bottle, which had been given to him for refreshment. Once finished, he headed out to continue his journey with his sword drawn in his hand. He said, who knows if there might be some other enemy at hand. But the remainder of his journey through this valley remained quiet, and he experienced no more trouble from Apollyon. Now at the end of this valley stretched another called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. It was necessary for Christian to go through it, because the way to the celestial city lay in that direction. Now, this valley was a very solitary place. The prophet Jeremiah describes it like this, a wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, a land that no man, but a Christian passes through, and where no man dwells, Jeremiah 2 6. Now here Christian was tested more severely than in his fight with Apollyon, as you shall see in the following account. I saw then in my dream, that when Christian reached the borders of the shadow of death, he met two men. They were children of the spies who had delivered an evil report about the good land, and who quickly determined to go back. So they gave out to the sons of Israel, a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone, in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. Numbers 1332 Christian spoke to the two men asking, Where are you going? The two said, Back. We are definitely going back. And truthfully, we would have you do the same, if you value life or peace. Why? Christian looked out at the valley. What's the matter with the way ahead? Matter, the two said together. We were going that way just as you are and went as far as we dared. In fact, if we had gone on a little further, we wouldn't be here to bring you the news. But what did you encounter? Christian wanted to know. The men looked at each other and back at Christian. Why, when well, we were almost in the valley of the shadow of death, but by good fortune we looked ahead of us and saw the danger before we came to it. The Valley of the Shadow of Death Furrows of frustration gathered between Christian's brows. What? What did you see? The? Why the valley itself? They leaned close and almost whispered. It's dark as pitch, and we also saw hobgoblins, satyrs and dragons of the pit. They stood a little straighter and looked over their shoulders. We also heard things in that valley like a continual howling and yelling. Sounds of a people in misery too great for words, people bound in affliction and irons. Besides all that, discouraging clouds of confusion hung over that valley, while death spread his wings and hovered over it. In a word, it was a completely dreadful sight being surrounded with nothing but disorder. The land of utter gloom as darkness itself, of deep shadow without order, and which shines as the darkness. Job 10:22. Christian slowly exhaled. While I haven't seen what you describe, it doesn't change the fact that this is my way to the desired haven. Our heart has not turned back, and our steps have not deviated from your way, yet you have crushed us in the place of jackals and covered us with this shadow of death. Psalm 44 18, 19, the two men shrugged. If it is still your way, be that as it may, but we will not choose it for ours. So they parted ways, and Christian went on his way, with his sword still drawn and ready in his hand, for fear he might be assaulted. Then I saw in my dream an overview of the valley. As far as it reached on the right was a very deep ditch. It is this ditch into which the blind have led the blind throughout time, and have both perished miserably. On the left there was a very dangerous bottomless quagmire. If a man should fall into it even a good man, there is no bottom for his foot to stand on. King David once fell into that quagmire, and would no doubt have been smothered if it wasn't for he who was able who plucked him out. 
deliver me from the mire and do not let me sink, may I be delivered from my foes and from the deep waters. Psalm 69 14. Walking in the dark, Christian was careful to avoid the ditch on the one hand, but the way was so narrow it put him at risk of tipping the other way into the mire on the left. In the same way, if he tried to avoid the mire without great caution, he found himself on the brink of falling into the ditch. In this way he went on. The effort brought one sigh after another, for besides the dangers of the ditch and the quagmire, the pathway was so dark that he often couldn't see where his next step would land. Now in about the middle of this valley, I observed the mouth of hell. It stood hard against the narrow way. When Christian saw it, he wondered what he should do because of the flames and smoke that poured from it, not to mention the sparks and hideous noises. These things had no respect for Christian's sword such as Apollyon had shown. He was forced to put up his sword and to take another weapon, called all prayer. With all prayer and petition pray at all times in the spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Ephesians 6 18. Christian cried out, in my hearing saying, O Lord, I beg you to deliver my soul. Then I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Psalm 116 4. So Christian went on like this a long time as he continued on the way, yet the flames still reached towards him, while doleful voices continued their unsettling calls, and rushed back and forth to the point that he sometimes thought he would be torn in pieces, or tramped upon like mire in the streets. He made slow progress over several miles, surrounded by these frightful sights and dreadful noises. He finally reached a place where he thought he heard a group of fiends approaching to meet him. He stopped. His thoughts raced as he tried to figure out the best thing to do. He played with the idea of turning back, but then again he thought he might be halfway through the valley by now. He remembered how he had already overcome many perils, and that the dangers of going back might be much more than those going forward. So he made up his mind to go on. Yet the fiends seemed to draw nearer and nearer to his location. When it seemed they were almost on him, he cried out with a most fervent voice, I will walk in the strength of the Lord God. With that, the fiends drew back and came no further. One thing I shouldn't forget to mention, is how poor Christian looked so confused. As I watched him, it was like he didn't even know his own voice. Just when he came to the mouth of the burning pit, one of the wicked ones sneaked up behind him. He whispered softly into his ear with many suggestive and distressing blasphemies. Christian thought these blasphemies had originated in his own mind, and it troubled him deeply. As he continued on his journey, the thought that he could possibly blaspheme the one who loved him so much weighed heavily on him. In fact, it tested Christian more than anything he had met with before. If he could have helped it, he would not have done it, but he didn't have the foresight to either stop his ears, or to understand the real source of these blasphemies. When Christian had travelled in this depressed condition for a significant amount of time, he thought he heard the voice of a man on the way ahead of him, saying, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, Psalm 23 4. As a result, gladness filled Christian's heart for these reasons. First, because he gathered from what he heard that others who feared God were in this valley along with him. Secondly, since he understood that God was with them, even in such a dark and dismal place, he reasoned that his invisible presence was with him in spite of the hindrances of such a place. Were he to pass by me, I would not see him, were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. Job 9 11. Thirdly he hoped to catch up and enjoy some fellowship with the man ahead, and thought about calling to him, though he didn't know what to say, for he had also thought himself to be alone. Finally, the light of morning dawned and Christian said, He has turned the shadow of death into morning. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea, and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. Amos 5 8. Now in light of the new day he looked back, not because he wanted to go back the way he had come, but to see more clearly what hazards he had navigated through in the dark. He could see the ditch perfectly on the one side and the quagmire on the other, along with just how narrow the way was which lay between them. He could also see the hobgoblins, satyrs and dragons of the pit, but they kept their distance. Apparently, after the break of day, they were reluctant to come near. Yet he saw them in fulfillment of that which is written, he reveals mysteries from the darkness, and brings the deep darkness into light, Job 12 22. 
Christian was greatly encouraged that he had made it through all the dangers of his solitary journey so far. He could now see these dangers, though he feared them more than ever, because the light of day exposed them. So the rising sun offered even more mercy to Christian, because it is important to note, that though the first part of the valley of the shadow of death was dangerous, this second part which stretched ahead of him, was if possible, far more dangerous. From the place where he currently stood, he could see that throughout the remainder of the valley, the way was full of snares, traps, gins and nets. Along with that, the depths were so full of pits, pitfalls, deep holes, and unsafe ledges that if it had been dark now, like it was when he came to the first part of the way, even if he had a thousand souls, they all would have been lost. But as I said, the sun was now rising. Then said he, his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, Job 29 3. Christian enters the second part of the valley of the shadow of death. Christian made it to the end of the valley walking in the light. Now I saw in my dream that at the end of the valley lay blood bones ashes and mangled bodies of men, even of pilgrims who had gone this way earlier. While I pondered the possible reason for such remains, I spotted a little cave ahead of me where two giants Pope and Pagan, lived in old times. It was by their power and tyranny that the men whose bones blood ashes and other remains lay in this place, were cruelly put to death. But Christian passed by this place without much danger, and it somewhat surprised me. But I have learned that Pagan has been dead many a day. As for the other, though he is still alive, because of his old age and many shrewd conflicts from his younger days, he has grown so crazy and stiff in his joints, that he can do little more than sit in his cave's mouth, grinning at pilgrims as they go by, and biting his nails in frustration because he can no longer intercept them. So Christian went on his way, but he didn't know what to think of the old man sitting at the mouth of the cave, especially because Pope was unable to approach him, though he spoke to him saying, you will never mend, till more of you are burned. But Christian held his peace, and smiled as he went by and suffered no harm. Then he sang a song. A world of wonders I can say no less, that I should be preserved in that distress. I have met with here, O oh, bless be, the hand that from it has delivered me. Dangers in darkness, devil's hell and sin, did surround me, while I this veil was in. There's pits, traps, and nets did lie. About my path, that worthless eye, might have been caught entangled and cast down. But since I live, let Jesus wear the crown. The Fifth Stage Now as Christian went on his way, he came to a slight inclined design to allow pilgrims to see more easily ahead. From up there, Christian went along and looking up he saw faithful in the distance, intent on his journey. Christian cried out loudly to get his attention. Hear, hear, look here. Wait, and let me catch up to you and I will be your companion. At that, Faithful looked behind him. Christian cried out again, Wait, wait until I catch up to you. But Faithful answered, No, I travel with my life at stake, and the avenger of blood is close behind me. This reply somewhat moved Christian. He mustered all his strength and quickly caught up with Faithful. In fact, he accidentally ran past him so that the last became first. A smile brightened Christian's face with a sense of self-congratulation. He felt proud because he had gotten ahead of his brother, but he didn't pay attention to his feet. Suddenly he stumbled, fell to the ground, and he couldn't get up, that is, until Faithful came up to help him. Then I saw in my dream that the two of them went along together very lovingly toward one another and enjoyed a delightful conversation about all the things that had happened to them in their pilgrimage. Christian began in this way. My honoured and deeply loved brother Faithful, I am glad I have caught up with you, and that God has so strengthened our spirits that we can walk as companions in this so pleasant a path. Faithful looked over at Christian as they walked. Dear friend, I had thought of enjoying your company even from our town, but you did get quite a start ahead of me. Because of that I was forced to come this far on my own. How long did you stay in the city of destruction before you set out after me on your pilgrimage? Faithful helps Christian. Till I could stay no longer, Faithful admitted. After you left, there was a lot of talk about how our city would be burned to the ground with fire from heaven in a short time. Is that right? Did your neighbors really talk like this? Faithful nodded. Yes, for a while it's what everybody talked about. 
at least for a while. A slight frown creased Christian's brow. Did no one else but you come away from destruction to escape the danger? Faithful shrugged with his hand palm up, and let it fall to his side in resignation. Like I said, there was a lot of talk going on, but I don't think they really believed it. In the heat of the conversation, I heard some of them ridicule you. They even talked about your pilgrimage like they disapproved of it. In fact, they described it as a desperate journey. However, I believed, and still do, that the end of our city will be with fire and brimstone from above, and as a result, I decided to make my escape. Did you hear anyone talk about neighbor pliable? Yes, Christian. I heard that he followed you until he came to the Slough of Despond, where some said he fell in. He wouldn't say anything about it, but I'm sure he was thoroughly covered with the foul dirt of that place. And what did the neighbors say to him? Since he returned, he has been the subject of considerable derision, from all sorts of people. Some mock and despise him, and hardly anyone will give him work. He is seven times worse off now, than if he had never left the city in the first place. The news troubled Christian. But why were they so set against him, especially since they also despise the way he abandoned? Faithful's lips thin to a straight line. They say things like hang him, he's a turncoat, he wasn't true to his profession. I think God has stirred them up to hiss and jeer at him and make a proverb of him because he hath forsaken the way. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, and I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and a horror and a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them, because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I sent to them again and again by my servants the prophets, but you did not listen, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 29 18-19 did you have a chance to talk with him before you left? I saw him once in the streets, Faithful said, but he stayed to the other side of the street, like he was ashamed of what he had done. So I didn't really speak to him. Christian glanced down at the ground. I have to say when I first set out I had hopes for him. He looked back at Faithful with sadness in his eyes. But now I'm afraid he will perish in the overthrow of the city. For it has happened to him just as the proverb says, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire, 2 Peter 2.22. Faithful nodded. I agree. I have the same fears for him. But who can hinder that which will be? Well neighbor faithful, Christian said. Let's talk about something else. About things that concern us more immediately. Tell me now, what have you met with and experienced thus far along the way? because I know you have undergone some things that would be worth recording. Faithful didn't hesitate to answer. I escaped the slough of despond which I understand you fell into, and I reached the gate without suffering that danger. However, I met with a woman whose name was Wanton, who intended to do me harm. Christian said, it's a good thing you escaped her snare. Joseph was tested by her in Egypt, and he escaped her as you did, otherwise it would have cost him his life. Now it happened one day that Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled, and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside. Genesis 39 11-13 But what did she do to you? Faithful and wanton. Unless you experience talking with her yourself, you can't begin to imagine how flattering her words were, Faithful said. So she didn't promise you the things of a moral excellence. Faithful shook his head. No, not at all. She promised things of a carnal and fleshly nature, promising all sorts of sensual pleasure. View, Christian let out a low whistle. Thank God you escaped her, because those despised by the Lord shall fall into her pit. The mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit, he who is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. Proverbs 22:14. True enough, Faithful agreed. But to tell the truth, I'm not sure I entirely escaped her or not. Why do you say that? Christian wanted to know. I trust you did not consent to her solicitation, did you? No, I did not defile myself with her. For I remembered an old writing that I had read which said, Her steps descend down to hell. Her feet go down to death her steps take hold of Shoal. Proverbs 5 5, so I shut my eyes to prevent myself from being bewitched by her seductive looks. I have made a covenant with my eyes, how then could I gaze at a virgin?
dash job 311, then she became angry and railed on me, and I quickly went on my way. Did you meet with any other assaults on your way? Faithful continued to give his account as the two of them walked. He said, when I came to the foot of the hill called Difficulty, I met with a very aged man who asked me who I was and where I was going. I told him I was a pilgrim, going to the celestial city. Then the old man said to me, you look like an honest fellow, would you be content to live with me if I pay you? So I asked his name and about where he lived. He said his name was Adam the First, and that he lived in the town of Deceit. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Ephesians 4.22, I asked him about what type of work, and exactly what wages he offered. He told me that his work offered many delights, and that his wages would make me a full heir in his family. I asked him for further details about his household, and what other servants he had. He explained how his house was maintained with all the luxuries of the world, and that his servants were his own children. I asked how many children he had, and he said that he had but three daughters, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Dash first John 2:16. he went on to say that I could marry them if I wished to do so. Then I asked how long he would expect me to live with him, and he said as long as he lived himself. So what did you decide? Christian asked. Did you finally end up making an agreement between the old man and yourself? Well, at first I felt somewhat inclined to go with the man, because his offer seemed very fair and quite appealing. However, on looking at his forehead as I talked with him, I saw these words written there, put off the old man with his deeds. So how did you end up responding then? A burning hot thought came into my mind. It told me that whatever he said, and however he flattered, that once he lured me to his house he would sell me as a slave. So I insisted that he stop talking to me, for I had no intention to even go near the door of his house. Then he scorned and insulted me. He told me he would send a certain person after me, who would make the way ahead bitter to my soul. So I turned to go away from him, but just as I turned to proceed on my journey, he took hold of my flesh, and jerked me back with such force, that I thought he had pulled a part of me to himself. At this I cried out in pain. O wretched man! Wretched man that I am! Who will set me free from the body of this death? Dash Romans 7:24. So I went on my way up the hill. Now when I had walked halfway up the hill, I looked behind me and saw someone coming after me, moving as swift as the wind. He overtook me at just about the place where the shady resting place is located. That's the place where I sat down to rest, Christian said. But being overcome with sleep, it was there that I lost this scroll out of my chest pocket as I slept. But let me tell you the rest of the story, good brother, Faithful said. Just as soon as the man overtook me, without a word, he knocked me down to the ground, and left me lying there like one dead. But when I revived a little and came to my senses, I asked him why he had treated me this way. He said it was because of my secret fondness for Adam the first. With that, he struck me again with another deadly blow to my chest, and beat me down to the ground. So once again I lay crumpled at his feet as if dead. When I came to myself the second time, I cried to him for mercy but he said, I don't know how to show mercy, and with that he knocked me down to the ground again. It was clear he would have finished me off, if it hadn't been for a man who came by at that time, and demanded that he stop his assault. Who was this man? Faithful said, at first I didn't recognize him, but as he went by, I noticed the holes in his hands and in his side, then I concluded that he was our Lord. So I continued up the hill. That man who overtook you was Moses, Christian explained. He doesn't spare anyone, nor does he know how to show mercy to those who disobey the law. Faithful nodded his agreement. I know well that what you say is true, because this was not the first time we had met. He was the one who came to me when I lived securely at home in the city of destruction. He told me he would burn my house down over my head if I stayed there. Christian thought of his time in the palace at the top of the hill and asked, Didn't you see the house that stood on the top of the hill, on the same side of the way where Moses met you? Yes, Faithful said. And lions too, before I reached it. But as for the lions I think they were asleep, for it was about noon, and they seemed to be asleep. Because I had so much of the day before me, I passed by the porter of that house, 
and came down the other side of the hill. He told me that he saw you go by, Christian said. But I wish you had stopped at the house and stayed a while. They would have showed you so many rare treasures that you would remember until the day you die. But tell me, did you meet anyone in the Valley of Humility? Yes, I did. Faithful's brows knit together at the memory. I met with a certain man by the name of Discontent. He was intent on persuading me to go back with him. For he reasoned that the valley was altogether without honor and to go ahead was the way to displease all my friends, pride, arrogancy, self-conceit, worldly glory, and others whom he knew. He said they would be very much offended if I made such a fool of myself as to wade through this valley. How did you answer him? Christian asked. I told him that although all those he named might claim to be my friends, and rightly so since they were my relatives in the flesh, that since I became a pilgrim they have disowned me. And I have in the same way rejected them. Therefore they are no more to me than if they had never been of my lineage. And as for this valley I told him that he had quite misrepresented it, because humility comes before honor and a haughty spirit before a fall. Therefore I said to him, I would rather go through this valley to obtain honor which the wisest highly value, than to choose what he esteemed to be worthy based on our affections. Did you meet with anyone else other than that in that valley? Yes, I did. I met with a man by the name of Shame, but of all the men I met on my pilgrimage he, I think, bears the wrong name. He would not agree, but after a little debate and other evidence, I'd say this bold-faced Shame would better be called Shameless. Why, what did he say to you? Christian asked. Faithful is disowned by his relatives. What did he say? Let's see. He objected to and railed against religion itself. He said it was a pitiful low sneaking business for a man to value religion. And he said that a tender conscience was an unmanly thing. Faithful let out a heavy sigh. He even went on to say that for a man to be mindful of his words and ways actually curtails his intimidating freedom, and the boastful spirits of the times which the heroes of these times freely display. Such actions, according to him, would make men the object of ridicule. He also objected because according to him, only a few of the mighty rich or wise ever held the same opinion as me. He also ridiculed the thought of being invited to become fools, and to voluntarily hazard the loss of all for who knows what as being something accepted by very few. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Phil. 3 7-9. Plus, he objected to the low standard of living and conditions the pilgrims submitted themselves to, and even sneered at the way in which they lived, and their ignorance and lack of understanding in all natural sciences. He also pressed me on a great deal more issues, besides what I've told you. Things like how it was a shame to sit whining and mourning under a sermon, and that it was a shame to return home sighing, and groaning under the conviction of that sermon. He even said it was a shame to ask from my neighbor forgiveness for petty faults, or to make restitution when I have stolen from anyone. He said religion made a man appear to be strange to those who are great, because it's not normal to become concerned over a few vices, which he called by finer terms. He pointed out how such thinking gives pilgrims a perception that causes them to respect the lowest of society, solely because they belong to the same religious fraternity. He finished by asking me, is this not a shame? Christian asked the same question he'd asked earlier. And what did you say to him? Faithful's brows arched in question. Faye, to tell you the truth, I didn't know what to say at first. He pressed me so hard my face burned with embarrassment. And of course shame brought that up as if I had become ashamed, and almost beaten in defeat. But finally I began to consider the fact that that which is highly esteemed among men, is detestable in the sight of God, Luke 16 15. And as I thought more about it, I realized that this shame was describing what men are, but he had nothing to offer me about what God or the word of God reveals. I also thought about the day of judgment. We won't be doomed to death or life according to the boastful spirits of the world, but according to the wisdom and law of the highest. With this in mind, I focused on the fact that what God says is indeed best. It doesn't matter if all the men in the world are against it. So seeing that God prefers his religion, 
seeing that God prefers a tender conscience, seeing that those who make themselves fools for the kingdom of heaven are wisest, and that the poor man who loves Christ is richer than the greatest man in the world who hates him, I turned to shame and said, Depart, you who are an enemy to my salvation. Should I listen to your words which are contrary to my sovereign Lord? If I did that how would I be able to face him at his coming? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark 8:38. Should I now be ashamed of his ways and servants? If I did that how could I expect his future blessing? But this shame proved to be a bold villain. He was clingy, and I had a hard time shaking him from my company. He haunted me like a shadow and continually whispered in my ear countless other weaknesses he attributed to religion. I finally told him that it was useless to continue in this manner, because the very things he despised were those things that I see the most glory in. So finally, I got past this persistent one, and when I had finally shaken him off, I began to sing. The Trials That Those Men Do Meet With Who Are Obedient to the Heavenly Call Are Many and Various and suited to the flesh, and come and come and come again afresh. That now or some time else we by them may be taken, overcome, and cast away. O oh, let the pilgrims, let the pilgrims then be vigilant and quit themselves like men. Christian clapped faithful on the back and said, I am glad, my brother, that you so bravely withstood this villain, for I agree with you that of all the people you met he has the wrong name. How bold he is to follow us in the streets, and attempt to put us to shame before all the world in order to make us ashamed, and embarrassed concerning that which is good. But if he was not so daring, he would never attempt to be this bold. But let us continue to resist him, for aside from all of his bold boasting, he promotes himself as a fool and nothing else. Remember that Solomon said, The wise will inherit honour, but fools display dishonour. Proverbs 3.35. Faithful agreed and said, I think we must cry to him for help against shame, so we might be valiant for truth upon the earth. I agree. What you say is true, Christian said. Besides those you've already mentioned, did you happen to meet anybody else in that valley? Faithful shook his head. No, I didn't. In fact, I enjoyed sunshine all the rest of the way through that first valley, as well as through the valley of the shadow of death and it was far better for you compared to what I experienced. For it was much worse for me. Almost immediately upon entering the Valley of Humiliation, I endured a dreadful battle with that foul fiend Apollyon. Faithful looked at Christian with wide eyes. Christian nodded. Yes, I thought he would surely have killed me, especially when he struck me down and attempted to crush me under his weight. He seemed intent on crushing me to pieces. When he threw me down, my sword flew out of my hand and he said, Now I will surely destroy you. But I cried out to God and he heard me and delivered me from all my troubles. Then I entered into the valley of the shadow of death, and from that point I had no light for almost half the way through that terrible place. Again and again, I thought I would be killed, but finally morning broke with the rising of the sun. With the light of day, I went through that place with far more ease and quiet. I saw in my dream that as they went on faithful happened to look to one side of the way, and saw a man whose name was Talkative. He walked for a distance beside them, because in this place there was enough room for them all to walk side by side. He was a tall man and more handsome at a distance than when close at hand. To this man faithful addressed himself in this manner as they drew near. Friend, which way are you going? Are you going to the heavenly country? Talkative said, Yes I am headed to that very same place. That's good, Faithful said. I do hope you will join us. By all means. I have every intention of being your travelling companion. Faithful motioned for him to join them. Come on with us then and let's spend our time talking about things that are profitable. Certainly, certainly, Talkative stepped in line with them. To talk about things that are good is most enjoyable with you or anyone else. I am glad I have met someone inclined to such discussions. To tell you the truth, there are few who care to spend their travelling time in this way. Instead, they rather discuss things that are quite unprofitable. In fact, this is something that has often troubled me. Indeed, Faithful agreed. That is something to be disturbed about, 
for the things worthy of conversation are the things of the God of heaven. I certainly admire your attitude, talkative said. For you speak with conviction, and I might add, what else is so pleasant and so profitable as to talk about the things of God? For instance, if a man delights in such wonderful things as that, what could be more pleasurable to talk about than the history or mystery of such things? Or if a man loves to talk about miracles, wonders or signs, where else will he find such things so delightfully recorded, and so sweetly penned as in the Holy Scripture? That is true, faithful admitted, but the real purpose of such discussion is that we should be benefited by such things in our talk. That should be our intended focus. That's exactly what I said, talkative went on because talking of such things is most profitable, since by so doing a man may gain knowledge about many things. For instance, generally speaking, he may gain knowledge about the futility of earthly things, and the benefit of things above. More specifically, he may learn the necessity of the new birth, the insufficiency of our works, the need of Christ's righteousness etc. Besides, by such talk of religion, a man may learn what it means to repent, to believe to pray to suffer, or the like. Plus by such profitable discussion, a man may learn about the great promises and consolations of the gospel, and with such knowledge find personal comfort. Along with this, a man may learn to refute false opinions, to vindicate the truth, and also to instruct the ignorant. Faithful said, This is true, and I am glad to hear these things from you. Unfortunately, talkative broke in, the lack of this perspective is the reason so few understand the need of faith, and the necessity of a work of grace in their soul in order to obtain eternal life. As a result they ignorantly live according to the works of the law, by which no man can enter the kingdom of heaven. Faithful quickly jumped in as talkative took a breath. But do allow me to say that heavenly knowledge of these truths is the gift of God. None can attain these things by human effort, let alone just talking about them. I know all this very well, talkative said with a dismissive wave of his hand. For a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven, all is of grace, not of works. I could quote a hundred scriptures that confirm this. Well then, faithful looked talkative in the eye. What one good topic shall we discuss at this time? Whatever you like. I'm willing to talk about heavenly things or earthly things, moral things or evangelical things, sacred things or secular things, past things or future things, foreign things or domestic things, essential things or incidental things, provided that the discussion is for our profit. Faithful was becoming impressed with his new traveling companion, and stepped closer to Christian, who had been walking by himself all this time. Faithful leaned closer to Christian and said, What a brave companion we have here. Surely this man will make a very excellent pilgrim. A slight smile played across Christian's lips. This man with whom you are so taken, will captivate a multitude with his words provided they are not familiar with him. You mean to say you know him then? Know him? Christian asked. Yes, and better than he knows himself. Seriously? Then tell me who he is. His name is Talkative. He lives in the town we come from. I know destruction is large, but I'm surprised you don't know who he is. Faithful scratched his head. Whose son is he? And exactly where does he live? He is the son of one Saywell, Christian said. He lived in Prating Row, and all who know him call him by the name of Talkative of Prating Row. In spite of his eloquent manner of speaking, he remains a wretched fellow. Well, he seems to be a rather attractive man. Yes, Christian agreed. That's how he appears to people who are not well acquainted with him. He looks best from a distance, but close up is really quite ugly. Your saying that he is an attractive man brings to my mind what I have observed in the work of a painter, whose pictures look best at a distance, but up close they are not so good looking. Are you joking? Faithful asked. Since you smiled I'm thinking maybe you're just joking. Prating Row. Sorry you mistook my smile because God forbid if I should make this a laughing matter, or that I should accuse this man falsely. I'm going to tell you more about him so that you understand why I say what I say. This man will accept any company as long as he is allowed to talk. Though he will now talk with you, in the same way he will enjoy a conversation in a tavern. And the more he drinks the more things he has to talk about. Religion has no place in his heart, or house, or conversation. All that he stands for depends on his mouth. His religion is to make a noise with it. I can't believe it. 
that means I have been greatly deceived by this man. Deceived? Ha! Huh? You may be sure of it. Remember the proverb, they say to do but do not do. Therefore all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. Matt. 23.3 But the kingdom of God does not consist in words but in power, 1 Corinthians 4.20. He talks about prayer of repentance of faith, and of the new birth, but he only knows how to talk about them. I have visited his family and have observed him both at home and abroad, and I know what I say is the truth. His house is as empty of religion, as the white of an egg is devoid of flavor. There is no prayer offered in his house, nor any sign of repentance for sin. Yes, even an animal serves God far better than talkative. To all who know him, he is the very stain reproach and shame of religion. Do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors, while evil is in their hearts. Psalm 28 3 Because of his reputation, the neighborhood in which he lives hardly has a good word to say about him. The common people who really know him say, a saint abroad and a devil at home. His poor family would agree with me. He is an impolite and mean-spirited person, and such a bitter complainer and unreasonable man with his servants. They are at a loss as to how to speak to him or fulfill their duties. Men who have any dealings with him say, it is better to deal with a barbarian trader than with him, for fairer dealings they shall have at their hands. This talkative, if possible, will go behind their backs to defraud entice and outsmart them. Besides, he brings up his sons to follow in his steps. If he finds what he calls a foolish timidity in any of them, this is what he calls the first signs of a tender conscience, he calls them fools and stupid blockheads. For this reason, he will rarely employ them or even recommend them to others. In my opinion, his wicked lifestyle causes many to stumble and fall, and will be the ruin of many more, unless God intervenes. Well my brother, faithful answered. From what you say I am compelled to believe you. Not only because you have personally known him, but because you offered your report with a Christian attitude. I can't imagine that you've told me these things out of ill will, but rather I see your motive is your love for the truth. If I didn't know him any more than you, I might have thought of him the same way you did at first. If I had received such information from the hands of those who are enemies to religion, I would have thought it to be slanderous. Unfortunately, the names and reputations of good men often suffer, and are defamed by such messages as his. This isn't just my opinion. I can prove him guilty of all these things and many more that are just as bad. Besides, good men are ashamed of him. They can neither call him brother nor friend, and for those who know him, the mere mention of his name makes them blush. Well, Faithful said, I see that saying and doing are two things. From now on, I shall more carefully observe this difference. Talkative at home. They certainly are two separate things, and are as different as the soul and the body. Think of it like this. The body without the soul is nothing but a dead carcass, so just saying these things without doing them is in the same way dead. The soul of true religion is the practical part. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world, James 1.27. Talkative isn't aware of this. He thinks that hearing and saying alone makes a person a good Christian. As a result, he deceives his own soul. Hearing is like the sowing of the seed. Talking alone isn't sufficient to prove that fruit is actually in the heart and life. And let's be perfectly clear. On judgment day men shall be judged according to their fruit. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth, some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Matt. 13.23 At that time the question won't be, did you believe? But instead will be, were you doers or talkers only? It is by this that they will be judged. The end of the world is compared to our harvest, allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matt. 13.30 And you know how it is at harvest. Men notice nothing but fruit and anything that is not of faith cannot be accepted. I'm saying this to help you see how insignificant the profession of talkative will be at that day. Faithful pondered Christian's words and said, This brings to my mind what Moses described about the beast that is clean. Nevertheless, 
you are not to eat of these among those which chew the cud, or among those that divide the hoof in two, the camel and the rabbit and the chauffon, for though they chew the cud, they do not divide the hoof, they are unclean for you. The pig, because it divides the hoof but does not chew the cud, it is unclean for you. You shall not eat any of their flesh nor touch their carcasses. These you may eat of all that are in water, anything that has fins and scales you may eat, but anything that does not have fins and scales you shall not eat, it is unclean for you. Deuteronomy 14 7-10 Talkative is such a one who chews the cud, he seeks knowledge. He chews upon the word, but he divides not the hoof. He does not separate himself from a sinful lifestyle, but like the hare he retains the foot of the dog or bear, and therefore remains unclean. For all I know, Christian said, you have spoken the true sense of the gospel from these texts. And I will add another thing, which Paul says. He calls some men sounding brass, and a tinkling cymbal, and this includes those who are great talkers. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Dash 1 Corinthians 13 1. He explains this further in another place where he describes them as things without life giving sound. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, are producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? Dash 1 Corinthians 14 7. He's talking about things without life, that is, without the true faith and grace of the gospel. Consequently, pilgrims who base what they say on such things, shall never be placed in the kingdom of heaven, among those who are the children of life. For the children of life remain true in what they say, as if it were the tongue or voice of an angel. Faithful scratched the crown of his head. Well, now I am sick of his company. What shall we do to be rid of him? Just take my advice, Christian said. Do as I tell you, and you shall find he will quickly become sick of your company too. That is unless God touches his heart and converts it. What would you have me to do? Christian gestured in Talkative's direction just a little ways before them. Go to him and enter into some serious discussion about the power of true religion. Once he is agreeable to this topic, ask him directly whether this thing is set up in his heart, house, or daily behavior. Then Faithful stepped forward again, and fell in line with Talkative. Hello, how are you? Talkative smiled. Thank you for asking. I'm well. Though I did think we should have been able to talk a great deal by this time. Well, Faithful said, if you're willing, we can have some profitable discussion now. And since you left it up to me to come up with the topic, let it be this. How does the saving grace of God display itself when it lives in the heart of man? Talkative said, I notice that our talk must be about the power of things. Well, this is a very good question and I shall be more than willing to answer you. So accept my brief answer as follows. First, when the grace of God dwells in the heart, it causes a great outcry against sin. Secondly, no, hold on. Faithful stopped him. Let's consider each item one at a time. To make it clear, I think you should have said that it shows itself by persuading the soul to abhor its sin. A slight frown wrinkled Talkative's brow. Why? What difference is there between crying out against and abhorring sin? Oh, a great deal, Faithful said. A man may cry out against sin in principle, but he cannot abhor it except by virtue of a godly aversion against it. I have heard many cry out against sin in the pulpit, but who still live with it without any problem in their heart, house, and everyday life. Joseph's mistress cried out with a loud voice, as if she had been godly and virtuous, but in reality she would have willingly committed adultery with him. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled, and went outside. Genesis 39 15 Some cry out against sin, even as the mother cries out against her child, when she scolds it as rude and naughty, but then quickly changes to hugging and kissing the same child. Hmm, Talkative's eyes narrowed. I see you're trying to be clever and catch me. Not at all, Faithful said. I'm only trying to set things right. So what is the second thing you were going to mention as proof of a work of grace in the heart? Great knowledge of gospel mysteries. Faithful said, this evidence should have been first, but first or last, it is also false. For knowledge, great knowledge, may be obtained in the mysteries of the gospel, without any work of grace in the soul. You see, even if a man has all knowledge, he may still be nothing, and so consequently, not be a child of God. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, 
so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Dash 1 Corinthians 13 2, when Christ said, Do you know all these things? And the disciples answered, Yes, he added, Blessed are you if you do them. He doesn't lay the blessing in the knowing of them, but in the doing of them. You see there is a knowledge that is not accompanied with doing. Such a person is he who knows his master's will and doesn't do it. A man may have knowledge like an angel and yet not be Christian. So your sign of knowledge as evidence is not valid. Indeed, to know is a thing that pleases talkers and boasters, but to do is what pleases God. Not that the heart can be good without knowledge. However, there are two sorts of knowledge, knowledge based on the bare speculation of things, and knowledge which is accompanied with the grace of faith and love, which compels a man to do the will of God from the heart. The first serves the talker, but without the other, the true Christian is not content. Give me understanding, that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart, Psalm 119.34. You are trying to trip me up again. This discussion is not for edification. Well then, Faithful said, offer another example of clear evidence of this work of grace in the heart. Talkative shook his head. No, not this time. I will not give you another example because I can see we won't agree. Faithful asked, well if you won't, are you willing for me to do it? Fine, feel free. Faithful nodded his thanks and said, a true work of grace at work in the heart is evident to the person himself as well as to the people around him. To the one who has it, it brings conviction of sin, especially the defilement of his new nature, and the sin of unbelief for which he would be damned if it weren't for the mercy at God's hand by faith in Jesus Christ. This perspective and sense of these things work in him a sorrow and shame for sin. For I confess my iniquity, I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Psalm 38 18 plus, he finds the Saviour of the world revealed in him, along with the absolute necessity of living for, and with him to the end of life. Through this he discovers a hunger and thirst for him who has made the promise. Now according to the strength or weakness of his faith in his Saviour, so is the joy and peace he experiences. And so is his love of holiness, his desire to know him more, and also to serve him in this world. But though it reveals itself in this way, yet because of a person's own corruption and abused reason, they misjudge this matter, for they are unable to understand this work of grace. For this reason, the one who has this work going on in their heart, is required to use very sound judgment before he can firmly conclude that this is a work of grace. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, nevertheless knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Galatians 2 15-16 For others, this work of grace is externally evidenced by a confession of faith in Christ, which comes from a genuine experience. And secondly, it is evidenced by a life that is in agreement with such a confession. Now if you have any objections to this brief description of the work of grace and its evidence in true religion, then let me hear them right now. But if you don't, then let me propose another question. Talkative said, now is not the time for me to object but instead it is the time for me to hear what you have to say, so go ahead and pose your second question. All right, this is it, Faithful said. Have you experienced this and does your life and conversation match up with what you say? Or do you place your faith in words, or the things you talk about, but not in the truth, and without a care for how you act? If you are so inclined, please answer me on this, but only say what you know the God above will say is true along with what your conscience can justify. For it isn't the one who commends himself that is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Besides, to say you are one thing, when by your conversation and lifestyle all your neighbors tell you that you lie, this is a great wickedness. Talkative blushed but he recovered and said, you now focus on experience conscience and God. I didn't really expect this kind of discussion, and I am not inclined to give an answer to such questions, because I am not accountable to you, unless you've taken it upon yourself to be my examiner. However, even if you decided to do that, I would refuse to make you my judge. I do wonder why you decided to ask me such questions. Well, Faithful said, because I noticed your eagerness to talk and talk, but then understood you had no basis for your words. It was nothing but speculation on your part. Besides, to tell you all the truth, I have heard that you have a reputation as a man whose religion is based solely on talk, 
and that the way you live makes what you profess nothing but a lie. They say you are a spot or stain among Christians and that religion suffers because of your ungodly conversation and lifestyle. Some have already stumbled because of your wicked ways, and more are in danger of having their faith shipwrecked because of the way you practice your religion. For your religion involves meeting at a tavern and promotes qualities such as covetousness, uncleanness, swearing, lying, making friends with worldly people and more. The proverb that describes a harlot is also true about you, that she is a shame to all women. In the same way, you are a shame to all genuine Christians. Talkative's lips turn down at the corners into a slight frown. Since you seem quick to listen to what others have to say about me and to judge so rashly, I can't do anything but come to the conclusion that you are an irritable or depressed person who is not fit to carry on such a conversation. So with that I say farewell. Christian came up to Faithful and said, I told you how this would end. Your words and his lusts could not agree. He preferred to walk away from your company than to reform his life. But he is gone, so let him go. The loss is his. And he has saved us the trouble of breaking away from him, for if he had continued to walk with us, he would have been nothing but a blot on our reputation. Besides, the apostle says, separate yourself from such people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. 2 Corinthians 6 17, Faithful nodded his understanding. I'm still glad we had this opportunity to have this short discussion with him. Perhaps he will think about it again. But even if he doesn't, I have spoken clearly with him about these matters, so if he perishes without the truth, I am innocent of his blood. Christian agreed. You did well to speak so frankly with him. Very little of this faithful dealing with men happens these days. When it does, it often makes true religion a stench to many who are nothing more than talkative fools. That's because their religion is only in word, and their conversation is morally corrupt and proud. And with so many of this type being admitted into the fellowship of the godly, they confuse the world, blemish Christianity, and grieve the sincere. I wish all men would deal with such impostors as directly as you have done. Then perhaps they would be made more agreeable to the truth. Either that or the fellowship of true Christians would prove to be too hot for them. Faithful said, how talkative showed off all he knew at first. How bravely he spoke. How he presumed to drive down all before him. But as soon as I talked about the work of grace within the heart, like the moon that's waning, so he too diminished and faded. And it will be the same for everyone, unless they know the work of grace in their heart. Thus the two of them walked along talking about what they had seen along the way. It made the way easy, which would have otherwise proven to be tedious to them, for they were now making their way through a wilderness. 9 Original, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Romans 2 24-25 The Sixth Stage now when they almost passed through this wilderness, Faithful happened to look behind at the way they had come, and spotted someone coming after them. He recognized the man but asked Christian to be sure his eyes weren't playing tricks. Who is that coming after us? Christian looked and said, It is my good friend Evangelist. Yes and my good friend too, said Faithful. For it was he who directed me to the way that leads to the gate. With that Evangelist walked up and joined them. He said, Peace be with you dearly beloved, and may there be peace to those who have helped you. Christian clapped his friend on the back. Welcome welcome my good evangelist. Just seeing you again reminds me of all your earlier kindnesses and tireless efforts for my eternal good. Yes? A thousand times welcome, Faithful said. Oh sweet evangelist, how desirable is your fellowship to us poor pilgrims. Evangelist offered them a broad smile. How have you fared my friends? since the last time I saw you. What have you encountered, and how have you behaved yourselves? Christian and Faithful told him about all the things that had happened to them along the way, including the many difficulties they had endured up to this point in their travels. How glad am I to hear it, Evangelist said. Not glad that you have met with trials, but that you have proven yourselves to be victors over them. And for this reason despite your many weaknesses, you have been enabled to continue in the way to this very day. I can't tell you enough about how well pleased I am about this, for my own sake and yours. 
I have sown and you have reaped. The day is coming, when he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together, John 4 36, that is, if you hold out to the end. For in due time you shall reap, if you do not grow weary. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Galatians 6 9, the crown of reward is before you and it is an incorruptible one, so run in a way that you may obtain it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Dash 1 Corinthians 9 24-27 Some people have set out for this crown, but after they have gone a great distance another comes in, and takes it from them. Therefore, hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Revelation 3 11. You are not yet out of the gunshot range of the devil, for you have not yet resisted to the point of blood as you strive against sin. Let the kingdom always be before you, and without wavering believe regarding the things that are invisible. Let nothing in this world come between you and the crown. Above all, pay attention to your own hearts with their lusts, for they are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Set your faces with flint-like resolve since you have all power in heaven and earth on your side. Christian thanked him for his counsel and encouragement, but added that he and Faithful desired him to speak to them more, for they hoped for something helpful to take them the rest of the way. For they knew very well that he was a prophet, and that he could tell them about things that might happen to them as well as how they might resist and overcome them. So Evangelist agreed and said, My sons, you have heard in the word of the truth of the gospel that you must go through many tribulations to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, that in every city, bonds and afflictions await you. For this reason, you can't expect to travel far on your pilgrimage without encountering them in one way or another. You have already experienced a measure of this truth, and more will immediately follow. For now, as you see, you are almost out of this wilderness. You will soon arrive at a town that you will see directly in front of you. In that town, you will be severely assaulted by enemies, who will make every attempt to kill you. You may be sure that one or both of you will seal the testimony you hold with blood. In spite of this, be faithful unto death, and the king will give you a crown of life. Whoever dies there, although his death will be unnatural and his pain great, yet he will have an advantage over his companion. First of all, he will arrive at the celestial city sooner, but secondly, he will also escape many miseries that the other will meet with during the rest of his journey. But when you arrive at this town and all that I have related to you comes to pass, then remember your friend and behave like men, and entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right, 1 Peter 4:19. Then I saw in my dream that when Christian and Faithful got out of the wilderness, they immediately saw a town before them, and the name of that town was Vanity. In that town is promoted a fair called Vanity Fair. It is held all year long, and is called Vanity Fair because of the name of the town. For the town is brighter than vanity, men of low degree are only vanity and men of rank are a lie, in the balances they go up, they are together lighter than breath. Psalm 62 9, and also because all that is sold there and all who come there are worthless. As the saying of the wise says, all this world promotes is vanity. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all, and let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. Ecclesiastes 11.8. This fair is not a newly erected business, but is actually an ancient enterprise. Let me tell you about its origins. Almost five thousand years ago, there were pilgrims walking to the celestial city, just like Faithful and Christian are doing. So Beelzebub, Apollyon and Legion with their associates, perceived by seeing the path made by the pilgrims on their way to the city, that the course lay through this town of vanity. They planned to set up a fair here, a fair at which all sorts of vanity could be sold amid festivities open and ongoing the whole year. Therefore, at this fair they sell such merchandise as houses, land trades, places, honors, promotions, titles, countries, kingdoms, lusts and pleasures of all sorts, including things such as holots, wives, husbands, children, masters, servants, lives, blood, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones, and much more. 
and along with all this, at this fair there is constant, round-the-clock entertainment like juggling cheats games, plays clowns, mimics tricksters and rogues, and other amusements of every kind. Here visitors can also find free offers that include thefts, murders, adulteries, perjuries, and all of them are available in various shades of a blood-red color. Vanity Fair as in other fairs of less importance, there are several lanes and streets with representative names, where certain categories of merchandise are marketed. In the same way, at this fair you have the proper places, lanes and streets, which bear names of countries and kingdoms. It is in these places that the goods of this fair are easily found. There is the Britain row, the French row, the Italian row, the Spanish row, the German row, all of which offer a variety of vanities for sale. But just like other fairs, where one commodity dominates the market, here too the most sought after of all the fair is the merchandise of Rome, for it is greatly promoted. Some like our English nation and others have taken a dislike for this huckstering. Now as I said, the way to the celestial city lies through this town, with its lusty fair which is held year-round. Those who think they are going to avoid this city, will still have to go out of the world. The Prince of Princes himself, when he was here, passed through this town on his way to his own country, during a time when the fair was in full operation. I believe it was Beelzebub, the chief lord of this fair, who invited him to buy some of his vanities. Yes, he would have made him lord of this fair, if only he would have shown him reverence, and bowed to him as he went through the town. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Dash first Peter 4:12 plus because he was such a person of honor, Beelzebub escorted him from street to street, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a brief amount of time, so that he might if possible, lure that blessed one to lower himself, and by some of his vanities. But he paid no attention to the merchandise, and therefore left the town without spending so much as one cent upon these vanities. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Matt. 4 8-9, so this fair is of ancient origins, and is a long-standing, and very large fair. When the pilgrims arrived, they were clothed with garments different from any available at that fair. When the people saw them, they stared at them and talked about what manner of people they might be. Some said they were fools, for we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong, you are distinguished, but we are without honor. Dash 1 Corinthians 4 9-10, others said they were lunatics, and some said that they were strange and unusual. Secondly, the great crowd wondered at their clothing, and in the same way they were curious about their speech, for few could understand what they said. They naturally spoke the language of those who have sworn allegiance to the Lord Almighty, but those who ran the fair were men of this world. So from one end of the fair to the other, the people seemed barbarians to each other. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Dash 1 Corinthians 2 7-8. Thirdly and this astonished the merchants, was how these pilgrims placed such little value on all the wares being sold. They didn't even care to browse, and if vendors called out to them to buy their wares, they put their fingers in their ears and cried, Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity, Psalm 11937, and they looked upward, signifying that their trade and commerce was in heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he is even to subject all things to himself. Phil. 320-21. One mocking merchant observed the strange behavior of faithful and Christian and said to them, What will he buy? The pilgrims looked at him with serious expressions and said, We buy the truth. Buy truth and do not sell it, get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Proverbs 23-23 with this answer, the merchant and others took the opportunity to deride the men even more, some mocked some taunted, some spoke with reproach, and some called for others to strike them. It turned into a noticeable commotion and grew into a great disturbance, to the point that everywhere you looked the fair was in disorder. As a result, word quickly reached the governor of the fair. He came down right away, 
and appointed deputies from some of his most trusted friends. He put these in charge of investigating what happened, and to examine the pilgrims about why they had nearly overturned the fair. So faithful and Christian were taken for further investigation. Those who presided over the proceedings asked them where they came from and where they were going, and why they were wearing such unusual clothing. Faithful and Christian told them they were pilgrims and strangers in the world, and that they were going to their own country, which was called the Heavenly Jerusalem, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11 14, 16, and that they had done nothing to cause the men of the town, or the merchants to mistreat them, or to delay their journey. The only exception they could think of was when the merchant had asked them what they would buy, and they had responded that they would buy the truth. But those who were appointed to investigate the uproar did not believe them. They thought the two pilgrims were nothing more than madmen and lunatics, who came for the purpose of throwing the fair into confusion. Therefore they took them and beat them, smeared them with dirt, and then put them into a cage as a spectacle in front of all the men of the fair. There the two pilgrims lay caged for some time as objects of sport, malice, or revenge from the men of that place. All the while the governor of the fair laughed at all that happened to them. But the pilgrims remained patient, and did not return abuse for abuse. Instead, they offered a blessing while speaking good words for bad, and showed kindness in the face of brutal treatment. Some men in the fair noticed their example. These men were more observant and less prejudiced than the rest. They began to restrain and accuse the disreputable men for their continual mistreatment of the captives. This made the disreputable sorts all the more angry, and they flew into a rage at those trying to hold them back. They counted them as bad as the caged pilgrims, and accused them as accomplices worthy of the same mistreatment. In response, the others replied that as far as they could see, the caged men were quiet, sober, and harmless. They went on to say that many others who attended their fair were more worthy of being put into the cage and ridiculed than the men whom they had mistreated in this way. A variety of opinions were exchanged from both sides, while Christian and faithful behaved themselves, acting very wisely and soberly the whole time. But the words exchanged turned to blows between the opposing groups, and they did harm to one another. Faithful and Christian were once again dragged before their examiners, and charged as guilty for causing the disturbance in the fair. As their punishment they were beaten unmercifully, hung in irons, and led in chains up and down the lanes of the fair as an example and warning to others who might think to speak on behalf of the pilgrims, or to associate with them. Even in all this Christian and faithful behaved with increasing wisdom, and with much meekness and patience amid the humiliation and shame heaped upon them. With such behavior they won several of the men in the fair to their side, though the number was few in comparison to the rest. This generated even more rage in the aggressive opponents, to the point that they sought the death of the two captives. Christian and faithful are brought to trial. With this they announced, this cage and the irons are not a sufficient penalty for what these men have done. They should die for the damage they have caused, and for deceiving the men of the fair. Then Christian and faithful were imprisoned in the cage again, until the process of the law decided what should be done with them so they locked their feet fast in the stocks inside the cage. With their feet locked in the stocks, they recalled what their faithful friend Evangelist had told them. It helped them accept their current circumstances, and to be assured that the sufferings and trials they were experiencing were exactly what he told them would happen to them. With this in mind, they now comforted each other in that whoever would suffer death, he would have the advantage. In his heart, each man secretly wished that he might be the one, but they committed themselves to the all-wise and sovereign purposes of the Almighty, and with much contentment they rested in the condition in which they found themselves, while waiting to see how they would be disposed of. When a convenient time was determined, the prisoners were brought forth for their trial, in order that they could be found guilty and condemned. They were brought before their enemies and were formally accused. The judge's name was Lord Hate Good. Their indictment was essentially the same accusation, but it had been changed slightly in content. It read, that they Christian and faithful, were enemies to, and disturbers of, the trading of the fair, and that they had caused commotions and divisions in the town, and had in the process, gained supporters for their most dangerous opinions, in contempt of the law of their prince. Then faithful answered that he had only spoken against that which had asserted itself against him, who is higher than the highest. He went on to say, 
as for causing a disturbance, I made no such thing, for I am a man of peace. As for the supporters who were one to us, they were persuaded when they recognized our innocence, and that we spoke the truth. As a result, they turned from what was worse to what is better. And as to the prince you talk about, since he is Beelzebub, the enemy of our Lord, I defy him and all his angels. Then it was proclaimed that anyone who had anything to say in support for their Lord, the king against the prisoner at the bar, should immediately appear to testify and bring forth their evidence. So three witnesses came forward, envy superstition and pick thank. These three were then asked if they knew the prisoner at the bar, and what they had to say in support of their lord the king and what had been done against him. Envy stepped forward first to give his testimony. He said, My lord, I have known this prisoner a long time and verify upon my oath before this honourable bench, that he is, hold on a moment, the judge said. First administer the oath to him. Lord hate good. So they swore him in to tell the truth, and he continued his testimony. My lord this man, in spite of his credible name, is one of the vilest men in our country. He shows no regard for the prince, nor his people, laws or customs. Instead, he does all he can to persuade all men with his disloyal notions, which he tends to call principles of faith and holiness. And in particular, I heard him say once myself that Christianity and the customs of our town of vanity were diametrically opposed to each other, and could not be reconciled. By this statement, my lord, he not only condemns all our praiseworthy deeds, but also condemns us for doing them. Then the judge asked, Do you have any more to say? My lord, Envy answered. I could say much more, but I don't want to weary the court with every detail. However, if necessary, when the other gentlemen have given their evidence, to avoid any lack of evidence that would allow the prisoner to go free, I will expound on my testimony against him at that time. So Envy was told to stand by in case further testimony was needed. Then they called Superstition to the stand, and told him to look at the prisoner. They also asked, What can you say for your lord the king against the prisoner? Then they swore him in, and he began to give his testimony. My lord, I'm not friends with this man, nor do I have any desire to know him better. However, I do know that he is a very lethal person from a discussion I had with him the other day in town. During our conversation, he distinctly said our religion was worthless, and that it in no way could be a means to please God. My Lord, you know very well what follows from such sayings, namely, that we are presently worshipping in vain, and as a result our sins remain, and finally in the end we shall be damned. So that's what I have to say. Then Pickthank was sworn in, and he began to tell what he knew on behalf of their Lord the King against the prisoner at the bar. My Lord and all of you gentlemen, I have known this fellow a long time, and have heard him say things that should not be spoken. For he has denounced our noble Prince Beelzebub, and has spoken shamefully of his honourable friends, whose names are the Lord Old Man, the Lord Connell Delight, the Lord Luxurious, the Lord Desire of Vainglory, my old Lord Lechery, so having greedy, along with all the rest of our nobility. And the prisoner has also said that if all men thought as he did, that not one of these noblemen would reside in this town any longer. And besides this, he hasn't been afraid to revile even you my lord, who are now appointed to be his judge. He has called you an ungodly villain, and along with this he has used many other similar and slanderous names to smear the good names of most of the nobility of our town. When Pickthank had finished giving his account of the evidence against Faithful, the judge turned his attention to the prisoner at the bar, and talked to him directly. You deserter of the truth. You heretic and traitor. Have you heard what these honest gentlemen have testified against you? Faithful asked, May I speak a few words in my own defence? You contemptible good-for-nothing vagrant. You don't deserve to live a moment longer. Instead you should be put to death immediately, right here, right now. Yet, so that all men may see our gentleness toward you, let us hear what you have to say. Faithful tipped his head and said, First let me address what Mr. Envy has said. I want to clarify that I never said anything except that what rules, laws, customs or people are against the word of God, these are diametrically opposed to Christianity. If I have said anything in this regard that is incorrect, please point out my error and convince me otherwise. For I stand before you ready to recant my foolishness if you can do so. A second, I'd like to address the charge that Mr. Superstition has made against me. 
I can only say this, that for true worship of God there is a divine faith required, but there can be no divine faith without a divine revelation of the will of God. Therefore, anything added into the worship of God that is not in agreement with divine revelation, is nothing but human faith, a faith that will not result in eternal life. Faithful speaks in his own defense. And concerning what Mr. Pickthank has said, while avoiding those abusive terms I have been accused of using, I must still say that the prince of this town, with all the riotous crowd of low people and his attendants, which were named by Mr. Pickthank, are more fit for being in hell than in this town and country. And so the Lord have mercy upon me. Then the judge addressed the jury, who had been nearby and listening and observing all that was said and done. Gentlemen of the jury, the judge said. You see before us this man who has been at the center of a great uproar in this town. You have also heard what these worthy gentlemen have testified against him. In the same way, you have also heard his reply and confession. Now it rests in your heartfelt decision whether he should live or die. Before you decide, I think it is right that I should instruct you in our law. In the days of Pharaoh the Great, a servant to our prince, there was an act instituted that addressed the danger posed by false religion and those who would cause it to multiply and grow throughout the country. It decreed that their males should be thrown into the river. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Exodus 1.22 A second decree enacted during the days of Nebuchadnezzar the Great, another of our prince's servants, declared that whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire down. 3-6 and yet another decree in the days of Darius established a period of time, during which any who called upon any god but him, should be cast into the lion's den. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute, and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man, besides you O king for thirty days, shall be cast into the lion's den. Dan. 6-7. The judge waggled his finger in Faithful's direction and said, Now, this rebel has broken the substance of these laws, not only in thought, which is not an indictable offence, but also in word and deed which must not be tolerated. Concerning the law of Pharaoh, it was made known by public decree to prevent trouble before it actually happened. But in this case, he nodded toward Faithful, a crime is apparent. With regard to the second and third precedents, you will notice how the prisoner argues against our religion in much the same way. For this treason which he has already confessed, he deserves to die as a criminal. Then the jury, whose names were Mr. Blind Man, Mr. No Good, Mr. Malice, Mr. Lovelust, Mr. Live Loose, Mr. Heady, Mr. High Mind, Mr. Enmity, Mr. Liar, Mr. Cruelty, Mr. Hate Light, and Mr. Implacable went out to deliberate and consider a verdict. Each individual offered their private verdict against the prisoner, and they unanimously concluded that he was guilty. First, the foreman of the jury, Mr. Blind Man, said, I see clearly that this man is a heretic. Then Mr. No Good added, Away with such a fellow from the face of the earth. Yes, Mr. Malice agreed. For I hate the very looks of him. Mr. Lovelust jutted his chin forward and declared, I could never tolerate him. Nor I, said Mr. Live Loose for he will always be condemning my lifestyle. Hang him, hang him! Mr. Heady shouted out. A sorry hooligan, said Mr. High Mind. Mr. Enmity nodded his agreement. My heart boils with anger against him. He is a rogue, said Mr. Liar. Hanging is too good for him, Mr. Cruelty added. Let's dispose of him immediately, Mr. Hate Light suggested. Then Mr. Implacable said, if I were to be given the whole world still I could not be reconciled to him. Therefore I say we deliver our verdict and find him guilty and deserving of death. And so they did. Faithful was condemned to be returned to his prison cell, and there to be put to death by the cruelest method they could think of. So they led him away, to do with him according to their law. First they scourged him, then they beat him, then they lanced his flesh with knives. After that, they stoned him with stones, then pricked him with their swords, and last of all they burned him to ashes at the stake. And so Faithful came to his earthly end. Now I noticed a chariot and a couple of horses waiting for Faithful beyond the crowd. As soon as his adversaries executed him, he was taken up into the chariot, and carried directly up through the clouds with the sound of a trumpet, taking the most direct route to the celestial gate. 
but as for Christian, he found relief during this agonizing situation, when he was sent back to prison. He remained for a time, but he who overrules all things, having the power of their rage in his own hand, worked things out in such a way that Christian after that time, was set free and allowed to continue on his way. As he went he said, Well faithful, you have faithfully professed unto your Lord, with whom you will be blessed. When faithless ones with all their worthless delights are crying out under their hellish plights, sing faithful sing, and let your name survive. For though they have killed you, yet you are alive. Faithful is burned at Vanity Fair. 10 Original, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ, we are weak but you are strong, you are distinguished, but we are without honor, 1 Corinthians 4 10. The Seventh Stage Now in my dream, I watched Christian press forward on his journey, but not alone. For now he was joined by another pilgrim by the name of Hopeful. He was so named after watching Christian and Faithful, and how they behaved and what they said Hopeful joined Christian, and the two of them entered into brotherly covenant, and agreed to be companions because of the testimony to the truth Hopeful had witnessed, especially during the suffering Christian and Faithful had endured at the fair. For Faithful had died to make a testimony to the truth and another, by the name of Hopeful, arose from his ashes to be a companion with Christian in his pilgrimage. This Hopeful also told Christian that there were many more of the men in the fair who would follow him after some time. Christian and Hopeful enter into a brotherly covenant. Shortly after they departed from the fair, they caught up to a man walking ahead of them whose name was by ends. They asked him, Sir, what country are you from? And how far are you traveling in this direction? I'm from the town of Fair Speech, the man said. I am going to the Celestial City. But he didn't mention his name. From Fair Speech, Christian said. Is there any good that lives there? When he speaks graciously, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Proverbs 26 25, yes, Bayan said. I certainly hope so. Then sir, what name may I call you? By N said, I am a stranger to you and you to me. If you are going my way, I shall be glad to have your company, and if not, I must be content. I've heard of this town of fair speech, and from what I remember, they say it's a wealthy place. Yes, I can assure you that it is, and I have very many rich relatives and friends there. May I be so bold as to ask who they are? To be honest, almost the whole town, by N shrugged. In particular, my lord turnabout, my lord time server, my lord fair speech, from whose ancestors the town first took its name. Also there is Mr. Smooth Man, Mr. Facing Both Ways, and Mr. Anything. The parson of our parish, Mr. Two Tongues, was my mother's own brother. And to tell you the truth, I have become a gentleman of good quality, though my father's grandfather was nothing but an oarsman for hire. He would look one way and row another. I gained most of my estate by the same occupation. Are you a married man? By ends nodded. Yes, and my wife is a very virtuous woman, the daughter of a virtuous woman. She was my lady Feigning's daughter, therefore, she came from a very honorable family. As a result, she has a high level of breeding, and she carries herself impeccably to both prince and peasants. It is true, our religion somewhat differs from those of the stricter sort, but only in two small points. Lady Feigning's daughter. First, we never strive against the wind and tide. Second, we are always very fervent in following religion who parades silver slippers. We love to walk with him in the street when the sun shines and the people applaud him. Then Christian stepped a little to one side to speak with Hopeful. It comes to mind that this fellow is in fact by ends of fair speech, and if it is true, we have quite a scoundrel in our company the likes of which is often found in all these parts. Hopeful said, ask him to be sure. I would think he shouldn't be ashamed of his name. So Christian sidled up to Byens once again and said, Sir, you talk as one who knows more than all the world, and if my guess is right, I surmise your name to be Mr. Byens of fair speech. Is it not so? This is not my true name, the man said. But it is a nickname given to me by some who could not put up with me. He let out a sigh. I must be content to tolerate it as a reproach, just as other good men have done before me. Christian didn't let the subject rest. But were you responsible for situations that caused men to call you by this name? Never, never. 
the worst I ever did that might have caused them to give me this name, was when luck was on my side. I made profitable judgments at the right time. But if I'm to be criticized for these times that are by chance, then I choose to count them as blessings, rather than to let the hatred of such men force me to bear a malicious load of hatred. Christian's eyes narrowed. I was sure you were the man I had heard about, and to be honest, I fear this name more appropriately belongs to you than you might want us to think. By ends dismissed the comment, with a wave of his hand. Well, you can think whatever you like. I can't help what you think. However, you'll find me a fair-minded companion, if you will still allow me to travel with you. If you want to go with us, it will require you to go against wind and tide, which I understand goes against your convictions. You must also embrace religion in his rags, as well as when he wears his silver slippers. You must stand by him too, even when he is bound in shackles, as well as when he walks the streets with applause. By N's expression soured. You must not impose this on me or coerce my faith. Respect my freedom and allow me to go with you. No, Christian said. We'll not travel another step together, unless you agree with what I propose. Never, by N said. I shall never abandon my long-held principles, since they are harmless and profitable. If I'm not allowed to go with you, then I must do as I did before you caught up with me. I'll just travel by myself until someone else overtakes me who will be glad to have my company. Now I saw in my dream that Christian and Hopeful moved ahead of Mr. Byens, and they made sure to keep their distance. However, one of them looked back and saw three men following Mr. Byens. These three caught up with him, he made them a very low bow, and they also gave him a friendly compliment. The men's names were Mr. Hold the World, Mr. Money Love and Mr. Save All. Mr. Byens had formerly been acquainted with all three of them, for in their younger years they were friends in school, and had been taught by one Mr. Greitman, a schoolmaster in Lovegang, which is a market town in the county of Coverting in the north. This schoolmaster taught them the art of getting, either by violence, cheating, flattering, lying, or putting on a guise of religion. These four gentlemen had attained much of the art from their master, and had each become a master who could have run such a school themselves. Well, when they had greeted each other, Mr. Money Love said to Mr. Byens, Who are they up there on the road ahead of us? For Christian and Hopeful were still within view. By N said, they are a couple of men from a distant country, who to their way of thinking are going on pilgrimage. Mr. Money Love looked slightly confused. That's unfortunate. Why didn't they stay, so we might enjoy their good company? For I should hope we are all going on pilgrimage. I agree, By N said. But the men walking ahead of us are so rigid, and they are in love with their own ideas. As a result, they don't really value the opinions of others. Even if a man is godly, if he doesn't jump in with them in all things, they quickly thrust him out of their company. Mr. Save all said, that is bad, but we read of some who are excessively righteous, and such men's rigidness obliges them to judge and condemn everyone except themselves. But tell me, what and how many were the things in which you differed? Why they in their headstrong manner believed it is their duty to rush ahead on their journey in all types of weather, while I am in favor of waiting for wind and tide. They are for risking all for God in an instant, and I am for taking advantage of all I can to secure my life and property. They hold on to their beliefs, even though all other men oppose them. But I am for religion that is tolerant of the times, and not a threat to my safety. They are for religion when he dresses in rags, and is considered contemptible. But I am for him when he walks in his silver slippers in the sunshine, and with applause. Mr. Hold the World held up his hand. Yes, but hold on a moment, my good Mr. Byens. For my part, I can only consider him a fool who has the freedom to keep what he has, but is so unwise as to lose it. Instead, let us be wise as serpents. It is best to make hay while the sun shines. You see how the bee lies dormant over the winter and stirs again, only when it is profitable and pleasurable to do so. Sometimes God sends rain and sometimes sunshine. If some people are such fools as to go through the rain, let us be content to take fair weather as our portion. For my part, the religion I like best enjoys the security of God's good blessings poured out on us. When you think about it, it stands to reason that since God has given us the good things of this life, then he would want us to continue to enjoy them for his sake. Abraham and Solomon grew rich through religion. And Job says that a good man shall store up gold as dust. If this is so, 
He couldn't be much like the men before us, if they are anything like you have described them. I think that we all agree in this matter, Mr. Save all said. Therefore, there is no more need to talk about it. Mr. Money Love nodded. You're right. Nothing more needs to be said about this matter. For he who doesn't believe the scripture or reason, both of which we have on our side, will not appreciate his own liberty or care for his safety. My brother, by N said. As you see, we are all going on pilgrimage and so to better distract ourselves from things that are bad, let me ask you this question. Suppose a man, who is a minister of religion or a tradesman, or of some other profession learns about the prospect of a possible promotion. Let's say this promotion would offer him the good blessings of this life. Yet he can only gain this advantage by appearing extraordinarily zealous in certain points of religion, which he had previously neglected. Shouldn't he use this means to attain his end, and still remain a righteous and honest man? I understand the point of your question, Mr. Money Love said. With the permission of these fine gentlemen, he made a wide sweeping gesture to include all the men around him, I will endeavor to give you an answer. First, let's look at the example of the minister himself. Suppose a pastor, a reputable man in charge of a small congregation that provides meager financial support, has his eye trained on a bigger, more prestigious, and far more materially wealthy opportunity. Let's say he learns he has a chance of getting this new position, if he studies more and preaches more frequently and zealously, and because of the expectations of the people he is required to adjust his stand regarding some of his principles. The way I see it is that there is no reason why a man should not pursue this course of action, provided he receives a call. Yes, and besides this there are many more reasons he should seek this advancement in his career, provided he is an honest man. Here are some of the reasons. 1. His desire for a more prosperous congregation is lawful. This is beyond contradiction, for it is providence that set this opportunity before him. So let him pursue it with all his might, without questioning his conscience. 2. Besides, his desire after that larger congregation causes him to be more studious, a more earnest preacher etc., with the result that he becomes a better man. Yes, he is able to improve himself. And this is certainly according to God's will. 3. Now as for his complying with the expectation of his people, by deserting some of his principles in order to serve them, I argue this, first, that it reveals he has a self-denying temperament. Secondly, it shows he has a sweet and winning demeanor. And thirdly, it proves he is more qualified for the ministerial office. 4. I conclude then, that a pastor who exchanges a small congregation for a larger, should not be judged for so doing as being covetous, but rather, since he is determined to improve himself and his trade in this way, he should be considered in the same way as anyone who pursues his call, and who has an opportunity at hand to do good. And now to address the second part of the question, which concerns the tradesman you mentioned. Suppose such a person in his business has poor profitability in the world, and has to scrape just to get by. But by becoming religious this same person may find more opportunities to make a better living and fix his financial problems, perhaps by taking for himself a rich wife, or by drawing more and far better customers to his shop. Again, as far as I can see, there is no reason this course should not be pursued. And this is why. It is virtuous to become religious, by whatever means a man may use. Plus, it's not against the law to marry a rich wife and in this way increase the profitability of his business. Besides, the man who reaps such benefits as these by becoming religious obtains, that which is good by means that are good, and as a result becomes good himself. As a result, he has a good wife, good customers, good profitability, and all these by becoming religious. In other words, to become religious to get all these things is a good and profitable pursuit. Mr. Money Loves Lesson this answer offered by Mr. Money Love to Mr. By N's question received loud applause from them all. Therefore, the entire group of four concluded that the entire answer was most sensible and worthwhile. And because they were convinced no man could contradict such an argument, and because Christian and Hopeful were still within calling distance, they wholeheartedly agreed to challenge them with the question as soon as they overtook them, especially because of the opposition Mr. By N's had faced when he had talked with them earlier. So they called after them. Christian and Hopeful stopped and waited until the four men caught up to them. However, on their way, 
the challengers had decided that rather than have Mr. Byens present the question, it would be more profitable for Mr. Hold the World to offer it to the two pilgrims. For they supposed their answer to him would be less likely to rekindle the fiery feelings that had been expressed between Mr. Byens and them earlier when they had parted ways. So they approached each other, and after a short round of greetings, Mr. Hold the World proposed the question to Christian and his companion. Then he asked them to answer it if they could. Christian didn't hesitate to answer. He said, even a babe in religion could answer ten thousand questions such as this one. For if it is unlawful to follow Christ for loaves of bread, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. John 6 26, how much more detestable is it to make of a man and a religion a fake cover, and decoy use just to get and enjoy the things of this world. The only ones who hold such an opinion are the heathen hypocrites, devils and wizards. Heathens, for when Hamor and Shechem had a covetous eye toward the daughter and cattle of Jacob, and saw that there was no way for them to get what they wanted, unless they were circumcised, they said to their companions, If every male among us is circumcised, as they are circumcised, won't their cattle material possessions, and every beast they own be ours. What they sought to obtain were the daughters and cattle of Jacob, and they used their religion as a fake cover to try to get them. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city, and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are friendly with us, therefore let them live in the land and trade in it, but hold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage, and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised, as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property, and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will live with us. All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Genesis 34 20-24 the hypocritical Pharisees were also of this religion, but their long showy prayers were nothing but a sham they used for the purpose of getting widows' houses, and their judgment was a greater damnation from God. Beware of the scribes, who like to walk around in long robes, and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses, and for appearances' sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Luke 20 46-47, Judas the devil was also of this religion, for he desired the money bag and its contents, but he was lost, cast away, and the very son of perdition. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. John 12 6, Simon the wizard was of this religion too, for he wanted to have the power of the Holy Ghost, and hoped he might buy it with money. For this reason, he received his sentence from Peter's mouth, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Acts 8 19-22, Neither does it escape my attention that the man who takes up religion for the profit of the world, will throw away that religion to please the world. For Judas became religious for worldly gain, and he sold out that religion and his master for just that. So to answer the question positively as I perceive, what you have done is heathenish, hypocritical and devilish, and your reward will be according to your works. The four men stood staring at one another, without knowing how to answer Christian. Hopeful also approved of the soundness of Christian's answer, and so a heavy silence hung between them. Mr. Byens and his company staggered in the face of such a response and purposely lagged behind, wishing that Christian and Hopeful might easily get ahead of them. Christian turned to Hopeful and said, If these men cannot stand before the sentence of men, what will they do when they are confronted with the sentence of God? And if they don't know how to answer when dealt with by vessels of clay, what will they do when they are rebuked by the flames of a devouring fire? So Christian and Hopeful walked ahead of them again, and went on until they came to a subtle plain called Ease, which they journeyed across with much satisfaction. However, the plain was so narrow they quickly crossed it and reached the other side. Now at the farther side of that plain was a little hill called Luca, and within that hill was a silver mine. 
some pilgrims who had formerly gone that way had turned aside to see the mine because of its rarity. However, for some who ventured too near the brim of the pit, the deceitful ground beneath their feet broke under them. Some were slain, and some had been maimed there. Those who were injured were never free of the influence of the mine's wound until their dying day. Then I saw in my dream that a little off the road, right next to the silver mine, stood a man by the name of Demas. This gentleman called to passing pilgrims to come and see. In this manner he called to Christian and his companion Hopeful. Hello friends. Turn in here and I will show you something remarkable. Christian called back to him. What could be so deserving of our attention as to cause us to turn from the way to see it? Demas motioned toward the pit. Here is a silver mine. At this very moment some are digging in it for treasure. If you will come with a little effort, you may be able to richly provide for yourselves. Hopeful looked at Christian with wide eyes. Let's go see. Christian shook his head. Not me, he said. I have heard of this place and about the many who have been slain here. Besides, that treasure is a snare to those who seek it, for it hinders them in their pilgrimage. Then Christian called to Demas and said, Is this not a dangerous place? Has it not hindered many in their pilgrimage? But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. 1 Tim. 6 9. Demas tempts Christian and hopeful. Not very dangerous, Demas said, except to those who are careless. But his face blushed as he spoke the words. Then Christian addressed Hopeful confidentially. Let's not take one step off the way to wander from this path, but instead let us stay true to our way. Hopeful looked over his shoulder behind them. I guarantee you when by ends comes to this place, if he is offered the same invitation he will turn in here to get a closer look. I don't doubt it. Christian took in a deep breath and let out a sigh. There's no doubt of it, for his principles lead him that way, and I wager a hundred to one that he dies there. Demas persisted and called to the two pilgrims again. Won't you even come over just to look? Christian answered bluntly. Demas, you are an enemy to those who pursue the right ways of the Lord of this way. I know you already have been rebuked yourself for turning aside here by one of his majesty's judges. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. To Tim. 4.10, so why do you seek to bring us into the same condemnation? Besides, if we were to turn aside here, our lord the king would certainly hear about it and reveal our shame. Our desire is to stand with boldness before him. Demas cried out to them again, claiming he belonged to their brotherhood. Then he said, if you'll wait for just a short time, I'll join you on the pilgrimage. In response Christian said, what is your name? Isn't it the same name by which I have already called you? Yes, my name is Demas. I am the son of Abraham. I know you, Christian answered. Gehazi was your great-grandfather, and Judas your father, and you have continued to walk in their ways. What you are suggesting is nothing more than one of your devilish pranks. Your father was a traitor and hanged himself, and you deserve no better reward. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. Matt. 27 3-5 Be assured that when we have an audience with the king, we will tell him of your behavior. So Christian and Hopeful continued on their way but by this time by ends and his companions had come within sight again. Christian and Hopeful watched as the trailing party arrived at the silver mine. As soon as Demas called to them, they left the way and went over to him. Now, whether they fell into the pit by looking over the brink, or they went down to dig, or whether they were smothered at the bottom by the poisonous fumes that often arise in those depths, I do not know. While I'm not certain of the specifics, I did notice that they were never seen again in the way then sang Christian this song. By ends and silver demons both agree. One calls the other runs, that he may be a sharer in his lucre, so these two take up in this world and no farther go. Now in my dream, I saw that just on the other side of this plain, the pilgrims came to a place where an old monument stood right beside the highway. 
At the sight of it they were both concerned because of the strangeness of its shape, for it seemed to them as if it had been a woman transformed into the shape of a pillar. The two of them stood intently looking at it, but for a time they didn't know what to think of it. After some time Hopeful spotted an inscription on the head of the monument, but it was written in an unusual style of writing. So being no scholar, he called to Christian, to see if he could understand the meaning. Christian examined it, and after a little studying of the letters, he found them to mean, remember Lot's wife. So he read it to his traveling companion, and together they concluded that it was the pillar of salt into which Lot's wife had been turned, because she looked back with a covetous heart when she was fleeing from Sodom for safety. But his wife, from behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 1926, this amazing sight stimulated the following discussion. Ah my brother, this is a timely sight, Christian started. For it came to us at just the right time as it follows the invitation, which Demas offered us to come over to view the hill Luca. Had we gone over as he desired, and as you were inclined to do my brother, I suppose we might have been made a similar spectacle for all those who come after us to see. I am sorry I was so foolish. Hopeful stared at the pillar. I wonder why I am not now petrified as Lot's wife. For in what way was there a difference between her sin and mine? She only looked back, while I had a desire to go see the mine. Let grace be adored here, and let me be ashamed that such a thought ever entered my heart. The Pillar of Salt Let us take notice of what we see here, and how we can profit from it in the future. Christian pointed toward the pillar, which was once Lot's wife. This woman escaped one judgment, for she did not suffer the destruction of Sodom. Yet she was destroyed by another, as we see here. She was turned into a pillar of salt. Hopeful nodded. True, and may she be both a warning, and an example to us. A warning that we should shun her sin, and an example of what judgment will overtake anyone who does not heed the warning. In the same way, Korah Dathan and Oberon, with the 250 men who perished in their sin, were also an example to others to beware. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. Numbers 1631-32. But above all, I ponder one particular thing. How is it that Demas and his friends can stand so confidently over there looking for treasure, while this woman did nothing but look behind her? For we do not read that she stepped one foot out of the way, and yet she was turned into a pillar of salt. The judgment which overtook her remains as an example to all who see it to this day. And truly, all they have to do is lift up their eyes, and they can't help but see her. Christian looked thoughtful. It is an astonishing thing to contemplate, and it indicates that their hearts have grown desperate in this case. It is fitting to compare them with one who picks pockets in the presence of the judge, or the thief who cuts purse strings under the shadow of the gallows. It is said of the men of Sodom that they were sinners exceedingly because they were sinners before the Lord, that is, in his sight. And yet he had shown them kindnesses, for the land of Sodom was like the Garden of Eden. Remember that Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards all was well watered, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Genesis 13 10-13 Therefore, this provoked him all the more to jealousy, and made their plague as hot as the fire of the Lord out of heaven could make it. It is reasonable to conclude that those who sin in the sight of God, and in spite of such examples being set continually before them to warn them, still do the opposite. People such as these must be judged with the greatest severity. There's no doubt what you have said is the truth, Hopeful said. But what a mercy is it that neither you, but especially I, he placed his hand on his chest, am not made such an example as this woman. This occasion gives us an opportunity to thank God to fear before him, and to always remember Lot's wife. I saw then that the two pilgrims went on their way to a pleasant river, which David the king called the river of God, but John called it the river of the water of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation 22 1, their way followed along the bank of this river. 
Christian and his companion, Hopeful, walked it with great delight. They also drank of the water of the river, which was pleasant and refreshing to their weary spirits. On the banks of this river, on both sides, stood green trees with all kinds of fruit, and they ate the leaves to prevent gluttony, and which offered other medicinal benefits. On either side of the river, there was also a meadow dotted with lilies, and curiously beautiful. It was green all year long. In this meadow they lay down and slept, for in this place they could lie down safely. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. Psalm 23 2 When they awoke, they gathered fruit from the trees and drank of the water of the river again, and once again lay down to sleep. They did this for several days and nights. Then they sang. Behold, how these crystal streams do glide. To comfort pilgrims by the highway side. The meadows green, besides their fragrant smell. Yield dainties for them, and he that can tell. What pleasant fruit, yes, leaves these trees do yield. Will soon sell all, that he may buy this field. The pilgrims rest by the river of the water of life. So when they were willing to go on, for they weren't as yet at their journey's end, they ate and drank and departed. Now I beheld in my dream that they had not journeyed far and the river divided, and began to flow in two different directions. They were sorry to see it, for they dared not go out of the way. Now the way led away from the river and was rough, and their feet grew tender because of their travels. So the souls of the pilgrims became more and more discouraged because of the ruggedness of the way. Then they set out from Mount Hall by the way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. Numbers 21 4. So they went on, and wished for a better way. A little ahead of them, to the left of the road stretched a fenced meadow accessed by a stile. That meadow is called by Path Meadow. Christian said to Hopeful, If this meadow lies alongside our way, let's cross over into it. So he walked over to the stile to investigate, and saw that a pathway on the other side of the fence seemed to run parallel with the way. It's exactly what I wished for, Christian said as he pointed to the path on the other side of the fence. Here the going is much easier. Come on Hopeful, let's cross over. But, Hopeful said as his mouth screwed to one side, what if this path should lead us out of the way? That's not likely, Christian said. Look, doesn't it run alongside our way, but just on the other side of the fence? So Christian's argument persuaded Hopeful, and he followed him over the stile. Once they had crossed over and were walking on the parallel path, they found it much easier on their feet. Besides that, they spotted a man walking the path ahead of them. His name was Vain Confidence. They called after him and asked him where that way led. He said, to the celestial gate. Christian smiled at Hopeful. Thee? Didn't I tell you so? With this advice you can be sure we are going the right direction. So they followed Vain Confidence who went before them. But once night fell, it grew very dark. In fact, it was so dark they could no longer see the man walking before them. The man himself, vain confidence by name, could not see the way before him either, and he fell into a deep pit. This pit was dug in that place purposefully by the prince of those grounds to catch vain glorious fools, so they would be dashed to pieces. And so it happened to vain confidence when he fell. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Proverbs 28 26. Now, Christian and Hopeful heard him fall. So they called out to him to figure out what had happened, but there was no answer, only a groaning. Hopeful said, Where are we now? Christian was silent, for he was wondering if he had led his friend out of the way. And now it began to rain with thunder and lightning in a most dreadful manner. Water rose and began to flood the path. Hopeful groaned inwardly and said, Oh, if only I had stayed on the way. Who could have thought that this path would have led us out of the way? Christian asked. Hopeful said, From the beginning I was afraid that this would happen, and so I gave you that gentle warning. I would have spoken a little more directly, but you are older than me in the faith. Good brother, please don't be offended. I am sorry I have brought you out of the way, and exposed you to such impending danger. I plead with you, my brother, forgive me. I did not act with evil intent. Be comforted, my brother, for I forgive you, Hopeful answered. And I also believe that this shall work out for our good. Christian said, I am glad I have a merciful brother traveling with me, 
but we must not stand here like this. We must try to go back to the right way. In that case, brother Christian, let me lead the way. No, Christian reached out in the dark and placed his hand on Hopeful's arm. If you please, let me go first. Then if we happen to run into any danger, I will encounter it first since I am the one responsible for leading us out of the way. No, said Hopeful over the sound of rising water. You shall not go first, because your mind is troubled and for this reason it may lead you further out of the way. Then for encouragement they heard the voice of one saying, Let your heart be set toward the highway, even the way that you formerly went. Turn and go back again. Set up for yourself roadmarks, place for yourself guideposts, direct your mind to the highway, the way by which you went. Jeremiah 31 21. But by this time the flood waters had risen much higher, and made the way back very dangerous. Then I understood that it is easier to go out of the way when we are in it, than it is to go in when we are out. Yet the two pilgrims made every effort to go back. It was so dark and the flood so high, that in their attempt to go back, they could have easily been drowned nine or ten times. They could not with all the skill they had, get back to the stile that night. Therefore, they finally found refuge under a little shelter. They sat down there till the break of day, but being weary they fell asleep. Not far from the place where they lay there was a castle called Doubting Castle. The owner of it was Giant Despair, and it was on his grounds they now slept. And so early in the morning when the giant got up and walked up and down in his fields, he caught Christian and Hopeful asleep on his property. With a grim surly voice the giant ordered them to wake up and he asked, Where are you from, and what are you doing on my property? The two explained they were pilgrims who had lost their way. Then Giant Despair said, You have trespassed against me by trampling upon and lying on my grounds. Therefore you must come along with me. So Christian and Hopeful were forced to go with the giant, because he was stronger than them. As they walked along, they had very little to say, for they recognized their current circumstances were their fault. The pilgrims found asleep by giant despair. The giant drove them ahead of himself, and eventually secured them in a very dark dungeon in his castle. The spirits of the two prisoners found the dungeon to be nasty and stinking. But here they lay from Wednesday morning until Saturday night, without receiving one bit of bread or drop to drink. They remained in the dark all that time, and no one even came to ask how they were. Therefore, they found themselves in this evil place far from friends and acquaintances. You have removed lover and friend far from me, my acquaintances are in darkness. Psalm 88 18, Christian's sorrow multiplied in this place, because it was through his hasty advice that they were brought into this distressing state of affairs. Now giant despair had a wife, and her name was Diffidence. So when the giant went to bed that evening, he told his wife what he had done, explaining that he had taken a couple of prisoners, and thrown them into his dungeon for trespassing on his grounds. Then he asked for advice. What do you think I should do with these prisoners tomorrow? Who are they? she asked. And where have they come from? He told her, and she advised him that when he arose in the morning he should beat them without mercy. So when he arose in the morning, he grabbed his dreadful crab tree club, and went straight away down into the dungeon to the prisoners. He began to beat them as if they were misbehaving dogs, although they had shown him no disrespect. The giant continued to beat them so severely, that they were no longer able to try to protect themselves, or even to move upon the floor. Once he had finished, the giant walked out and left them there to commiserate over their misery, and to mourn under their distress. So for the rest of that day, heavy sighs and bitter cries occupied their time. The next night, Diffidence talked with her husband again about the prisoners. When she learned that they were still alive, she advised her husband to recommend to Christian and Hopeful that they commit suicide. In the morning, he went to the prisoners in the same gruff manner as before. When he saw they were in extreme pain because of the wounds he had inflicted the day before, he told them, since you are never likely to get out of this place, your best alternative is to make an end of yourselves. You can use a knife, noose or poison. For why should you choose to live seeing life is filled with so much bitterness? The prisoners asked that he let them go. With that the giant scowled as if he were ready to rush upon them to finish them off right then and there. But he fell into one of his fits for he sometimes experienced seizures on sunshiny days during which he lost the use of his hands for a time. Therefore he withdrew from the dungeon and left the prisoners to consider what they should do.
Christian and Hopeful talked between themselves as to whether it would be best to take the giant's advice or not, and it led into an intense conversation. Brother, said Christian, what shall we do? The life we now live in this place is miserable. For my part, I don't know whether it is better to live like this, or to die by our own hand. My soul chooses strangling rather than life, and the grave seems more desirable for me than this dungeon. So that my soul would choose suffocation, death rather than my pains. Job 7:15. Shall we accept the giant's advice? Hopeful let out a thoughtful sigh. It is true that our present condition is dreadful, and death would be far more welcome to me than to live in this continual misery. However, let us consider what the lord of the country to which we are going has said. He declares, you shall not commit murder, not just to another man's person, but we are forbidden to take the giant's advice to kill ourselves as well. Also, let us consider again that giant despair does not have authority over the law of our lord. As far as I can understand, others have been captured by him just like we have, and yet they have escaped out of his hands. Who knows if perhaps God who made the world might cause the giant despair to die? Or that perhaps at some time or another in the future he may forget to lock us in? Or that he may in the near future have another paralyzing fit while he is here with us in the dungeon, and then lose the use of his limbs? If that should ever come to pass again for my part, I am determined to bolster my courage, and to muster all my effort to escape from his hand. I was a fool not to have tried to do it earlier. However, my brother, let us be patient and continue to endure. The opportunity may come that could provide us with a happy release, but it shall not be by our own murders. Christian and Hopeful in the Castle of Giant Despair With these words Hopeful calmed Christian's mind for the present, so that they continued to endure the darkness that day, in their sad and doleful condition. Well, towards evening, the giant went down into the dungeon again, to see if his prisoners had taken his advice. But when he walked into the dungeon he found them alive, but just barely so, because they were in such need of bread and water. Plus, the brutal wounds they had received when he beat them left them unable to do much other than to breathe a little. But as I said, he found them alive, and it put him in a furious rage, and he threatened them because they had disobeyed his advice. It will be worse for you now than if you had never been born. At this the two terrified pilgrims trembled, and I think Christian fell into a swoon but when he revived a little, they renewed their discussion about the giant's advice, and whether it might be best now to take it or not. Once again Christian seemed in favor of doing it, but Hopeful made a second reply against it. My brother, he said, think about how valiant you have been on this journey until now. Apollyon could not crush you, nor could all that you heard saw or felt in the valley of the shadow of death. What hardship, terror, and amazement you have already gone through. Are you now nothing? but a bundle of fears. You see that I am imprisoned in the dungeon with you, and I am a far weaker man by nature than you are. Also, this giant has wounded me as well as you, and has also withheld bread and water from my mouth. Together we mourn without the light, but still let us exercise a little more patience. Remember how you played the man at Vanity Fair, and were neither afraid of the shackles nor the cage. You weren't even afraid of bloody death. Therefore let us at least— avoid the giant's advice and bear up with patience as well as we can. Night fell again and the giant and his wife Diffidence were in bed. She asked him about the prisoners, and if they had taken his advice and killed themselves. They are sturdy scoundrels, he replied. They choose to bear all hardships rather than to take their own lives. Take them into the castle yard tomorrow and show them the bones and skulls of those whom you have already dispatched and promise them that before two weeks go by you will tear them in pieces as you have done to other pilgrims before them. When the morning arrived, the giant went to Christian and Hopeful again, and took them into the castle yard. He showed them all the bones and skulls just as his wife had told him to do. These, he said, were pilgrims once, just as you are. And they trespassed on my grounds, just as you have done. When I saw fit, I tore them into pieces and within ten days I will do the same to you. Now get back down to your cell again. With that he beat them all the way to the dungeon. They lay in the dank darkness all day on Saturday in a most miserable condition, just like before. That night when Mrs. Diffidence and her husband the giant went to bed, they began to discuss their prisoners again. The old giant was amazed that he could not bring them to an end, either by his blows or his advice. With that his wife replied, I fear they live in hopes that someone will come to deliver them 
or that they have picklocks hidden on their person, which they hope to use to escape. I hadn't thought of that, the giant said. But since you have presented this possibility, my dear, I will search them in the morning. On Saturday, about midnight, Christian and Hopeful began to pray, and they continued in prayer till almost the break of day. A little before dawn good Christian, as one half amazed, broke out into this passionate exclamation. What a fool I have been to lie in a stinking dungeon like this, when I could just as well walk free. I have a key in my pocket next to my heart called Promise That Will, I am sure, open any lock in Doubting Castle. That is good news, good brother, pluck it from your pocket and try it, Hopeful said. So Christian pulled the key from his chest pocket, and fitted into the lock on the dungeon door. As he turned the key the bolt released and the door flew open with ease. Christian and Hopeful both fled the dark cell. Then they went to the outward door that led into the castle yard. Christian tried his key and it opened that door also. From there he made haste to the outer iron gate, for he knew he must open that gate to escape, but he struggled with that lock for it was desperately hard, but finally the key opened it. They thrust the gate open to make their escape, but as it opened the gate made such a creaking noise that it woke giant despair. He hastily left his bed and pursued his prisoners, but he felt paralysis overcoming his limbs, for one of his fits came over him again, and made it impossible for him to go after them. So Christian and Hopeful hurried on until they came to the king's highway. Once again they were safe, because they were out of the giant's jurisdiction. Now when they had crossed over the stile, they began to consider what they could do at that location to prevent pilgrims coming after them from being deceived, and falling into the hands of giant despair. They agreed between themselves to erect a pillar with a clear message engraved on its side saying, Over this style is the way to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair, who despises the king of the celestial country, and seeks to destroy his holy pilgrims. As a result, many who have followed after them have read what was written and escaped the danger. Once they finished this project, they sang the following song. Out of the way we went and then we found what it meant to tread upon forbidden ground and let those who come after have a care, lest heedlessness makes them, as we to fare, lest they for trespassing, his prisoners are, whose castles doubting, and whose names despair, Christian and hopeful escape, from doubting castle. 11 Original, for behold, they will go because of destruction, Egypt will gather them up, Memphis will bury them, weeds will take over their treasures of silver, thorns will be in their tents, Hosea 9-6. 12 Original, for those who guide this people are leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are brought to confusion, Isaiah 9 16. The Eighth Stage They went until they came to the delectable mountains, which belong to the Lord of that hill which we spoke about earlier. So they went up to the mountains to look at the gardens and orchards, the vineyards and fountains of water. There they also drank, washed themselves, and freely ate of the vineyards. On the tops of these mountains were shepherds feeding their flocks, and they stood by the side of the highway. So the pilgrims approached them to stand and talk as is the custom for weary travellers. They leaned upon their staffs and asked, Whose delectable mountains are these? And who owns these sheep that are feeding here? These mountains are Emmanuel's land, the shepherds answered. They are within sight of his city and the sheep also are his. He laid down his life for them. I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10 11-15, Is this the way to the celestial city? Christian asked. The shepherd said, You are heading in the right direction. How far do we have to go? It is too far for any except those who shall certainly arrive there. Christian looked at the way ahead and asked, Is the way safe or dangerous? safe for those for whom it is to be safe, but transgressors undoubtedly fall along the way. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things, whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. Hosea 14 9 Christian considered the shepherd's words and asked, Is there a place where pilgrims who are weary, and faint can find temporary rest in the way? The shepherds nodded. The Lord of these mountains has given us orders not to be forgetful to entertain strangers. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Hebrews 13 2, 
Therefore this good place is at your disposal. I saw also in my dream that when the shepherds perceived that Christian and Hopeful were travellers, they asked them some questions, which the pilgrims answered just as they had in other places all the way. The shepherds asked, Where are you from? And how did you enter into the way? And by what means have you persevered so far, for few travellers who begin to come here, ever show their face on these mountains? But when the shepherds heard their answers, they were pleased with them. Their countenance turned favourable, and they looked very lovingly upon the two of them and said, Welcome to the delectable mountains. The shepherds whose names were knowledge, experience watchful and sincere, took them by the hand, and led them to their tents where they partook of a feast. The shepherds said, We would be content for you to stay here a while and to become acquainted with us, and even more we recommend you enjoy the comfort provided by the bounty of these delectable mountains. Christian and Hopeful told them that they would be happy to stay, and then went to bed because it was very late. Then I saw in my dream that, in the morning, the shepherds invited Christian and Hopeful to walk with them upon the mountains. So they joined them and walked along together for a while, enjoying the pleasant view on every side. Then the shepherds said to each other, Shall we show these pilgrims some of the wonders that are to be seen here? They agreed they should, and took them first to the top of a hill called Era, which was very steep on the farthest side. Look down to the bottom, they said. So Christian and Hopeful peered down, and saw several men dashed all to pieces at the bottom, for they had fallen from the top. Christian looked from the bodies to the shepherds and asked, What does this mean? The shepherds answered, Have you not heard about those led into Era, by listening to Hymenaeus and Philetus concerning the faith of the resurrection of the body? And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. 2 Tim. 2 17-18. Yes, Christian and Hopeful answered in unison. The shepherds show the pilgrims the hill era. The shepherds replied, They are those you see dashed in pieces at the bottom of this mountain. And they have remained unburied to this day as you can see, to serve as an example to others to take care that they don't climb too high, or come too near the brink of this mountain. Then I saw the shepherds take them to the top of another mountain named Caution. There the shepherds told them to look into the distance. So when Christian and Hopeful looked afar, they thought they perceived several men walking up and down among a number of tombs located there. As they watched they noticed the men were blind, because they stumbled sometimes over the tombs, and were unable to get out from among them. Once again Christian asked, What means this? The shepherds answered them with another question. A little below these mountains did you notice a stile that led into a meadow on the left hand of this way? The two pilgrims glanced at each other and back at the shepherds. Yes. From that stile, the shepherds said, there goes a path that leads directly to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair, and these men, they pointed to the blind wandering among the tombs, came once on pilgrimage, just as you do now. That is, until they came to that same stile. Because the right way was rough in that place, they chose to leave the way and cross over into that meadow. There they were taken by giant despair and cast into Doubting Castle, where they were kept in the dungeon. Eventually he put out their eyes and led them among those tombs, where he has left them to wander to this very day, so that the saying of the wise man might be fulfilled. He who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Proverbs 21:16. Christian and Hopeful looked at each another with tears streaming down their cheeks, but they said nothing to the shepherds. Then I saw in my dream that the shepherds led them to another place at the bottom of the valley, where there was a door on the side of a hill. The shepherds opened the door and told them to look in. They looked in and it was very dark and smoky. From within the darkness they also thought they heard the rumbling sound of fire accompanied by tormented cries. And the smell of brimstone wafted from the door. Christian turned to the shepherds and asked, What does this mean? The shepherds told them, This is a byway to hell, where hypocrites enter in. This includes those who sell their birthright with Esau, those who sell their master with Judas, those who blaspheme the gospel with Alexander, and those who lie and deceive with Ananias and Sapphira, his wife. Then Hopeful said, I notice that every one of these put on a show of going on a pilgrimage just like we are doing. Is that so? The shepherds nodded. Yes and they travelled for quite a long time too. Exactly how far is it possible for them to go on in pilgrimage, since they were miserably cast away? Some farther, and some not so far as these mountains. 
Then the pilgrims spoke one to the other. We certainly have need to cry to the strong for strength. The shepherds nodded their agreement. Yes, and you will have need to draw on that strength once you have it too. By this time the pilgrims had a desire to press forward on their journey, and the shepherds agreed that they should. So they all walked together towards the end of the mountains. Then the shepherds said one to another, Let us show them the gates of the celestial city, if they have skill to look through our perspective glass. The pilgrims eagerly accepted the invitation, and so they were led to the top of a high hill called Clear, and were handed the glass to look through. They attempted to look through it, but the memory of the last thing the shepherds had shown them, made their hands shake so much, that they could not look steadily through the glass. However, even with shaky hands they thought they saw something like the gate, and also some of the glory of the place. Then they prepared to depart and sang this song. Thus by the shepherds secrets are revealed, which from all other men are kept concealed. Come to the shepherds then, if you would see, things deep things hid and that mysterious be. When they were about to depart, one of the shepherds gave them written instructions of the way ahead. Another cautioned them to beware of the flatterer. The third told them to take care not to sleep upon enchanted ground. And the fourth bid them Godspeed. So I awoke from my dream. The Ninth Stage I slept and dreamed again and saw the same two pilgrims going down the mountains along the highway towards the celestial city. A little below these mountains, on the left hand, lies the country of conceit. From it originates a crooked lane along which pilgrims walk because it enters into the way. Here they met with a very lively young man named Ignorance, who came out of that country. So Christian asked him, Where are you coming from? And where are you going? Sir, I was born in the country that lies there. He pointed left toward the country of conceit. And I am going to the celestial city. But how do you think you will be admitted at the gate? Don't, you think you may run into some difficulty there? Ignorance shrugged. Not really. I will get in the same way other good people do. But what have you to show at that gate? What qualification can you show so the gate should be open to you? Christian asked. Ignorance held his head high and said, I know my lord's will and have lived a good life, and I have repaid every man to whom I owe a debt. I pray fast pay tithes and give alms, and have left the land of my birth for the place to which I am going. Christian's brow knit into a slight frown. But you did not enter in at the wicket gate, which is at the head of this straight way. Instead, you came here by means of that crooked lane. I am afraid that whatever you may think of yourself, that when the day of reckoning comes, you will be charged as a thief and a robber instead of being admitted into the celestial city. Gentlemen, you are utter strangers to me. Ignorance said. I don't know you, so be content to follow your religion and I will follow mine. I hope all will be well. And as for the gate that you talk about, all the world knows that is a great distance away from our country. I cannot imagine that any man in all our regions knows the way to it. Plus, there isn't really any need for them to do so since we have, as you see, a fine pleasant green lane that comes down from our country into the way right here. When Christian saw that the man was wise in his own conceit, he whispered to Hopeful, There is more hope for a fool than for him. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 26 12, and then he added, When he who is a fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. Ecclesiastes 10 3. What do you think? Should we talk any more with him? Or should we walk ahead of him for now? and give him time to think about what he has already heard. And then shall we wait for him again, after some time to see if talking to him a little at a time, can do him any good. Ignorance Hopeful whispered in return, let ignorance think on what we've said for a little while, and hopefully he will not refuse to accept our good counsel, lest he remain still ignorant of what is the greatest gain. God says, those who have no understanding, although he made them, those he will not save. Hopeful further added, I don't think it is a good idea to tell him everything at once. Rather if you agree, I suggest we leave him for a while and talk to him later when he may be able to receive it. So the two pilgrims went on ahead and ignorance followed after them. When they had put some distance between them, they entered into a very dark lane where they met a man whom seven demons had bound with seven strong cords. 
The demons were carrying him back to the door they saw on the side of the hill when they were escorted by the shepherds. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Matt. 1245. Good Christian and his companion, hopeful, began to tremble. Yet as the devils led the man away, Christian looked to see if he knew him. He thought it might be one turn away who lived in the town of apostasy. But he wasn't able to get a clear view to identify his face, because he hung his head like a thief who has been found out. However, once he had passed by, Hopeful watched as he was taken away, and spotted a label on his back with this inscription, Wanton Professor and Damnable Apostate. Christian leaned toward Hopeful and said, Now I remember what he told me about something that happened to a good man in this region. The name of the man was Little Faith, but he was a good man who lived in the town of Sincere. What happened to him was this, there is an entrance to the straightaway here that comes down from the Broadway gate, a lane called Dead Man's Lane. It's called this because of the murders commonly committed there. So this little faith, while on pilgrimage just as we are now, happened to sit down for a time and fell asleep. At that time, three sturdy scoundrels came down the lane from Broadway Gate. They were three brothers and their names were Faint Hot, Mistrust and Guilt. When they spotted little faith asleep they sprinted toward him. Now the good man had just awakened from his sleep, and was just getting up to continue his journey. The three men came up to him and ordered him to stand. At this little faith turned as white as a sheet, since he didn't have the strength to fight or flee. Faintheart said, hand over your purse. But little faith hesitated, for he was very reluctant to lose his money. Mistrust stepped close to him and thrust his hand into little faith's pocket. Little faith cried out, thieves, thieves. Guilt struck little faith on the head with a great club that was in his hand, and knocked him flat to the ground, where he lay bleeding profusely, and in danger of dying. The thieves just stood by watching him bleed to death, but then heard someone coming on the road. They were afraid it might be Great Grace who lives in the town of good confidence. They quickly departed and left this good man to fend for himself. Little Faith is robbed. After a while, Little Faith began to revive. He scrambled to his feet and staggered on his way. Hopeful asked, did they take all he had? Christian shook his head. No, they never ransacked the pocket where he held his jewels, so those he was able to keep. But as I was told, the good man was very much troubled over his loss. For the thieves took most of his spending money. Like I said, they did not get his jewels, but other than that he had very little money left. It was scarcely enough to support him to the end of his journey. It's sad to say if I wasn't misinformed, he was forced to beg along the way to keep himself alive, for he wasn't able to sell his jewels. So he continued to beg and scratch to do what he could to exist. He went as we say, with many a hungry belly for most of the rest of the way. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Dash first Peter 4:18. But isn't it remarkable that they didn't rob him of his certificate, which he must have to receive his admittance at the celestial gate? Hopeful said. Yes, Christian said. It is remarkable, but they did not get it. Though they didn't miss it through any cunning on the part of little faith, for he had been so dismayed by their assault, that he didn't have the strength or skill to hide anything. So it was really more a question of good providence, rather than any endeavor on his part that they missed such a good thing. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Dash second Peter 2 9, but it must be a comfort to him that they did not get his jewels from him, Hopeful said. Christian sighed. It might have been a great comfort to him if he had appreciated this fact as he should have, but those who told me this story said he was so disheartened, because they took away his money, that he made little use of the jewels, and hardly even mentioned them the rest of the way. And when he did think on his precious jewels and he began to be comforted, they only reminded him of his loss again and filled him with depressing thoughts that consumed him. Hopeful shook his head. How sad for that poor man, such a situation could be nothing, but a continual source of great grief to him. Grief, Christian said. Yes, he was deeply distressed. I think any of us would feel that way if we had been robbed and wounded like him, and in a strange place as he was. It is a wonder he did not die with grief, poor man.
I was also told that he spread gloomy and bitter complaints concerning his misfortune, almost all the rest of the way. He explained all the details to all who encountered him about where he was robbed and how, and who they were that did it. He recounted what he had lost, how he was assaulted, and that he had hardly escaped with life. It is a wonder though, that the demands of travelling did not force him to sell, or pawn some of his jewels, so the pressures along the way might be relieved somewhat. Christian looked mildly surprised. You talk with about as much wisdom as a newly hatched chick with shell stuck to his head to this very day. For what reason would he ever want to pawn his jewels? And to whom would he sell them? In all that country where he was robbed, his jewels were not even counted as valuable, nor did he want the type of relief which the citizens living there might offer to him. Besides, if his jewels had been missing when he reached the gate of the celestial city, he knew he would have been excluded from receiving an inheritance there. That would have been worse for him than meeting up with the villainy of ten thousand thieves. Why are you being so sharp with me, my brother? Hopeful asked. Esau sold his birthright and for a mere bowl of pottage, then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Genesis 25 34, and that birthright was his greatest jewel. So if he sold such a precious thing, then why couldn't little faith do the same? Esau did sell his birthright, Christian said, and so have many others besides. By doing so they exclude themselves from the chief blessing, just as that indulgent coward did. However, there is a fundamental difference between Esau and little faith, and also between their spiritual conditions. For Esau's birthright was typical, but little faith's jewels were not so. Esau's appetite was his god, but little faith's was not so. Esau's lack lay in his fleshly appetite. Little faith's did not. Besides, Esau saw no further than the fulfilling of his lust saying, Behold, I am about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? Genesis 25 32, But little faith, though it was appointed for him to have but a little faith, was by his little faith kept from such extravagances. And by faith, as little as it was, he recognized his jewels were precious, and that he should not sell them as Esau did his birthright. However, you do not read anywhere that Esau had faith, not even a little. Therefore it's not surprising in the case of Esau that he was swayed by his flesh. For when the flesh alone controls a man, that man has no faith to help him resist selling his birthright and his soul to the devil of hell. For such a person is similar to the ass, who in her periods of heat cannot be made to change direction, when their minds are set upon their lusts, they will have them, whatever they cost. A wild donkey accustomed to the wilderness, that sniffs the wind in her passion. In the time of her heat who can turn her away? All who seek her will not become weary, in her month they will find her. Jeremiah 2.24, but little faith was of a different disposition. His mind was focused on things divine. His livelihood was based upon spiritual things from above. Therefore, for what purpose would a person with this temperament sell his jewels? If there had been anyone who would have even bought them, it would have only served to fill his mind with empty things. Will a man give a penny to fill his belly with hay? Or can you persuade the turtle dove to live upon carrion, like the crow? Though faithless ones can pawn or mortgage or sell what they have, and even themselves to boot for carnal lusts, yet those who have faith, saving faith, even if just a little of it, cannot do so. This therefore hopeful is your mistake. I honestly acknowledge it, hopeful said. But at the same time, your stern response almost made me angry. Christian's brows raised in surprise. I was rather harsh, but all I did was to compare you to birds that are especially lively, which run to and fro in untrodden paths with the shell upon their heads like a newborn chick. But let us leave that matter behind us, and consider the matter under debate, and all shall be well between you and me. But Christian, these three fellows that attack little faith, I am persuaded in my heart they were nothing but cowards. Otherwise, do you think they would have been so quick to run at the sound of someone coming along on the road? Why didn't little faith pull together greater courage? He might, in my opinion, have been able to resist them for at least one skirmish, and then have yielded when they overwhelmed him. Certainly, many have called such assailants cowards, but when they come face to face with them in an assault, few have found that to be the case. As for a courageous heart, little faith had no such thing. And I believe, my brother, that if the same thing happened to you, you would also have surrendered quickly. To be truthful, 
while you are upset about this matter now when these scoundrels are far from us, I think you might have second thoughts about how bravely you would confront them, if they should suddenly appear to you as they did to him. But consider again that they are, in fact, hired thieves who serve under the king of the bottomless pit. And he, if needed, will come quickly to their aid himself, and his voice is like the roaring of a lion. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Dash first Peter 5 8. I myself have been engaged in a similar conflict as Little Faith faced, and I found it to be a terrifying experience. These three villains set upon me, and I began to resist them like a Christian should, but they were quick to call for help, and their master came to their aid right away. As the saying goes, I would have given my life for a penny, but God had other plans, and I was clothed with armor that had been tested. And even though I was well equipped, I found it hard work to prove myself as a manly pilgrim. No one can understand what it is like in such combat, until he experiences being in the thick of the battle himself. Hopeful responded. Well of course these scoundrels ran when they thought that great grace was drawing close in the way. Christian agreed. True. In the past, they and their master have often fled when there is the prospect of great grace appearing, and that's no surprise, for he is known as the king's champion. But I trust you are willing to make some distinction between little faith and the king's champion. All the king's subjects are not his champions, nor can they accomplish such valiant feats of war, as he when they are tested by assailants. Is it reasonable to think that a little child should handle Goliath as David did? Is it right to expect a wren to have the strength of an ox? Some pilgrims are strong while others are weak, some have great faith, some have little. This man, little faith, was one of the weaker kind, and therefore he suffered exhausting humiliation. Hopeful let out a deep sigh. I still wish it had been great grace who appeared, for the sake of those scoundrels. Christian rested his hand on his cheek and shook his head thoughtfully. If he had arrived during that skirmish, he might have had his hands full. For I must tell you that even though Great Race is highly skilled with his weapons, as long as he keeps his sword sharpened, he can do very well against such opponents. But if faint heart mistrust or guilt can penetrate his armor, he will find the going hard and may even take a fall. And when a man is down, what can he do? Whoever looks very closely at Great Grace's face will see those scars and cuts there that clearly prove what I'm saying to be true. In fact, during one engagement he had with the enemy, I heard it said that while he was in the battle he cried out, we despaired even of life. And isn't it true that these powerful rogues and their accomplices even made David groan mourn and roar with anguish? O Lord, the God of my salvation, I have cried out by day and in the night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul has had enough troubles, and my life has drawn near to Shoal. Psalm 88 1-3 Yes, and also Heman and Hezekiah. Even though they were regarded as champions in their days, they were forced to rouse themselves because of the seriousness of the assault. But in spite of taking a fearless stand, they had their coats soiled and torn by them. Peter upon one occasion, tried to do what he could do in a similar situation. Even though he is considered the prince of the apostles, these same assailants roughed him up to the point that they made him afraid of a pitiful girl. Besides, the king of the scoundrels is always at their beck and call. He is never out of earshot, and if at any time they are losing the battle, whenever possible he comes to help them. For this reason it has been said of him, the sword that reaches him cannot avail, nor the spear, the dot, or the javelin. He regards iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee, sling stones are turned into stubble for him. Clubs are regarded as stubble, he laughs at the rattling of the javelin, Job 41 26-29. What can a man do in this case? It is true, if a man has full access to Job's horse and has skill and courage to ride him, he might accomplish notable deeds for his king. About his stallion it is said, his neck is clothed with thunder. He will not be afraid like a grasshopper, and the snorting of his nostrils is terrible. He paws in the valley while rejoicing in his strength. He goes on from there to engage the armed men. He mocks at fear and is frightened by nothing. Not even the sword turns him back. The quiver rattles against him, as do the flashing spear and the shield. He races over the ground with fierceness and rage, and he doesn't stop at the sound of the trumpet. Instead, at the sound of the trumpet he says, Aha! and is drawn to the scent of distant battle, the thundering of captains and the shouting of the battle cry. 
Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He pours in the valley, and rejoices in his strength, he goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed, and he does not turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the flashing spear and javelin. With shaking and rage he races over the ground, and he does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds he says, Aha! And he scents the battle from afar, and the thunder of the captains and the war cry. Job 39 19-25 But for such footmen as you and I, let us never desire to meet with an enemy, or promote ourselves as if we could do better, when we hear of others who have suffered defeat. Nor should we entertain thoughts of our own spiritual manhood as better than it is, for those who think this way often suffer the worst when tested. Take Peter for example, whom I mentioned earlier. He would strut, yes he would. Because of his proud attitude he fostered thoughts of himself as being more than ready to stand in defense of his master, compared to all other men. But who was more defeated than he was, when these villains were on the attack? Therefore, when we hear of such robberies taking place along the king's highway, there are two things we should do. First, let us go out well equipped, and be sure to take a shield with us, for it was for lack of a shield that made it impossible for the hearty assailant of Leviathan to make him yield. For it is true, that if we lack this weapon he will not fear us at all. Therefore, one of the king's champions has said, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, Ephesians 6 16. Second, it is also good for us to request a convoy of the king, and that he will go with us himself. This prospect made David rejoice when in the valley of the shadow of death, and Moses expressed his desire to, for dying where he stood, rather than to go one step without his God. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. Exodus 33 15. O oh my brother, if our king will go along with us, where should we be afraid of even ten thousands who plot against us? I lay down and slept, I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Psalm 3 5-6, and on the other hand, without him the proud only find refuge among the slain. Nothing remains but to crouch among the captives or fall among the slain. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. Isaiah 10 4. I for my part, have been in the thick of the battle before now and as you can see, I am still alive through the goodness of him who is best. Yet I cannot boast at all in my own spiritual strength. In fact, I would be glad if I never met with any more such clashes, though I fear we have not yet passed beyond all danger. However, since the lion and the bear have not as yet devoured me, I have hoped God will also deliver us from the next uncircumcised Philistine. Then Christians sang. Poor little faith has been among the thieves. Was robbed. Remember this, all who believe. And get more faith, shall a victor be. Over ten thousand else scarce over three. So they walked on and ignorance followed. Christian and hopeful continued, until they came to a place where another path joined with the straight way. The new path appeared to be as straight as the way which they had been following, so the two of them stood still pondering the choice, and not knowing which of the two to take. As they were thinking about the way, a dark man wearing a very light robe walked up to them, and asked them why they stood there. We're going to the celestial city, they answered. But we don't know which of these ways to take. Follow me, said the man. It is the way in which I am going. So the two pilgrims followed him in the new way which had joined the road. A little at a time it curved until it turned them so far that they veered away from the celestial city. In a little time, their faces were completely turned away from it. And yet they followed him. But by and by, before they were aware of the man's deception, he led them both into a net that encompassed them. They both became so entangled that they didn't know what to do. Then the white robe fell off the dark man's back, and they began to understand where they were. Therefore the two pilgrims lay crying there for some time, because they didn't know how to escape. Then Christian said to Hopeful, Now do I see that I have been caught in an era. Didn't the shepherds urge us to beware of the flatterer? Today we have discovered the truth in what the wise man says, A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps, Proverbs 29 5. Yes, Hopeful said. 
and they also gave us written instructions with directions about the way to make sure of our safe arrival. But we have forgotten to study them, and so have not kept ourselves from the paths of the destroyer. In this David was wiser than us for he said, As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips I have kept from the paths of the violent Psalm 17 4. So the two of them lay entangled in the net grumbling and complaining. At last they noticed a shining one coming towards them, a whip of small cords in his hand. When he came close to the place where they were stuck in the net, he asked them where they had come from and what they did there. They told him they were poor pilgrims going to Zion, but had been led out of the way by a man clothed in white. He told us to follow him since he was going to Zion too. Christian and Hopeful Delivered from the Net The man with the whip said, It is Flatterer, a false apostle, who has transformed himself into an angel of light. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Dash 2 Corinthians 11 13-14, so he tore the net and freed the pilgrims. Follow me, he said to them, that I may set you in your way again. So he led them back to the true straightaway, which they had left in order to follow the flatterer. Then he asked them, where did you stay last night? They said, with the shepherds upon the delectable mountains. He asked if the shepherds had given them written instructions including a map for the way. Yes, they answered. The shining one pressed further. When you pondered the way to go, didn't you take out the instructions to learn the way to go? The two red-faced pilgrims answered, No. But why not? We forgot. Then he asked, Did the shepherds not urge you to beware of the flatterer? Yes they did, the pilgrims answered. But we did not imagine that this fine-spoken man dressed in white could possibly be him. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Romans 16 17-18 Then I saw in my dream that the Shining One commanded Christian and Hopeful to lie down. When they did, he severely chastised them, to teach them the good way in which they should walk, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten the judge shall then make him lie down, and be beaten in his presence with the number of stripes according to his guilt. Deuteronomy 25 2. And as he chastised them, he said, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Revelation 3 19. Having done this, he told them to go on their way, and to specifically pay attention to the other directions of the shepherds. So they thanked him for all his kindness and went along the right way, softly singing, Come toward this place, you who walk along the way. See how the pilgrims fare who go astray. They are caught in an entangling net. Cause good counsel they lightly did forget. Tis true, they were rescued but yet you see. Their scourge to boot, let this your caution be. Now after a while, they notice someone in the distance coming toward them quietly, and alone along the highway to meet them. Then Christian said to his companion, Hopeful, ahead of us is a man with his back towards Zion, and he is coming to meet us. Hopeful said, I see him. Let us be very careful now, lest he should prove to be another flatterer or so. So the man drew nearer and nearer until he finally came right up to them. His name was Atheist, and he asked them where they were going. We are going to Mount Zion, Christian said. Atheist burst into a howling laughter. Christian glanced at Hopeful and back at Atheist with a scowl. What's the meaning of your laughter? Atheist caught his breath and wiped a tear from the corner of his eyes. I can't help but laugh. It's obvious what ignorant persons both of you are. You've taken upon yourselves this tedious journey that will provide you with nothing but your trouble and pains on a fruitless journey. Why do you say that? Christian asked. Don't, you think we will be received at our destination? Received? Atheist rolled his eyes as if Christian were a fool. There is no such a place as the one you dream about in all this world. But there is in the world to come, Christian said. When I was back home in my own country, I heard about this place you are talking about and for that reason I set out to look for this celestial city, and have been seeking it now for over twenty years. But from that first day on which I departed until now, 
I have found no such place. The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. Ecclesiastes 10:15. Christian gesture toward both hopeful and himself. Both of us have heard and believe that there is such a place to be found. If I hadn't first believed as you do when I left home, I would not have come this far in my search. You would think I would have found such a place by now if it existed. For I have traveled farther than you have, and now I am going back home where I hope to refresh myself with the things I had cast aside for the empty hope of that which I never found. Then Christian turned to his companion, hopeful. Is what this man said true? Be very careful, hopeful warned. This man is one of the flatterers. Remember what it cost us once already for listening to another sweet talker like this one. He shook his head in disbelief. What a thing to say that there is no Mount Zion. Didn't we see the gate of the city ourselves from the delectable mountains? Furthermore, are we not now to walk by faith? For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Cor. 5 7. Let us go on, lest the man with the whip should catch up to us again. A hint of concern showed on Hopeful's face. But you should have been the one teaching me this lesson, so listen carefully and let me plainly address you. My son, stop listening to the instruction that causes you to depart from the words of knowledge. Cease listening, my son, to discipline, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Proverbs 19.27, I say, my brother, do not listen to him. Rather, let us believe to the saving of the soul. Christian studied the ground for a moment and looked back at Hopeful. My brother, let me confess that I did not put the question to you because of my own doubt of the truth. Instead, I intended to test you and to obtain from you a response that would show the real commitment of your heart. He nodded toward atheist. As for this man, I know he is blinded by the God of this world. As for you and me, let's go forward holding on to the knowledge that we believe the truth, and no lie can be part of the truth. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Dash first John 2 21. Atheist. Hopeful smiled and clapped him on the back. Now I do rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The two pilgrims turned away from the man, atheist, and he loudly laughed at them and walked away not just from them, but also from the celestial city. Then in my dream, I saw the two pilgrims travel on, until they came into a certain region, where the air naturally tended to make strangers passing through drowsy. And here Hopeful began to feel lethargic and sleepy. He said to Christian, I have now become so drowsy I can scarcely hold my eyes open. He rubbed his eyes and looked around. Let us lie down here and take one nap. Christian shook his head. In no way should we stop to sleep here, he said. If we stop to sleep here, we may never awake. Why do you say that, my brother? Hopeful looked at Christian with heavy lidded eyes. Sleep is sweet to the working man. If we take a nap, we may feel refreshed. Don't, you remember what one of the shepherds told us? Christian said. He said to beware of the enchanted ground. By this he meant that we should be careful not to doze there. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober, 1 Thessalonians 5 6. Hopeful bobbed his head in agreement. I confess I'm at fault. Had I been traveling alone and fallen asleep, I would have run the danger of death. I see now that what the wise man says is true, two are better than one, Ecclesiastes 4 9. At this point in our journey your company has been a continual blessing, and you shall have a good reward for your efforts. Now then, Christian rubbed his palms together enthusiastically. To prevent drowsiness in this place, let us engage in good conversation. With all my heart, the other said. Where shall we begin? Why don't we start with where God began with us, Hopeful suggested. But if you please, I prefer if you begin. Very well, Christian said. I will sing you first this song. When saints do sleepy grow, let them come hither. And hear how these two pilgrims talk together. Yes, let them learn of them in any wise way. To keep open their drowsy, slumbering eyes. Saints' fellowship, if it be managed well, keeps them awake and that in spite of hell. Then Christian decided to start their discussion with a question. How did you first come to think of doing what you do now? Do you mean how I first became concerned about the condition of my soul? Yes, 
Christian said. That's exactly what I mean. For a long time, I continued to delight in those things which were on display and marketed at our fair, hopeful began. Things which I believe now would have drowned me in damnation and destruction, if I had continued in them still. What types of things were they? Hopeful gestured with his palms toward the sky and shrugged. All the treasures and riches of the world. He let his arms drop as he shook his head. I also delighted in much rebelling, partying, drinking, swearing, lying lewdness and much more. All of which tended to destroy my soul. But at last I discovered by listening to and considering spiritual truth, that this ungodly lifestyle would eventually lead to my death. Therefore what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification, and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6 21-23 I further understood that for such things as these the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5 6 Such truths I heard from you and also from beloved faithful, who was put to death for his faith and good living in vanity fair. And with this new understanding, did you fall under the power of this conviction? No, hopeful admitted. At that time, I wasn't willing to know about the evil of sin or the damnation that results from obeying it. Instead, when troubled by the word of truth, I endeavored to shut my eyes to its revealing light. But what was the cause of your stubborn resistance to these first workings of God's blessed spirit upon you? It was more than one cause, Hopeful said. First of all, I was ignorant that this was the work of God upon me. I never understood that God begins the conversion with a sinner by using awakenings towards sin. Second, sin was still very sweet to my flesh, and I was very reluctant to let go of it. Thirdly, I didn't know how to part with my old friends, because their friendship and lifestyle were still desirable to me. And lastly, the times in which convictions grasped me were so troublesome and fearful to my heart that I could not endure them, or even the mere remembrance of them. So are you saying that sometimes you were able to get rid of your troubling thoughts? Hopeful nodded. Yes, but then they would come into my mind again, and I would be just as bad, no worse than I was before. Why, what was it that brought your sins to mind again? Many things such as, if I merely met a good man in the streets, or if I heard anyone read from the Bible, or if my head began to ache, or if I was told that some of my neighbors were sick, or if I heard the bell toll for someone who had died, or if I thought of myself dying, or if I heard that others happened to die suddenly. But especially when I considered my own pending appointment with judgment to come. And at any time could you easily be relieved of the guilt of sin, when it confronted you by any of these ways? Christian wanted to know. No, not recently anyway. For they grabbed hold of my conscience, and if I even thought of going back to sin, though my mind was in opposition to it, it resulted in double torment to me. And what did you think of doing then? Hopeful said, I decided I must make every effort to fix and improve my life or else I thought I was sure to be damned. And did you actually follow through on this resolve, and try to improve your ways? Yes, Hopeful said quite enthusiastically. And I fled from not only my sins but sinful company too. Plus, I devoted myself to religious duties such as praying, reading the Bible, weeping for my sin, speaking the truth to my neighbors and more. I was involved with so many of these types of activities, that they are too numerous to mention. And did you think all was well then, and that you were better off because of this religious involvement? Hopeful shrugged. Yes for a while. But eventually greater trouble overwhelmed me again. It reached a whole new level that rose above that of all my reformations. How could that possibly come about, since you had reformed your ways and improved your life? Actually, several things brought this upon me, Hopeful said especially such sayings as these, all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, Isaiah 64 6. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Galatians 2 16, 
when you have done all these things say, we are unprofitable. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you say, we are unworthy slaves, we have done only that which we ought to have done. Luke 17 10 with these sayings and many more like them, I began to reason with myself like this, if all my righteous deeds are like filthy rags, if no one can be justified by the deeds of the law, and if when we have done all, we are still unprofitable, then it is but foolishness to think of heaven by means of the law. I also thought about things this way, if a man runs up a hundred dollar debt at a local shop, and after that pays cash for everything else he buys, his old debt still stands in the book unsettled. The shopkeeper may sue him for it and throw him into prison till he pays the debt. Well, I understand what you're saying, but how did this apply to you? Christian asked. Let me take you through my reasoning on this and you will understand, Hopeful said. As I pondered this, I realized my sins caused me to be greatly indebted in God's book, and all of my current reforming will not pay off what I owe. Therefore, I wondered what the use is of all my present current efforts to improve. For how shall I escape from the damnation that I brought on myself because of my former transgressions? Christian nodded thoughtfully. That is a very good application. Please go on. Well, another thing that troubled me was that even in my latest efforts to change, hopeful paused, searching for the right words, when I took a closer look at the best of what I do now, I still see sin, new sin which mixes itself with the best of what I do now. So now I am forced to conclude that in my former fond conceits regarding myself and the debt I owe, I had committed enough sin in one day to send me to hell, even if all the rest of my former life had been faultless. And what did you do then? What did I do? Hopeful's voice raised. I was at a loss as to what to do. I had no idea which way to turn, until I shared my troubled thoughts with Faithful, for he and I were well acquainted. He told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man that had never sinned, then neither my own righteousness, nor that of all the world could save me. And were you convinced that what he spoke was true? Hopeful ran his fingers through his hair, and let his arm drop to his side. Truthfully if he had told me this when I was pleased and satisfied with my own efforts to improve, I would have called him a fool for his trouble. But now, having seen my own corruption and the sin which is attached to even my best performances, I have been forced to agree with his opinion. But when he first suggested this to you did you think that such a man could be found? Christian asked. One who could be rightly described as sinless. Hopeful shook his head in short side-to-side -side movements. I must confess that at first his words sounded strange, but after a little more talk and time spent with faithful in fellowship, I became fully convicted that he was right. Christian asked, and did you ask him who this man was, and to explain how you must be justified by him? Yes, and he told me it was the Lord Jesus, who dwells on the right hand of the Most High. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward, until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them, he then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Hebrews 10 12-21 And so he explained that you must be justified by him, by trusting in what he accomplished when he suffered by hanging on the tree. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 4 5 so I asked how that man's righteousness could be effective in justifying another such as myself before God. And he told me he was the mighty God, and that he died that death not for himself but for me, to whom his obedient atoning work and its worthiness would be credited if I believed on him. And what did you do then? I offered my objections as to why I should not believe, because I thought this Christ was not willing to save me. And what did Faithful say to you then? A smile tugged at the corner of Hopeful's mouth. He urged me to go to him and find out for myself. But I said it was presumptuous to do so. Faithful said it wasn't because I was invited to come. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matt. 11 28. Faithful instructs hopeful.
Then he gave me a book of Jesus in which were his very words. He gave me this book to encourage me to freely come to him. He said that every jot and tittle in this book were more firmly established than heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Matt. 24:35. Then I asked him what I must do when I came to Christ, and he told me I must fall to my knees. Come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Psalm 95 6 And plead with all my heart and soul, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29 12-13 That the Father would reveal him to me. Then I asked him how I must make my petition to this Jesus, and faithful said, Go, and you shall find him sitting on a mercy seat, where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to those who come. There I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Exodus 25 22, I told him I didn't know what to say when I did come, and faithful told me to say something to this effect, for be merciful to me a sinner, and enable me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I understand that if his righteousness was not available, or if I didn't have faith in that righteousness, then I would be utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard that you are a merciful God, and have ordained that your Son Jesus Christ should be the Saviour of the world. And additionally, you are willing to grant him and his salvation upon such a poor sinner as myself, and I am indeed a poor sinner. Therefore, Lord, take this opportunity to magnify your grace and the salvation of my soul, through thy Son Jesus Christ. Amen. And did you do exactly as you were told? Hopeful's head bobbed earnestly. Oh yes, over and over and over. And did the Father reveal the Son to you? Christian asked. Hopeful's face grew thoughtful. Not the first, nor second, nor third, nor fourth, nor fifth, no, nor even the sixth occasion either. What did you do then? What did I do? Hopeful's brows knit together. Well, I didn't know what to do. Christian asked. Did you ever, thoughts of giving up on praying? Yes, at least a hundred times and then another hundred. And what was the reason you did not give up? Christian prodded. Hopeful shrugged. I believed what he had told me was true, that is, that without the righteousness of this Christ, all the world could not save me. Therefore I thought to myself if I stop praying, then I die, and I can only die at the throne of grace and in addition to this came the thought that if it delays, then wait for it, because it will certainly come and will not delay. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, it hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. Habakkuk 2-3, so I continued praying until the Father showed me his Son. And how was he revealed unto you? I did not see him with my physical eyes, but rather with the eyes of my understanding. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Ephesians 1 18-19 Now this is how it happened. One day I was very sad. I think I was sadder than at any other time in my life and this bout of sadness was the result of a fresh insight of the greatness and vileness of my sins. And as I was anticipating nothing but hell and the everlasting damnation of my soul, suddenly, I thought I saw the Lord Jesus looking down from heaven upon me. And he called to me saying, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, Acts 16 31. But I replied, Lord, I am a great, a very great sinner. And he answered, My grace is sufficient for you. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Dash 2 Corinthians 12 9 Then I said, But Lord, what exactly is believing? Then suddenly I understood that saying, He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes on me shall never thirst. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. John 6 35, I understood that believing and coming were the same thing. Therefore, the one who comes to Christ, that is, the one who runs to him in his heart and earnestly longs after salvation by Christ, he is one who truly believes in Christ. 
Then tears brimmed in my eyes and I asked, But Lord, may such a great sinner as I am truly be accepted by you and be saved by you. And I heard him say, And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, John 6 37. Then I said, But Lord, how must I properly think about you in my coming to you, in order that my faith may be placed properly upon you? Then he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. 1 Tim. 1.15 He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, Romans 10.4. He died for our sins and rose again for our justification. Who was delivered over because of our transgressions, and was raised because of our justification. Romans 4.25 He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Revelation 1 5, he is the mediator between God and us. For there is one God, and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Tim. 2 5, he lives forever to make intercession for us. Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7 25, from all of this, I understood that I must look for righteousness in his person, and for satisfaction for my sins by his blood. What he did in obedience to his father's law, by submitting to its resulting penalty was not for himself, but was for those of us who accept it for our salvation with thankfulness. As a result, my heart became full of joy. Tears streamed down my face and my affections overflowed with love for the name, people and ways of Jesus Christ. This was truly a revelation of Christ to your soul, Christian said but tell me more, particularly the details of what effect this encounter had upon your spirit. Hopeful pulled in a deep breath and let it out thoughtfully. It made me see that all the world, despite all its righteousness, is in a state of condemnation. It made me see that God the Father, while being just, can justify the believing sinner. It made me greatly ashamed of the vileness of my former lifestyle, and amazed me with the sense of my own ignorance. For until this time, my heart never contemplated the beauty of Jesus Christ. It made me love a holy life and long to do something for the honor and glory of the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, I now considered that if I had a thousand gallons of blood in my body, I would willingly spill it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus. I saw then in my dream that Hopeful looked back and saw ignorance, whom they had left behind, following after them. Hopeful said to Christian, Look how far in the distance that youngster is lagging behind us. Christian looked back and spotted the lad. Yes, yes, I see him, but he doesn't care for our company. But I am sure that it would not have hurt him, if he had decided to walk with us to this point. A slight smile played across Christian's lips. That is true, but I am sure he thinks very differently. Yes, hopeful return the smile. I agree with you. However, let us wait for him to catch up. So the two pilgrims slowed their pace, and stopped to wait for ignorance. Christian called to him. Man, come walk with us. Why do you stay so behind? Ignorance called back to him. Because I take pleasure in walking alone, and even more so than in company, unless I find some pleasant travellers. Christian turned to Hopeful and said under his breath, Didn't I tell you that he doesn't care for our company? However, come on and join me in a conversation with him to better pass away the time in this solitary place. As ignorance drew near, Christian said to him, My friend, how are you doing? How is your relationship between God and your soul? Ignorance shrugged as he looked from hopeful to Christian. I have hope that is well for now. My mind is always full of good ideas and beliefs to comfort me as I walk. What kind of good ideas and beliefs? Christian asked. Please tell us more. Ignorance stood a little straighter. Why, I think about God and heaven. Christian tapped his finger to his lips, as if lost in thought for a moment and then said, so do the devils and souls damned to hell. Ignorance jutted his chin and held it higher. But I think of them and desire them. So do many who are never likely to reside there, Christian said. You believe that God is one. You do well, the demons also believe, and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Dash James 2 19-20 but I think about them and leave all that I have for them in order to obtain them, 
ignorance counted. I doubt that very much. Christian's mouth pulled to one side. To leave all is much harder to do than many understand. Tell me why or by what evidence you have been so persuaded as to leave all for God and heaven. My heart tells me so. Christian said, the wise man says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, Proverbs 28 26. Ignorance is lower lip curled in a pout. That saying speaks of an evil heart, but mine is not evil, it is good. But how can you prove that your heart is good? It comforts and assures me concerning my hope of reaching heaven. Ignorance punctuated his statement with a nod of his head. That may well be, but the heart can be deceitful, Christian said. For a man's heart may minister comfort with regard to his hope of something, even though he has no grounds to expect the fulfillment of that hope. But my heart and life are in agreement with one another, and therefore my hope is well grounded. Christian asked, Who told you that your heart and life are in harmony? Tiny frown lines gathered between ignorance's brows. My heart tells me so. My dear fellow, ask yourself whether or not you are a thief. Your heart may tell you one thing, but it is the word of God that must bear witness in this matter, any other testimony is of no value. Ignorance sighed deeply. But is it not a good heart that produces good thoughts? And is it not a good life that is in harmony with God's commandments? Yes, Christian admitted. It is a good heart that produces good thoughts and a good life that is in harmony with God's commandments. But it is one thing to really have these qualities, and another only to think so. Ignorance crossed his arms in front of his chest. Then tell me, what counts to you as good thoughts and a life according to God's commandments? There are good thoughts of various kinds, Christian said. Some with regard to ourselves, some God, some Christ, and some in regard to other things. What are good thoughts with regard to ourselves? Those that are in agreement with the word of God, Christian replied. When do thoughts of ourselves agree with the word of God? Christian glanced at hopeful and back at ignorance. When we pass the same judgment upon ourselves that the word of God passes on us. Let me explain what I mean. The word of God says of the natural man, there is no one who is righteous, there are none who do good. It also says that the imagination of the heart of man is only evil and continually so. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6 5 and again, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Genesis 8 21. Now then, when we think of ourselves in this sense, then our thoughts are good ones because they are in accordance with the word of God. Ignorance stubbornly propped his fists on his hips. I will never believe that my heart is that bad. Christian shook his head sadly. If that is the case, then you have never had one good thought concerning yourself in your whole life. But let me go on. As the word of God passes judgment upon our hearts, so it also passes a judgment upon our actions. When the thoughts of our hearts and actions agree with the judgment which the word brings on both, then both are good because they are in agreement with that word. Ignorance said, What do you mean? Why the word of God says that man's ways are crooked ways, not good but perverse, Christian explained. It also says that their nature is to veer out of the good way, and that they have no inclination to know it. All have turned aside, together they have become useless, there is none who does good, there is not even one. Romans 3 12, when a man thinks about his actions in this way, with a heart full of humiliation reflected in his thoughts, then he has good thoughts about his ways. His thoughts now agree with the judgment of the word of God. Then exactly what are good thoughts concerning God? Ignorance wanted to know. Christian said, they are similar to what I have said concerning ourselves. When our thoughts of God agree with what the word says about him, then they are good thoughts. That means when we think of his character and attributes as the word teaches. However, to speak of him concerning ourselves, when we understand that he knows us better than we know ourselves, and that he can see sin in us when and where we can see none in ourselves, and when we understand that he knows our inmost thoughts, and that he at all times sees into the depths of our heart, and when we think that all our righteousness stinks in his nostrils, and that for this reason even with our best performance, we still cannot stand before him with any confidence, then our thoughts are good, though I cannot talk about this in detail right now. Do you think that I am such a fool as to regard God as not being able to see any further than I can? Do you believe that I would hope to come to God for acceptance of only my best performances? Then tell me, Christian said. Tell me what you think in this matter. 
I'll keep it brief and to the point, ignorance said. I think I must believe in Christ for justification. But how? Christian pressed. How could you think that you must believe in Christ when you don't see your need of him? You see neither your original sin nor your actual transgressions. Rather, you have such a high opinion of yourself, and of what you do that you plainly qualify as one who has never seen the necessity of Christ's personal righteousness to justify you before God. How then can you say, I believe in Christ? In spite of what you say, I believe well enough. Exactly what do you believe? Christian asked. I believe that Christ died for sinners, and that I shall be justified before God from the curse of the law, through his gracious acceptance of my obedience to his laws. In other words, Christ makes my religious duties acceptable to his Father by virtue of his merits, and so shall I be justified. Let me give you an answer to this confession of your faith, Christian said. You believe with a false faith, for this faith is nowhere described in the Word of God. You believe with a false faith, because it takes away the personal righteousness of Christ, and applies it to yourself. Your faith makes Christ a justifier of your actions. In contrast, true faith is a faith in Christ as your justification, knowing that your own works are filthy rags. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 4 5, Therefore this faith is deceitful, and the type which will leave you under the wrath of God Almighty at his final day of judgment. For true justifying faith directs the soul, being sensible to its lost condition by the law, to flee for refuge to Christ's righteousness. Now this righteousness of Christ is not an act of grace, by which he makes your obedience a justifying work acceptable to God. Rather it is his personal obedience to the law in doing and suffering for us, which this same law justly required at our hands. True faith accepts this righteousness of Christ as if were a skirt by which the soul can be completely covered. In this way the soul is presented as spotless before God. It is accepted by God, and he acquits such a covered person from condemnation. What are you saying? Ignorance asked, in a louder voice. Would you have us trust in what Christ in his own person has done without us? This conceit would encourage the loosening of the reins of our lust, and allow us to live as we are inclined. For what does it matter how we live, when we may be justified by Christ's personal righteousness, when all we have to do is simply believe it? You are fittingly named ignorance, Christian said. For you are also ignorant as a person. Even your answer demonstrates this to be true. You are ignorant of what justifying righteousness is, and equally ignorant about how your soul may be safe from the severe wrath of God through the faith in it. Yes, you are also ignorant of the true effects of saving faith in this righteousness of Christ, which include the conquest and winning over of the heart to God in Christ, to love his name, his word ways and people, and not as you ignorantly imagine. Christian instructs ignorance. Hopeful nudged Christian and said, ask him if ever he had Christ revealed to him from heaven. But ignorance heard the question and said, what now? Are you a man influenced by revelations? I believe that what you and you, he pointed at Hopeful and also at Christian, and all the rest of what you say about this matter, is nothing more than the fruit of a muddled mind. Hopeful said, why Jesus Christ is so hid in God from the natural understanding of the flesh, that he cannot be savingly known by any man, unless God the Father reveals him to the man. Ignorance jabbed his finger in Hopeful's direction again. That is your faith, but it is certainly not mine. However, I have no doubt that my faith is as good as yours, though in no way do I have as many fanciful notions in my head as you do. Allow me to add something here, Christian said. You should not speak so disdainfully of this matter, for I will boldly affirm, even as my good companion has done, that no man can know Jesus Christ except through the revelation of the Father. Yes, and I will also say that even the faith that lays hold of Christ, assuming it is true faith, must be forged by the exceeding greatness of his mighty power that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Ephesians 1 17-19 Now regarding the working of this faith, I perceive, poor ignorance, that you are totally ignorant of it. Therefore, wake up and see your own wretchedness, 
and flee to the Lord Jesus. For only by his righteousness, which is the righteousness of God, for he himself is God, shall you be delivered from condemnation. Ignorance motioned with the wave of his hand for them to go ahead without him. You go so fast I cannot keep up with you. So you go on before me and I will follow from behind at a distance. Christian and hopeful said. Well ignorance, will you yet foolish be? For slight good counsel, ten times given thee. And if you yet refuse it, you shall know. Before long the evil of your doing so. Remember man in time, stoop, do not fear. Good counsel taken well saves, therefore hear. But if you yet shall slight it, you will be. The loser ignorance I'll warrant thee. 13 Original, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. Hebrews 12 16. 14 Original, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. Proverbs 13 4. The Tenth Stage. Then Christian addressed his companion. Well, come with me my good friend Hopeful, for I see that you and I must walk by ourselves again. So I saw in my dream that they went on ahead at a strong pace, while ignorance limped along behind them. Then Christian said, I feel great pity for this poor man, because his journey will come to a sorrowful end. Unfortunately, in our town there is an abundance of people in his condition, whole families, yes, even whole streets with many being pilgrims too. So if there are many like him in our parts, how many do you think must there be in the place where he was born? Hopeful asked. Indeed this is true, Christian said, for the word says, he has blinded their eyes, lest they should see. But now that we are by ourselves, tell me, what do you think of such men? Do you think that at any time they have convictions of sin, and so as a consequence have fears about the danger of their condition? No, I would rather that you answer that question yourself for you are older and have more experience. Very well, Christian said. I would say, in my opinion, that sometimes they may have such fears. But because they are naturally ignorant of spiritual truth, they do not understand that such convictions contribute to their good. Therefore, they desperately seek to stifle them while they presumptuously continue to flatter themselves concerning the good state of their own hearts. Hopeful's head bobbed his agreement. I do believe as you say, that fear tends to benefit men, and to make them right at the beginning of their pilgrimage, and to prompt them to go the right way. Christian grew enthusiastic. Without a doubt this is what happens, if it is the right fear. For the word says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 1 7. How would you describe right fear? Hopeful asked. I'd say you can know that it is true or right fear based on three things. By its arousal. It is caused by conviction of sin. It drives the soul to believe in Christ for salvation. It gives birth to and maintains in the soul a great reverence of God his word and his ways. So this soul is kept tender by making it afraid to turn to the right or left from these affections to anything that may dishonor God, break its peace, grieve the spirit, or cause the enemy to speak of God with reproach. Well said, Christian. I believe you have spoken the truth. Have we now almost passed through the enchanted ground? Why? Are you weary of this conversation? No, not at all, Hopeful said. I would just like to know where we are. We don't have more than two miles further to go now. Nevertheless, let's return to our topic of discussion. Now, the ignorant generally don't know that such convictions of sin tend to cause them to fear and is for their good. Therefore they seek to stifle them. In what ways do they seek to stifle them? Hopeful asked. There are four ways. They think that those fears are created by the devil, though in fact they are truly from God. In thinking this way they resist them as things that would cause their defeat. They also think that these fears tend to spoil their faith, when even though as deluded poor men, they do not have any faith at all. Therefore they harden their hearts against them. They presume they should not have fears, and therefore in spite of them, they put on a vain show of confidence. They see that those fears tend to strip away their pathetic displays of self-righteousness, and therefore they resist them with all their might. Hopeful said, I confess to knowing something of this myself, for before I knew the truth about myself my condition was just as pathetic. Well, let us leave our neighbor ignorance by himself at this time, and decide upon another question profitable for discussion. I agree wholeheartedly, Hopeful said. But again I ask that you begin. Well then, Christian said. 
About ten years ago, did you know a man by the name of Temporary in your parts? He was a man enthusiastic about religion then. Know him? I certainly did. He lived in Graceless, a town about two miles from Honesty, and he lived next door to a man by the name of Turnback. That's right. Turnback actually lived under the same roof with him. Well, at one time that man was very much awakened spiritually. I believe at that time he had some awareness of his sins, and of the wages that were due in this regard. I hold the same opinion, Hopeful said. For since my house was not more than three miles from him, he would often come to me with many tears. Truly I pitied the man and was not altogether without hope for him, but one may see, it is not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, who proves to be a genuine Christian. Christian nodded in understanding. He once told me that he was determined to go on pilgrimage, just as we are now, but all of a sudden he grew acquainted with one safe self, and then he became a stranger to me. Since we are talking about him, Hopeful said, let us spend a little time to ask the reason for his sudden backsliding, and for others like him. This may be very profitable, Hopeful, but I ask that you begin this time. Very well, Hopeful said. In my judgment, I see four reasons for it, though the consciences of such men are awakened, yet their minds are not changed. Therefore, when the power of guilt diminishes, the very thing that provoked them to be religious ceases to have any effect. For this reason, they naturally turn to their former course again. We see the same reaction with a dog that is sick and vomits up what he has eaten. So long as his sickness prevails, he vomits and throws up everything in his stomach. Not that he does this of a free mind, if we may say a dog has a mind, but rather because of his troubling stomach. However, when his sickness passes and his stomach feels better, he turns around and licks up all his vomit, and so what is written is true, a dog returns to its own vomit, 2 Peter 2.22. Now I say a person may be enthusiastic about heaven, but only because they sense and fear the torments of hell. But as their sense and fear of damnation chills and cools, in the same way their desires for heaven and salvation cool also. So then it comes to pass that when their guilt and fear are gone, their desires for heaven and happiness die, and they return to their former course in life again. Another reason is this. They have mindless fears that overwhelm them. I'm talking about fears they have of men now. For the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Proverbs 29:25. So then, though they seem to be enthusiastic for heaven, so long as the threat of hell's flames are real to them, when that terror has lessened in their way of thinking they have second thoughts. They begin to think it unwise to run after something they know little about and risk losing all. A second idea they begin to entertain, is that it is not prudent to bring themselves into unavoidable and unnecessary troubles, and as a result they fall in with the world again. The shame that attends religion also lies as a roadblock in their way. They are proud and haughty, and religion, as they see it, is low and contemptible. Therefore, when they have lost their sense of hell and the wrath to come, they return again to their former ways. Guilt and the thought of terror are distressing to them. They prefer not to see their misery before they come into it though perhaps when they first catch sight of it, it might make them flee to where the righteous flee and are safe. But because they shun the thoughts of guilt and terror, as I hinted before, once they get rid of their original arousals about the terrors and wrath of God, they harden their hearts gladly, and choose ways that will harden them more and more. Christian patted Hopeful on the back. You are pretty close to the heart of this matter, for at the bottom of this problem is a lack of a change in their mind and will. Therefore they are like the criminal who stands before the judge shaking and trembling. He seems to heartily repent, but in the end he is truly motivated by his fear of the noose instead of any abhorrence of his crime. This is evident when he is set free, and he returns to being a thief and a rogue. However, if his mind was changed he would live differently. Hopeful agreed and said, Now that I have shown you the reason for their backsliding, I ask that you show me the modus of his falling away. Hopeful gesture to Christian to continue. I will do so most willingly, Christian said, and started to make his points one at a time, counting them off on his fingers. They draw most of their thoughts from the remembrance of God, death, and judgment to come. Then they gradually neglect private duties such as personal prayer, curbing their lusts, watchfulness, sorrow for sin, and the like. Then they shun the company of lively and wholehearted Christians. After that, they grow cold to public duty such as conscientious listening, reading of the word, 
got a corporate gathering and the like. They then begin to find fault or pick holes, as we say, in the lives of some of the godly, so that they may claim religion is stained based on some weaknesses they have noticed in these believers, and they then justify putting religion behind their backs. Then they begin to adhere to and associate with carnal and moral and unrestrained men. They give way to carnal and depraved conversations in secret, and they are glad if they can find similar practices in any who are considered reputable, for these hypocrites encourage them to be all the more bold. After this they begin to play with little sins openly. And then being hardened, they show themselves as they are. Therefore, being flung again into the gulf of misery, unless a miracle of grace prevents it, they eternally perish in their own deception. Now I saw in my dream that by this time, the pilgrims had travelled over the enchanted ground, and were entering into the country of Beulah. It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said, desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land, married, for the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. On your walls at Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen, all day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves, and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes, behold his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. And they will call them, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Isaiah 62 4-12. With the way lying directly through it, the air in that place was very sweet and pleasant, and so they rested, and refreshed themselves there for a time. Here they heard the continual singing of birds and every day enjoyed various blooming flowers in the land. They also heard the voice of the turtle dove in this country, where the sun shines night and day. Therefore it was beyond the valley of the shadow of death, and out of the reach of giant despair. In fact from this place they couldn't even see Doubting Castle. Here the pilgrims were within sight of the celestial city where they were going. Here too they met some of the inhabitants of that place. For in this land, the shining ones frequently walked, because it was upon the borders of heaven. In this land also, the contract between the bride and the bridegroom was renewed. Yes here, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so does God rejoice over them. Here they had no lack of corn and wine, for in this place they began to reap an abundance of what they had sought for throughout their entire pilgrimage. Here they heard voices drifting from out of the city, loud voices proclaiming, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him. Here all the inhabitants of the country called them, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, sought out, etc. Now as they walked in this land, they experienced more rejoicing than in other parts, that were more remote from the kingdom to which they were headed. But now drawing nearer to the city, they had a more perfect view of it. It was built of pearls and precious stones, and the streets were paved with gold. As a result, the natural glory of the city and the reflection of the sunbeams upon it made Christian homesick with longing for it. Hopeful also had a fit or two of the same sickness. Therefore, the two of them stood for a while in front of the vista, and continued to cry out because of their pangs, If you see my beloved, tell him that I am sick of love. But being a little strengthened and better able to endure their sickness, they walked along their way and came nearer and nearer to the celestial city. On either side were orchards, vineyards and gardens, and their gates opened into the highway. Now as they came closer to these places, they noticed the gardener standing in the way, so they asked him, Whose goodly vineyards and gardens are these? He answered, They are the king's, and are planted here for his own pleasure, and also for the comfort of pilgrims. So the gardener led them into the vineyards, and invited them to refresh themselves with the surrounding delicacies. Houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Deuteronomy 6 11, he also pointed out to them the king's walks and arbors which he enjoyed. 
So here Christian and Hopeful lingered and slept. Now I saw in my dream that they talked more in their sleep at this time than they had ever done in all their journey. As I pondered the reason for this, the gardener said to me, Why do you deeply ponder this matter? It is the nature of the fruit of the grapes of these vineyards, to go down smoothly for my beloved, flowing gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. Song of Soul. 7 to 9. So I saw that when they awoke, they prepared themselves to go up to the city. But as I said before, the reflection of the sun upon the city which was pure gold, Revelation 21 18, was so extremely glorious that they could not face it directly to look at it as yet. Instead, they viewed it through an instrument made for that purpose. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Dash 1 Corinthians 13 12, So I saw that as they went on their way, two shining ones met them. They were dressed in clothing that shone like gold, and their faces glowed radiantly as light. These men asked the pilgrims where they came from and they told them. The shining ones also asked them where they had lodged, as well as what difficulties and dangers they had met with along the way, and what comforts and pleasures they had experienced. And so Christian and Hopeful told them. Christian and Hopeful meet two men of the land of Beulah. Then the two shining ones said to them, You have only two more difficulties to deal with, and then you will enter the city. Christian and his companion asked the men to go along with them. The men told them they would but said, You must obtain it by your own faith. So I saw in my dream that they went on together until they came in sight of the gate. Between them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge crossing over it, and the river was very deep. The sight of this river greatly stunned the pilgrims, but the men who walked with them said, You must go through the river or you cannot come at the gate. The pilgrims began to inquire, Isn't there another way to the gate? The two shining ones answered, Yes but no one has been permitted to use it except for two. Only Enoch and Elijah have trod that path since the foundation of the world. It shall not be used again until the last trumpet sounds. A helpless feeling washed over the two pilgrims, especially Christian. They looked this way and that, but no alternative way could be found that would allow them to avoid the river. Then the pilgrims asked, Is the water all the same depth? The shining one said, No. They could offer no further help or guidance except to say, You shall find it deeper or shallower as you believe in the king of the place. With this the pilgrims resigned themselves to face the water. Upon entering, Christian began to sink and cried out to his good friend, Hopeful. I sink in the deep water. The billows go over my head, all his waves go over me. Then Hopeful said, Be courageous, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is firm. Christian cried out further. Ah, my friend, the sorrows of death have totally encompassed me. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with those words a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see before him. To a large degree he lost his senses, so that he was unable to remember or talk intelligently about any of those sweet refreshments that he had experienced along the way of his pilgrimage. Rather, all the words he spoke revealed his present terror of mind, and the fear that he would die in that river and never gain entrance into the celestial city. Those who stood by could see he was greatly troubled with thoughts of the sins he had committed, both before and since he became a pilgrim. It was also clear that he was troubled with visions of demons and evil spirits. The words he spoke reflected this over and over. The pilgrims crossed the river of death. Therefore, Hopeful struggled in his attempts to keep his brother's head above water. Sometimes Christian would seem to have sunk down for good, but after a short time, he would rise to the surface again as one half-dead. Hopeful attempted to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate and men standing nearby to welcome us. But Christian answered, It is you, it is you they are waiting for, for you have been hopeful ever since I first knew you. And so have you, Hopeful said. Ah, brother, Christian's face looked deeply troubled. Surely if I was ripe with the king he would rise now to rescue me, but on account of my sins he has brought me into this snare and abandoned me. Then Hopeful said, My brother, you have quite forgotten the text where it is said of the wicked, for there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Psalm 73 4-5 These troubles and distresses you are experiencing in these waters are no indication that God has abandoned you. Rather, they are sent to test you to see whether or not you will recall the evidences of his past goodness, a 
and rely upon him in your present distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was deep in thought a while, and hopeful continue to speak to him. Be courageous. Jesus Christ makes you whole. With that Christian broke out in a loud voice and said, Oh, I see him again. And he tells me, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. Isaiah 43 2. Then the two pilgrims both took courage, and the enemy became as still as a stone, until they had crossed over. Christian discovered solid ground for his feet to stand upon, and so it turned out that once he found his footing that the rest of the river was actually shallow, and the two of them crossed over. Now, upon the bank of the river on the other side, Christian and Hopeful saw the two shining ones waiting to welcome them. Therefore, when the pilgrims came out of the river, these shining ones greeted them saying, We are ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Then they proceeded towards the gate. Now you must note that the city stood upon a mighty hill, but the pilgrims went up that hill with ease, because they had the two shining ones to lead them upward by holding their arms. Plus, they had also left their mortal garments behind them in the river, for even though they went into the river with them, they came out without them. Therefore, they continued to climb with much agility and speed, even though the foundation upon which the city was built, was higher than the clouds. So they went up through the region of the air, sweetly talking as they went, being comforted because they had safely crossed over the river, and were being escorted by such glorious companions. The pilgrims approached the gate of the holy city. The conversation they had with the shining ones was about the glory of the place. They told the pilgrims that the beauty and glory of it was inexpressible. They went on to say, In Mount Zion you shall find the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, Hebrews 12 24 You are going now, they said, to the paradise of God, in which you shall see the tree of life, and eat of its never-fading fruits. When you arrive there you shall be given white robes, and every day your walk and talk shall be with the king, even for all the days of eternity. After these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches, were in their hands. Revelation 7 9 There you no longer see former things such as you saw when you were in the lower region upon earth, that is sorrow, sickness, affliction and death, for the former things have passed away. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning, crying or pain, the first things have passed away. Revelation 21 4 rather, you are now going to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, and to the prophets, men whom God has taken away from the evil to come, for they are now resting upon their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. Then Christian and Hopeful asked, what will we be doing in the holy place? To this they were given the answer, that you must receive the comfort that results from all your toil, and have joy in place of all your sorrow. You must reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers, tears and sufferings for the king along the way. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Galatians 6 7, In that place you will wear crowns of gold and enjoy the perpetual sight and vision of the Holy One, for there you shall see him as he is. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Dash 1 John 3 2, There you shall also serve him continually with praise shouting and thanksgiving, that is, he whom you desired to serve in the world, though with much difficulty because of the weakness of your flesh. There your eyes shall be delighted with seeing and your ears with hearing the pleasant voice of the Mighty One. There you shall enjoy your friends again who have arrived here before you, and in the same way, there you shall joyfully welcome everyone who follows after you into the holy place. You will also be clothed with glory and majesty and appropriately equipped to ride out with the King of Glory. In the future, when he shall come with the sound of the trumpet in the clouds, as upon the wings of the wind, you shall come with him. When he sits upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him, and when he passes sentence upon all the workers of iniquity, whether angels or men, you shall also have a voice in that judgment, because they were his and your enemies. Also, when he returns to the city again, you shall go with him with the sound of the trumpet and be with him forever. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? 
how much more matters of this life? Dash 1 Corinthians 6 2-3 Now, while they were drawing near to the gate, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them. To this multitude the other two shining ones said, These are the men who have loved our Lord when they were in the world, and who have left all for his holy name. He has sent us to fetch them, and we have brought them this far on their desired journey, so that they may go in with joy, and look their Redeemer in the face. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19:9. At this time, there also came out to meet them several of the king's trumpeters clothed in white shining garments. With loud, melodious noises, they raised their trumpets to the heavens where it echoed with their sound. These trumpeters greeted Christian and hopeful with ten thousand welcomes from the world, and this they did with shouting and the sound of trumpets. Once this was done they surrounded them on every side. Some went ahead of them, some followed behind, and some were on the right hand and others on the left, as a guard through the upper regions, continually sounding the melodious noise, sending notes on high as they went. So this very sight could be seen as if heaven itself had come down to meet them. Therefore they walked on together, and as they walked, these trumpeters often combined the joyful music with looks and gestures to signify to Christian, and hopeful just how welcome they were, and how happy they were to meet them. It was as if these two pilgrims were in heaven, before they even came to it, being surrounded with the sight of angels and the sound of their melodious notes. Here also they were now able to view the city itself, and they thought they heard all the bells pealing inside to welcome them. But above all, warm and joyful thoughts consumed them as to how they would live there with such heavenly company for all eternity. Oh, with what language or pen can their glorious joy be sufficiently expressed? And thus they came up to the gate. Now when they came up to the gate, there was inscribed over it in letters of gold, Blessed are those who do his commandments, those who have rightful access to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men told the pilgrims to call out at the gate. When they did, some from above looked over the gate, namely Enoch, Moses, and Elijah. The shining one said, These pilgrims have come from the city of destruction for the love they bear to the king of this place. Then each of the pilgrims gave his certificate which he had received at the beginning. These were carried into the king who when he read them said, Where are these men? To whom it was answered, They are standing outside the gate. The king commanded the gate to open, and he declared, The righteous nation may enter, the one that remains faithful, Isaiah 26 2. Now I saw in my dream that Christian and Hopeful went in at the gate, and as they entered they were transfigured, and they were dressed in garments that shone like gold. They were also met by those who gave them hops and crowns. The hops were given to offer praise with, and the crowns were a token of honor. Then I heard in my dream all the bells in the city ringing again for joy, and that it was said to the pilgrims to enter into the joy of your Lord. I also heard the men themselves singing out with a loud voice, Blessing, honor, glory, and power, be unto him who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb, forever and ever. Now, just as the gates were opened to let the men inside, I looked in after them, and witnessed the city shining like the sun. The streets were paved with gold, and many men walked along them with crowns on their heads and palms in their hands, and carrying golden hops which they used to sing praises. Among the inhabitants there were also those who had wings, and they answered one another without pause, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Following that they shut the gates, and after what I had seen, I wished that I had been among them. Now, while I was gazing upon all these things, I turned my head to look back and saw ignorance come up to the river bank. He soon crossed over, and without half the difficulty with which Christian and Hopeful had met. For it happened that in that place, there was one vain hope, a ferryman, who with his boat helped him over. So I watched as he ascended the hill to come up to the gate. Only he came alone, for not a single man came out to meet him with the least encouragement. When he came up to the gate, he looked up to the writing inscribed above the gate and began to knock, supposing that he should quickly be permitted entrance. But the men who peered over the top of the gate asked, Where did you come from? And what is your desire? He answered, I have eaten and drank in the presence of the king, and he has taught in our streets. Then they asked him for his certificate, so that they might go in and show it to the king. But ignorance fumbled in his breast pocket for it, but found none. The men tending the gate said, Don't you have one? Ignorance had no answer, not even a word. So the men of the gate told the king, but he would not come down to see him. 
Instead, he commanded the two shining ones, who had conducted Christian and Hopeful to the city, to go out and take ignorance, and to bind him hand and foot, and have him taken away. At that, the two shining ones took him up, and carried him through the air to the door that I saw in the side of the hill, and put him in there. I realized that there was a way to hell, even from the gate of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. So I awoke, and behold it was a dream. Ignorance is thrust into hell. 15 Original, when you enter your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat grapes until you are fully satisfied, but you shall not put any in your basket, Deuteronomy 23 24. 16 Original, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit 2 Corinthians 3 18. 17 Original, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2 7. Conclusion. Now reader, I have told my dream to you. See if you can interpret it to me. Or to yourself, or your neighbor, but take heed. Of misinterpreting for that, instead. Of doing good, will but yourself abuse. By misinterpreting, evil ensues. Pay attention, that you do not become extreme. In playing with the outside of my dream. Nor let my figure, or similitude. Make you laugh, or start a feud. Leave this for boys and fools, but as for thee. Do you yourself the substance of my matter see? Open the curtains look within my veil. Turn up my metaphors, and do not fail. If you seek them, such things you will find as will be helpful to an honest mind. What of my scum you find there, be bold. To throw it away, but yet preserve the gold. What if my gold be wrapped up in all? None throws away the apple for the core. But if you cast it all away as vain, I know not, but it will make me dream again.